Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this resumption of the Budget and Finance Committee's consideration of the Mayor's proposed budget for 2017-2018. Uh, today is May 1st, and we're uh, ready to begin. Today we will be considering uh, the budgets of the Department of Transportation, the City Clerk's Office, the Convention and Tourism Department, General Services, uh, Information Technology Agency, Animal Services, Cultural Affairs, El Pueblo, Department of Neighborhood Empowerment, and we'll hear a presentation by the Neighborhood Council Budget Advocates. And we hope to get all of that done uh, by uh, 1.30. So uh, we're going to do our best. Um, maybe it'll go a little bit longer than that. Um, so first, uh, the first order of business members, as it always is, is uh, approval of the budget memo from last week. Um, but uh, why don't I give you an opportunity to review that. You have uh, the memo in front of each of you, and we'll go ahead and begin with our public comment. Um, for those of you who haven't been here to a Budget and Finance Committee hearing, uh, to this Budget and Finance Committee hearing uh, earlier, um, I'll give you a little overview. This is a single meeting of the Budget and Finance Committee. Um, it extends over the course of several days, but there's one agenda item only, and that's the consideration of the budget, and that takes multiple days to do. And this is a special meeting of the committee uh, for that consideration. Um, nonetheless, as uh, a courtesy and in order to draw as much opportunity for public comment as we can, we do hear public comment each and every day that we meet uh, in this hearing. So um, we'll be taking public comment today, as we do every day, uh, and then we'll also have an op a second opportunity for public comment when the budget comes, when the budget recommendations of this committee come before uh, City Council as well. So um, each speaker uh, will have one minute, and I'm going to call several names. I'd like you to come up and be prepared to speak because we have a lot of cards to get through. We have a lot of business to cover, and hopefully we can get that done before all of the streets start getting closed later this afternoon. So uh, there is a little bit of a sense of urgency in getting this meeting done. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and begin taking, oh, and then the other thing I wanted to mention, because this is a special meeting, there will not be general public comment. Uh, there will only be comment on the single agenda item we have before us, which is the draft budget for 2017-2018. Anything going outside of the scope of the budget is going to be out of order, and uh, we will not be taking comment on other topics. So uh, with that, I'm going to call up uh, first Rabaya, Rabaya Sen, followed by Chioma Agbahiwe, followed by Edward Landler. Good morning. Hi. Um, um, I am um, uh, Rabia Sen with Esperanza Community Housing Corporation. And um, um, uh, we serve um, uh, low-income residents, mainly communities of color in South Central Los Angeles. Our main reason for existing was to support um, um, uh, residents who face displacements as more investments came into their communities without actually considering the risk of displacement to residents currently there. So today we're here to join our allies in urging you to increase allocations from Measure M's local return money to Vision Zero to ensure safe, walkable, and bikeable streets for all Angelinos. As such, we applaud Metro's inclusion of funding for transit-oriented communities in their draft um, uh, guidelines for Measure M. And as we invest in the city's infrastructure, it's imperative that we also invest in equity, and therefore we urge you to actually allocate a portion of these funds um, to help stabilize the low-income communities of color most at risk for displacement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, we're having a little bit of a technical challenge with the mic. I, members, can you, it's, it's a little irritating, but I think we can hear clearly um, uh, until we get that fixed. So um, let's go ahead with uh, Chioma Agbahiwe, followed by Edward Landler, followed by Dan. Okay, good morning, council members. Uh, my name is Chioma Agbahiwe. I'm the VP of the Watts Towers Community Action Council. Uh, it was formed in 1984 by the late Lillian Mobley, a, a very popular community activist, and my great aunt. 
I'm here this morning um, to advocate for the Watchtowers Arts Center campus uh, for the funding for the upcoming fiscal year. The Watchtowers Arts Center um, is the mainly the city's only uh, tourist attraction in the city of Watts. Um, the city, I'll say, the Watts Towers Community Arts Center raised the funding in the beginning to present to the city in the 90s the master plan for the cultural uh, crescent of the Watts Towers. Uh, since I've been with the Watts Towers Community Arts Council uh, during two administrations now, uh, we've d dealt with many, many issues where the city has not provided adequate funding for the towers. A new position was granted, but uh, we are requesting more funding definitely for our towers. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Edward Landler, followed by Dan, followed by Amanda Mesa. Thank you. Uh, I am here to follow up on the comments of Ms. Agabawahi, my colleague. I am a member of the board of directors of Watts Towers Community Action Council also, as well as the Friends of the Watts Towers Arts Center. And I, sort of, I have been involved with the campus for almost 40 years. I'm considered a documentarian and historian of the site. I produced in collaboration with the great nephew of the man who built the Watts Towers, a feature-length documentary about the towers, which has been shown worldwide. Uh, with this short amount of time, the funding that goes to the Watts Towers Arts Center through Cultural Affairs Department is absolutely necessary to maintain the understanding of community and peace in the neighborhood. On this anniversary of the 25th, the 25th anniversary of the Los Angeles Rebellion of 1992, not to mention two years ago, the 50th anniversary of the uprising of 1965, we do not want these things to happen again, and we have provided absolute necessary services through what should Thank be you. considered the Statue of Liberty. Thank you, sir. Built by, and I would like to present Please. to the chair to support our Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gus, uh, I'm sorry. Dan, please. I'm sorry. Community. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Dan, followed by Amanda Mesa, followed by Jessica Meany. Good morning, council members. Daniel Gus, I have an article tonight. Mr. Gus, I'm sorry. Start his time over. But if you could just step back just a little, because we're having oh, a sure, speaker sorry. problem. And I, I think we can hear you if you step back just okay. to thank Good you. Good stuff. Council members, Daniel Gus, I have an article in City Watch tonight about animal services. As many of you know, I have a 72 page document on waste, millions and millions of dollars of waste at animal services. The article tonight focuses on these dog license renewal cards. Council members, less than a tenth of the dogs in the city are licensed. You're losing millions of dollars each year, and the story I have coming out tonight in City Watch shows, for the people of Los Angeles, if you ignore your dog license renewal notice, your name and your dog's name will fall out of the system. Animal services will never ask you for another dog license fee, and the city will lose that revenue for every subsequent year of the dog's life. I've brought it to the city's attention. You need to collect these millions of dollars. If you don't, I'm going to write another article instructing everybody in the city of Los Angeles that they can ignore their dog license. Anytime you want to sit down and learn more, let me know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Amanda Mesa, followed by Jessica Meany, followed by Diane Silva. Hi, good morning, council good morning. members. My name is Amanda Mesa from Investing in Place. I'm a CD1 resident from Mount Washington. Um, and just to share a little bit about myself, I solely rely on public transportation, uh, bus, rail, bike. Um, oftentimes, my fellow riders are young students. Um, as a former middle school teacher, um, I am extremely cognizant of where they walk and oftentimes will walk with them across the street. Pedestrian deaths are increasing, um, in specifically in our most vulnerable uh, communities. And because I know this information, because you know this information, we are in a place that we can make great change for people that have an, this great need. And so I am just here to urge you to fully support Vision Zero um, as you consider the budget before us and the needs of our communities. I urge you to take seriously roadway safety for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Jessica Meany, followed by Diane Silva, followed by Megan McClare. 
Good morning, committee members. My name is Jessica Meany from Investing in Place, here with my colleagues to urge you to fully support and fully fund Vision Zero. It's very exciting to see years of planning work go on in the city. That's a data-driven, health equity-driven um, plan that's worked with community groups, council offices across the city, and now here's our opportunity to fund it. I also want to point out that um, most of the advocates I'm here with today are all women. Um, women tend to take higher amounts of trips. The average person takes about four trips a day. Women as head of households, they're taking usually about six trips. That's getting our kids to school. That's getting our parents to the doctor and things like that. Traffic safety in um, LA County is, in LA City is out of control. It's the leading cause of death for our children. We urge you to fully support Vision Zero. Thanks. Thank you. Our next speaker is Diane Silva, followed by Megan McClare, followed by Elizabeth Alcantar. Good morning, Council. My name is Diane Silva. I work with the Trust for Public Land. I'm here on behalf of that organization and also personally as an avid pedestrian um, to speak in support of leveraging local return for Measure M and sidewalk improvements, bicycle lanes, and also to prioritize those fundings in the communities that need them most, primarily communities of color and low-income communities. Um, the situation of our sidewalks in the city and also for pedestrian and bicyclist safety is very poor. It's important that we start to prioritize those funds to increase outcomes for especially our youth and seniors who are most affected by the issues that we have with sidewalks and with our availability of bicycle lanes in the city. So please uh, consider allocating those funds specifically for Vision Zero for sidewalk improvements and pri prioritizing for uh, low-income communities and communities of color. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Megan McClare, followed by Elizabeth Alcantar. Good morning. My name is Megan McClare. I'm the Director of Health Equity at Advancement Project California. I'm a member of the Vision Zero Alliance and a resident of CD13. And I'm here to urge the Budget Committee to increase uh, funding to fully support Vision Zero. Uh, we see that transportation is a lifeline for all of our residents, and we need to ensure that those that are impacted most, low-income communities of color that are six times more likely to be hit by a vehicle, are prioritizing that funding. To that end, we understand the trends that when we increase investments in transportation, uh, that there also tends to be uh, uh, unintended consequence of uh, displacement among those communities. So we want to ensure that there's some funding allocated to mitigate the triggers of gentrification and preserve affordable housing. So again, we urge you to fully support Vision Zero with a frame of equity and to ensure that we aren't displacing our residents in low-income communities of color. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Elizabeth Alcantar, followed by Melinda Amato, followed by Monique Lopez. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Alcantar, and I'm the local advocacy coordinator for LA CBC. Um, I'm also someone that engages in public transportation, riding our bike, um, and walking through LA city streets. Um, so LA CBC is asking for the committee uh, to revise the city budget um, so that it invests more in our, the city's Vision Zero goals. Um, as it stands, the city is only allocating $16 million to the Vision Zero um, implementation, and we already know that it's necessary to in invest a lot more. Um, so we're asking for you to invest in safer streets. Um, lessening traffic um, and supporting our, our city residents here. Uh, when we compare the city's commitment to that of other cities, we see that it's extremely lacking. Um, cities like New York invest, ha have invested much more and have met their goals. Um, so we're hoping that the committee here uh, meaningfully increases funding for Vision Zero and makes our cities safer here in the city of LA. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Melinda Amato, followed by Monique Lopez, followed by Jenny Chamberlain. Good morning. My name is Melinda Amato, and I'm the organizing director at the LA Bike Coalition. Traffic fatalities are the number one killer of children in Los Angeles. Our streets need to be safer for our most vulnerable neighbors, such as our youth, individuals with disabilities, and older adults. I live in Huntington Park, four blocks away from Florence Avenue. In the past 17 years, Florence Avenue has had 31 people in vehicles, 30 people walking and biking, and six people on motorcycles seriously injured or killed in traffic collisions. Our communities are at risk when performing daily tasks such as walking to school or biking to pick up some bread for dinner. No one's life should be at risk when walking or biking on our streets. I want to ensure that the City of LA's transportation budget puts human lives first and invests in a network of complete streets and sidewalks for all people who travel in our city. Prioritizing the streets along the high injury network and fully funding Vision Zero is the best way for the City of Los Angeles to demonstrate its commitment to safety and prioritizing lives of our most vulnerable community members. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Monique Lopez, followed by Jenny Chamberlain, 
followed by Sean McCarthy. Thank you. Monique Lopez, uh, Deputy Executive Director of Advocacy with the Los Angeles County Bicycle Coalition, also a member of the Vision Zero Alliance here, also a resident of North Hollywood. Um, I have good news and bad news. First, the bad news, as we know that we have a major public health crisis in our streets, and this is um, children being hit by cars. The good news is that the city has in its power to reverse this trend. Um, it's been mentioned that in order to achieve 20% reduction um, of, of fatalities and injuries, by 2017, we need about $80 million. However, there's currently $16 million allocated for Vision Zero implementation, so that's a $64 million shortfall. But we must also ensure that investment in transportation is done in an equitable manner, so that investment is done without displacement. So that's why we encourage you all to implement Vision Zero with meaningful funding, but also to dedicate 10% of local returns to ensure that anti-displacement measures are in place. And if it pleases the clerk, I'd like to return in our letter. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Please. All right. Our next speaker is Jenny Chamberlain, followed by Sean McCarthy, followed by Dennis Hindman. Hi, my name is Jenny Chamberlain, and I'm here um, representing Friends of King, which is a parent organization supporting uh, Thomas Starr Middle School. It's an LAUSD middle school of about 2,000 students. We have several hundred students um, that walk to school every day. We're a lot located along the high injury network. In the past 10 years, we've had 196 people walking and biking get hit by cars within a half mile vicinity of the school. Um, there's currently no funding allocated to address this high injury network corridor in front of our school. We need to allocate more funding um, towards this to ensure the safety of our kids. If you look at the data, most of, this, most of the people walking are hit between four and six, which is the exact time that our kids are leaving their school. We've already had a student um, severely and permanently um, brain injured from getting hit by a car right in front of the crosswalk in front of our school. Um, please allocate. Uh, the appropriate money um, and make up that $64 million shortfall that we need to ensure safety on our streets. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sean McCarthy, followed by Dennis Hindman, followed by Eric Previn. Good morning. My name is Sean McCarthy, and I'm an animal control officer for the city of Los Angeles here. Um, the department um, has an, we only hired one officer in the last six years. And we had 31 open positions. And, uh, you know, we, we never filled those positions until 2017 here. And we have four officers that went through training and are now, but we still have 27 open positions on the budget for this year. And um, the department has been using uh, salary savings for these uh, 32 authorized positions, budgeted positions to pay other positions to fill. So I'd ask you please just to remember that we need to fill 27 open officer positions. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dennis Hinman, followed by Eric Previn, followed by Sandra Dyson. Hi. Uh, at the split understood under Measure M, the local return will be $48 million in the next fiscal year. Well, it seems to be overlooked that the SB1 will bring in about $196 million locally. Um, the, uh, that will rise to $260 million the next fiscal year. There's also 2% set aside under Measure M that Metro will be handling, and also there's $365 million to finish the uh, bike path along the LA River west of downtown, and also $60 million in the valley. There is simply no shortage for uh, Bureau of Street Services for this fis next fiscal year. That is just laughably wrong. Uh, the money, is, they're going to be scratching their head tr fig trying to figure out how to spend all the money. Uh, neither the Department of, or, uh, Department of Public Works nor Department of uh, Transportation will have a shortage next fiscal year for transportation. Thank you. Hmm. Our next speaker is Eric Previn, followed by Sandra Dyson, followed by Charles Leone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Krikorian. Did you get the message about Joshua Previn's time? Would I be granted the extra minute? No. Okay. 
you can speak on his behalf, but it'll uh, still be within the You mentioned that you were going to draw as much public comment as you can, and I think 60 seconds on nine or ten major departments, including Department of Transportation, Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. The city clerk, do not interrupt me, sir. It's not tenable. It's five seconds per that item. Mike, don't you're interrupting you're me, sir. Of, it's not a no, I will interrupt you. Stop this time. Needed. Stop this time. I will interrupt you because, as I instructed at the beginning, you will speak about the budget. You're not here to speak about process. You're here to speak about the budget or else your time's going to expire. So go ahead. Okay, $22 million to redo the Merced Theater for the ITA, which is on the agenda, is not appropriate, sir, when you're reducing. Look at the diminution of Jack uh, Humphreyville from day one of the budget hearings to day three. On day one, he was visible. On day three, he's not visible. What you're doing is blocking. And what is the budget for the budget hearings? Why are you in such a rush to get out of here by 1.30? And why were you in such a rush? And why are we going to cut days off the budget as we did last year? Public input is critical, sir. And I'm going to have to write about a number of these issues. You know I've had issues with Department of Neighborhood Environments on the budget today. The clerk is on the budget today. All of these are important things. Uh, GSD is on the budget today. There's the people with the real property. Uh, it's not appropriate, sir. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sandra Dyson, followed by Charles Leone, followed by Aaron Gray. Good morning, council members. I appreciate the opportunity to make this presentation to you. I'm the board chair of the Los Angeles Police Museum. And as some of you may know, we lease the old uh, Northeast Station as uh, the, that's where our museum is located at 604 Five York Boulevard. Uh, we have leased the building since December of 2000. And in that time, we have made a number of repairs and improvements to the building. However, at this time, there are a number of systems that have outlived their usefulness and need to be replaced. Uh, General Services provided us with an estimate of needed repairs, which we have submitted to you. So we're asking for your help to make these much needed repairs uh, to the museum. And to let you know, the museum is really quite popular in the neighborhood in which we reside. In May of last year, on a single day, we had over 1,243 people come to the museum. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Charles Leone, followed by Aaron Gray, followed by Alvin Gray. Honorable Chair and members of the Budget and Finance Committee, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak before you today, and thanks so much for your leadership, uh, Mr. Krikorian. Uh, my name is Charles Leone. I work for SAU 721. I'm an organizer, and I have the honor and privilege of representing the working men and women of LADOT. Uh, as most of you know, LADOT uh, was birthed out of the 1984 Olympics, and now more than ever, the city of Los Angeles is close to bringing back the Olympics. And the question we want to ask ourselves for the city is, what type of city do we want to showcase to the world when the Olympics come back? If you look at this budget, and we echo the comments and support the comments that have been made thus far about Vision Zero, Vision Zero was a fantastic plan, leadership, incentive, very proactive, uh, by the general manager to bring down the fatality deaths in the city. Uh, as you know, Los Angeles has the number one fatalities. This budget needs to be revised. We need your help. We need your support. We need your leadership. We need more traffic officers. The part-time program needs to go away. It needs to be full-time. We need to eliminate the Thank private you. contractors. We need to revise Thank this budget. And please go to the drawing board with Thank this budget. We need your assistance Thank and you. support. Thank you. Our next speaker is Aaron Gray, followed by Alvin Gray followed by Claudia Goitia. Good morning, everyone. My name is Aaron Gray. I've been a traffic officer for approximately 21 years. In these 21 years, we've had a lot of um, ups and downs regarding officers. We have officers that we have part-time officers right now that we really can't use because this part-time, this, de this department is not a part-time department. We need full-time officers. Our traffic control has gone up in the past year approximately 80 um, percent. We, we really need your help right now. We really need your help. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Herman, stay seated, please. Good morning, Our Council. next speaker is Alvin Gray, followed by Claudia Goitia, followed by Armando Herman. Good morning, Council members. My name is Alvin Gray. I'm with Department of Transportation, uh, citywide um, mark out and striping. Um, we have a check on our overtime for 20 hours due to a recent audit and an increased the use of the private contractor. We prefer to um, minimize the use of need of the private contractor and, and our department increase our utilize our workforce for this operation, especially since that 
DLT recently received additional bodies, and that was based on off the council's approval during the hard freeze and manage. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker is Claudia Goitia, followed by Armando Herman, and I believe that's the last card that I have. Good morning, my name is Claudia Goitia. I'm the Government Relations Director for the American Heart Association. Um, I'm here on behalf of the American Heart Association to respectfully request the committee to purposely invest in a network of complete streets and sidewalks for all people who travel to travel safely in Los Angeles. Uh, the budget should reflect the priorities of voters who supported Measure M with the promise to make mobility in LA easier and safe for all. Transportation funding is at the core of addressing public health uh, issues that impact us all, safe routes to schools, increasing physical activity, reducing obesity, um, and addressing equity in communities of color. Um, this is an opportunity for the committee to uh, purposely invest in um, these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Herman. So there it is. Poor parking enforcement can't hire more people to create jobs. How does it impact the budget, services for animal, that's detrimental. And then the morons can't come up with a better budget for the overall budget of what's happening with Willis versus Los Angeles, Barton versus Sacramento. Fix the infrastructure of our sidewalks and streets so the elderly and disabled who live in Los Angeles can commute. We're building a, a billion dollar transportation bullshit along with that fucking stupid river across from my neighborhood of Boyle Heights over here to the white side of you white, creamy motherfuckers. It needs to get fixed. That's the bottom line, fix the budget. Now, if I had a fucking fat wife who couldn't work, then I would be in here bitching too, you stupid Armenian. This is a genocide against the homeless, $176 million. All right. Uh, members, are, we'll go now to the budget memo list if there are any recommendations for changes. Mr. Blumenfield. Yes, thank you. Um, Hassan, can you hear me? Uh, item number 231, uh, that's on the Economic and Workforce Development. It says, report on one-time and ongoing funding op options to restore 2016. Um, the last sentence says, can the city borrow money for this purpose? It was only if we have other funding. So I would change that to if there were funding from the feds or Measure H, can the city borrow money for this purpose as a stopgap measure? And that was never the intention of the question that we would borrow for a programmatic expense, but merely as a stopgap measure if there were other funding. So that's to change that. And then there are two items that were not picked up I wanted to make sure did get covered. One was for LASA, and it was a request for a report back. For, an, uh, for the additional 62,500 for the homeless management information system to match a federal uh, match and leverage a new $500,000 grant from HUD, that was one. And then another one in planning, report back on additional funding, hiring technology solutions for specialized programs uh, to come to the valley that are in other areas. For example, the best program case management. Those are the two additions. Okay, and the, and the change. Other than that, uh, looks great. Anything else? Mr. Bonin? Uh, yes, just one. Under, uh, homeless services, uh, item 271. Uh, the question is phrased as how can the city restore funding for voluntary storage in Venice? Well, Venice is my particular emphasis. It's broader than that. I want to have money available for storage citywide. Can you, you can't hear me? Your, just pull your mic down a little bit. So, yeah, there you go. Thanks. Let me repeat that then. So for 271, the question should be broader than just storage in Venice, but for voluntary storage programs overall. Great. Thank you. Ms. Martinez? Okay. Uh, with those changes then, if there's no objection, um, is there a motion? Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, without objection, the may, the list as of April 28th, 2017 is approved. And that brings us then to the Department of Transportation. Ms. Reynolds, welcome.
So thank you very much for your letter. Um, and uh, we've received that, but uh, we're, we're happy to hear any introductory comments that you'd like to make before we dive into what I'm sure will be a lot of questions. So go right ahead. Thanks, Councilmember Krikorian, and thank you to the Budget and Finance Committee for the opportunity to come and address you this morning. Um, I want to make sure to uh, express uh, a lot of gratitude and deep thanks to uh, both the CAO's office and the, the budget analyst team that works on the Department of Transportation's budget for many, many hours of back and forth and thoughtful work on the department's budget, as well as the mayor's office and budget team um, in, in their work in putting together uh, the budget that we have uh, before you for consideration. Um, just to recognize the, the team with me from LADOT who's around the table, we have uh, Assistant General Manager for Project Delivery, Dan Mitchell, uh, Deputy Chief uh, Brian Hale and Devin Farfan, Chief of Staff Bridget Smith, and our uh, fantastic budget team, uh, Assistant General Manager Monique Earle, and uh, Budget Lead Angela Baruman. So I want to start off just by um, thanking this council and the mayor for the investments that you've made um, in my time here in the Department of Transportation. Uh, last year, you in invested in us uh, to uh, reopen the speed hump program something that we had not been able to do for a long time. Uh, we did reopen that program this year. We received over 500 responses, which resulted in 188 qualified applications for neighborhood traffic calming around the city. And we look forward to continuing that work um, and really meeting what we think is a huge demand. Another key investment that you made uh, in the Department of Transportation last year was to improve the way we manage our grants and the way we manage our projects. So I'm happy to report that the Department of Transportation is migrating over to the Bureau of Engineering's project management system. We will be 100% on that system uh, with over $50 million in, in capital projects uh, by the end of this fiscal year. And we are just getting ready to go out for a grants accounting system um, to our bench of consultants, which we hope to have fully operational by the end of this year. Um, so first and foremost, thank you uh, for the investment that you made in us last year. This year, looking ahead, we really have uh, three or four major initiatives and places where our focus um, is, is greatest. Um, the first is building safe, beautiful streets, and that really comes down to um, our efforts to eliminate traffic deaths in the city of Los Angeles by 2025. Earlier this year, we presented to Transportation Committee our action plan for this year to invest in uh, about 80 miles of streets where we have the highest concentration of severe and fatal crashes, in particular uh, where we have high numbers of children and older adults uh, being injured or killed, particularly while walking. Um, we've worked closely with our Executive Steering Committee, which, has, uh, which we co-chair with the um, LAPD, which has representation from public works and public health, the mayor's office. Um, it really is a collaborative effort. And so our interest is to put everything we can towards those corridors, a, a combined approach of engineering, enforcement, and education to drive down the number of people who are losing their lives or being um, catastrophically injured um, while getting around on our city streets. The second key area of focus for us is preparing Los Angeles for the arrival of connected and autonomous vehicles. It's difficult to open any major newspaper and not see a story, um, usually a lot of uh, sort of chicken little stories about how autonomous vehicles are either going to take us to utopia or wreak havoc and send us back to the dark ages. We worked hard to put together um, our transportation technology strategy, which lays out short, medium, and long-term actions. We have uh, sort of carried that momentum forward and will be uh, delivering a, a business plan for an automated uh, transit system this year. Uh, we requested additional funding that, to go towards uh, this preparation. Um, and we would uh, respectfully request additional funding than what was set aside in the budget. We think it, it is of particular importance that we work within the region to have a safety officer and other sort of assistance for auto manufacturers that want to test autonomous vehicles in the city of Los Angeles. We've been able to attract federal funding to roll out a connected autonomous transit system. We think that is only going to continue. Um, even in the current uh, political climate, and we want to make sure that Los Angeles is ready for that to happen in a safe way uh, in partnership with uh, the rest of the region. The last thing I'll mention is that, uh, or, or second to last thing I'll mention is that uh, the department is, uh, is a, a key support piece 
uh, as Metro rolls out one of the most aggressive and visionary build-outs um, of high-capacity transit in North America. Um, we did request some additional funding to help us continue to support Metro so that they can extend uh, and build out uh, critical infrastructure like the Purple Line. Um, we were very pleased to see that included in this budget, um, and so thank you for, for that. And then uh, the last piece is, you know, the last couple of years that I've been at this table, I've received requests from the council to put forward a plan to eliminate the part-time traffic officer program. So we did put together a budget request that we think uh, would help us do a few things. One, deal with the needs of the department today. Uh, in 2014, we had 2,000 events that required our officers uh, to perform traffic control. In 2016, that number tripled to 6,000 events where traffic officers are deployed throughout the city to provide uh, safe, tra safe travel during events um, and other unexpected uh, uh, incidents. We also, so we, we need to, to have a department that's ready to do that, um, as well as continue the important work of basic, uh, our basic safety and, and enforcement functions. Um, and then finally, we wanted to create a real career ladder for our traffic officers. So we had put forward a, tra a plan that, that uh, had a traffic officer one, two, three uh, classification and progression that would allow us to eliminate the part-time traffic officer program, create that career ladder for our traffic officers, and deal with the needs that we have today uh, uh, in the department. So um, that's something that I would you know, welcome further discussion on in the future. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, we'll open up with the chair of our transportation committee, Mr. Bonin. Thank you. And did I hear you, Mr. Chair, correctly? I have until 1.30 for my DOT questions. <laughs> oh, I just cut the evil eye from Ms. Martinez. Um, okay. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you all uh, from DOT. Um, it, let me just sing the department's praises a little bit because I think the department has done uh, incredible work over the past year. I think there's a number of things, some that have been celebrated and some that have been sort of quiet and underappreciated. Uh, one, you delivered a bike share program to the city, uh, which is going to be expanding down to San Pedro and other areas soon and hopefully beyond. Uh, you have revamped the preferential parking program and streamlined the procedures. Thank you for that. Um, we have started to reinstitute our on-street ADA accessible parking program, the Blue Curbs. Um, delivered an EV car share program. Uh, you've completed your line-by-line -line analysis of our transit services, and then the council now needs to, to take action on that uh, so we can start delivering some microtransit in the city. Um, your development review team is doing impressive work with planning on SB 743 and on a new transportation demand ordinance that we hope to approve in the coming fiscal year. Um, Ms. Reynolds, you and your team, I've seen firsthand your leadership on great streets has been phenomenal, and I'm pleased to see us delivering that uh, right now uh, in Mar Vista. Uh, last year, we uh, adopted your, your Vision Zero policy, and I'm hoping we implement that. Um, and uh, in, Ms. Reynolds, you have shown um, uh, vision and tenacity and, and great leadership with this department. I, um, I've been with the city a long time, and I used to, my colloquial way of referring to the department was not DOT, it was NOT. Uh, for a very long time. And um, this team you have and the staff, whether it is the traffic control officers in the back, whether it is the striping crews that I have the pleasure of working with periodically out on the west side, um, uh, whether it is uh, the, the, the engineers and the field offices or, or, or this team, it's just, it's, it's a remarkable department. And I just want to sing your praises, all of you, and, and, and give you credit for that. I'm really proud to work with DOT. Thank you. I am too. Um, so um, a couple issues I want to hit on before I dive into Vision Zero. Um, one is uh, on um, project coordination. Um, uh, I see on page uh, 681 that 95% um, of Metro plans are reviewed within 20 business days. Uh, that's phenomenal. Um, do we know what the number is for non-metro plans to be reviewed by any chance? 
that's generally, I mean, 20 days is our, is our goal for Metro projects and for all of the, the customers that we serve. The Metro team is a special separate team inside DOT uh, just because of the, the sheer volume. I mean, we have, I think it was closing in on 2,000 sheets um, that were reviewed by that team and turned around within 20 business days. And the same is true for our other 30 days. Yeah, my, my experience has been a little different for non-metro projects. Uh, we had a case last year where Playa Vista was being asked to make improvements at Sentinela, La Tierra, and La Cienega, and it took, it, it, it took months. So um, I'd like to get a report back on what the timeline is for metro versus non-metro uh, and any recommended steps to reduce the turnaround on that. Um, I wanted to ask a question about bikeway risk management. Um, uh, we have heard in some of the budget discussions last week for Bureau of Street Services uh, that one of the reasons it's important to uh, uh, use Measure M monies for reconstruction is to repair bike paths uh, so people don't get killed while they're cycling. Uh, and um, you know, Greg Spots mentioned that when he was here. Um, there was a $3.5 million payout where a cyclist sustained some, some, some injuries that folks have talked about. Um, that's something that I think everybody wants to correct. Uh, but I'm curious, uh, th there are more targeted ways to, and cost-effective ways to address that problem, are there not? So if the problem that you're, is the pro so I understand the question, is the problem you're getting at that uh, poor quality of pavement is creating hazardous conditions in the bike lane for people who are riding. Yeah. That's the question. So our, uh, we, we've worked closely with our partners in Bureau Street Services to change the way that we go about uh, marking bike lanes to begin with. And so we make sure that somebody from DOT inspects the pavement before we put a new bike lane in, and then we work closely with Bureau of Street Services where possible to repair that pavement before we put it in. That doesn't change the fact that we have now a very large network of existing bike lanes throughout the city. Um, and what we've uh, proposed is um, having a team from Bureau of Street Services uh, with some support from DOT that would be systematically inspecting and repairing um, just the bike lane portion of the pavement because it may or may not have, de have decayed at the same rate as the rest of the street. Uh, so we did work uh, with Bureau of Street Services to come up with a way to address uh, that very real uh, issue that we take very seriously. Is that included in the budget or not? It is not in this, okay. in this budget. So I'd like a, a report back that would be budget impact from uh, DOT and Street Services on the cost of the program, as well as the number of miles of bike lanes and routes you'd be able to clean and repair on an annual basis. Uh, question about uh, striping crews. Um, there is, well, let me give a little context. Uh, working together, this budget committee, the transportation committee, Bureau of Street Services, the mayor's office, DOT, over the past couple of years, we have fixed what was a pretty big problem. Uh, when I, I took office four years ago, it was not uncommon for there to be a months-long gap between resurfacing and restriping. And I believe it was in last year's budget, maybe it was the year before, where we finally fixed that. When we were increasing resurfacing, we increased the money for restriping. Um, this year's budget uh, uh, adds, I think, approximately $35 million uh, for road reconstruction. Um, was there additional funding provided for DOT for restriping? No. Okay. Um, that is a, a, a problem, I think, that we need to, to, to look at because otherwise we're going to go back to the, the situation we had uh, just a, a year or two ago. Um, uh, where And that's a danger. When there's not a, a limit line or a, a crosswalk where there was one, uh, that, that's a big problem. So um, I'd like... Um, uh, DOT and um, CAO to report back on the resources necessary uh, to maintain the existing striping goals of a seven to ten day turnaround uh, to match, to give DOT the resources for the uh, proposed reconstruction program. Uh, that's very important to do. Um, also, uh, does anybody know why um, 
the line item for Lani was eliminated from uh, Prop C. Ida Rubio with the Office of the City Administrative Office. Um, initially, when we were putting the budget together, we um, were struggling to um, close the gap on Prop C. It was my understanding at one point during those discussions with DOT that they no longer needed that funding. It's now come to my attention that they do need the funding. So we'll work with them to look for either an alternative funding source uh, to provide that. Let's get a report back on that officially just so it doesn't fall through the cracks as we continue the discussions. Uh, thank you. Um, all right, let me uh, uh, talk a little, a little bit about um, <coughs> Vision Zero. Uh, to me, this is one of, I mean, I'm preaching to the, 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 the choir when I look at Ms. Reynolds, uh, but uh, to me, this is one of the most important programs the, the, the city could be doing or, or should be funding. As we heard from testimony today, uh, the, the leading cause of death uh, among children in Los Angeles County is traffic fatalities. Uh, we have an abysmal record compared to, to other cities around uh, the country, other big cities. Our investment in solving this problem uh, is ridiculously dwarfed by that of New York and some other cities. Um, in the areas that have been identified in the high injury network, uh, we know that school children and grandparents are going to die. We, we know that. Uh, we have seen the data. Uh, and if, if gunshots were taking the lives of our children and our grandparents, we would be fully funding a way to address that with urgency. We also know from the data, looking at the high injury network, that there is uh, incredible uh, economic, social, racial disparity uh, between uh, where our streets are safe and where our streets lead people to be injured or to die. And when the LA Times did an analysis of how long it took us to clean up trash from our neighborhoods, and it showed that same kind of divide, it was a major issue in these chambers. We had the general manager called to this table, we had special reports, we had special actions, and people were being held accountable to fix that. And we have this same problem here. You know, I, 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 I talk a lot about Vision Zero. It's not something that's gonna bring a, a, a huge wealth of resources to my district, uh, because it's not where, my district isn't where the biggest problem is. But people are dying, and we've got to, we, we, we've got to stop that. We have a, a, we have a, I think we have a moral responsibility to do it, and frankly, now that we've outlined where the problem is, I think when something happens, we probably have a, 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 a fiduciary responsibility to do it. So I'm wondering if, um, and, and maybe the mayor's office can come up and, 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 and join the, the, the table. Talk about the, the, the different elements that are funded of the Vision Zero program, because some are in DOT and, 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 and some are not. I'd just like to get that overview. So, um, David, do you have the, your, your breakdown? So, no, not, not, not the comparison, just the breakdown. So we funded um, uh, Vision Zero in a number of departments uh, at a um, total number of 17.36 million. Um, I had previously said uh, 16 million. The CAO's analysis uh, has it a little higher than that. Um, that includes uh, street safety um, improvements, speed zone surveys, uh, Vision Zero project management, uh, speed zone surveys, uh, education campaign, design, bus stop, uh, security lighting, uh, traffic signal installation, uh, education, speed zone enforcement, street improvements, engineering support, street lighting support, uh, and Vision Zero pedestrian lighting. And it also includes, as we've discussed, uh, 5.25 million of uh, Vision Zero design and implementation for our $35 million street reconstruction uh, proposed program. 
And how would those streets be chosen, do we know? In terms of uh, specifically to the street reconstruction program? Yeah. So our intent was that we have a network of streets that are failing in many ways. And, um, you know, so let me just back up just a, a little bit, um, Councilman. Uh, the intent of this proposal um, and the mayor's intent, first of all, this is, a this is a very good problem to have, which is we have significantly, um, significant new resources that we can dedicate towards um, fixing a number of problems on our streets. So as we've uh, established uh, time and time again, you know, we have people dying on our streets due to traffic incidents. We have people getting injured on our sidewalks, disabled and seniors that can't navigate their own neighborhoods because the sidewalks are in such uh, disrepair. Um, we have streets that are in much better condition than they were uh, eight years ago, um, but still in an unacceptable condition, particularly the worst streets, um, which we haven't addressed and we haven't spent any money on. And then, of course, we're constantly getting sued um, for dangerous conditions. So the intent of this proposal and the intent of how we would choose the streets um, to invest in would be a, would be a comprehensive uh, look at how we can fix all of the issues. You, you discussed the issue of bike lanes um, that have potholes that need to be fixed. That's absolutely true. The, the, the streets that we would choose uh, for the reconstruction program would be the streets on the high injury network and ideally the streets in the priority corridors. Um, we had engineering do an analysis and um, they would be best to speak to it, but they show an overlap of about 31% of the streets um, that are failed on the high injury network. So our, um, our intent with this proposal is to coordinate the departments that deal with our streets in a way that we can realize the full vision, for lack of a better word, where, it's, where we have zero fatalities, um, zero injuries on sidewalks, uh, zero potholes, and zero lawsuits. Thanks. I, I, I just want to note um, that um, I, I, I challenge the BOE estimate of the overlap because I, th I, I think the way, or, or BS uh, Street Services, I can't remember which did it, because I think the way they calculate is by lane miles as opposed to center line miles. And so if you're doing it by lane miles, you're sort of, you know, if, it's, if it's a particularly wide street, you're, you're, you're counting a, a you, your math is very different than if you're counting just the number of street segments. Uh, so I, I think there's a different percentage if you, if you do center line miles. Uh, so let me ask um, Ms. Reynolds. Um, there's a, a number of good things that are, are, are funded. Um, m my feeling is that it's still not enough. W one of the things I, I see lacking in, in the investments is um, the, um, the, the, the corridor projects, which are a little bit more holistic. Can you talk about what the corridor projects are and why it's important to fund those? Sure. So in the action plan, we wanted to learn from other cities that have gone before us, San Francisco, New York, other cities that have been working on Vision Zero for a little bit longer than Los Angeles. And what those cities told us is that Vision Zero is a corridor problem. It's not um, an individual intersection problem. So, um, and I would argue that it's maybe some kind of a mix of both. So you have locations like Hollywood and Highland, where we were having somebody get injured or killed once a month. And there were really strong patterns to why those pedestrian crashes were happening. And so there was a very specific solution that we could go in with a laser focus and apply. There are other corridors in the city where there may be an intersection that has a strong pattern, but what you see is uh, severe and fatal crashes happening all along the corridor. And when we see a pattern like that, what we sort of, dis what we at, at the Department of Transportation see is that you need a holistic solution. You need to deal with what's going on on that corridor because either the land use has changed, so there are more people walking and biking and taking transit on that corridor, 
or you have a, a street that was designed um, to carry a lot of vehicles going at higher speeds, and that's no longer appropriate for the way people are using the street. So the corridor, uh, our attention to corridors and our focus on corridors and our continued um, sort, of, um, uh, sort of emphasis on that in the way that we create the capital plan for Vision Zero is really based on that. It's based on our analysis of what's really going on. It's based on lessons learned from other cities. And it's based on what we know from you know, national and, and local research, what will work to diminish or um, eliminate those severe and fatal crashes. We also know that there needs to be a, a layered approach, engineering enforcement education, which I mentioned, but not all E's are created equal. So engineering is really the best way to create that 24-hour self-enforcing safe street. What are the, the, um, the, the palette or menu of solutions for, uh, for, for a corridor approach? Uh, and how does DOT determine what they are? What's the community or council office engagement? So we take sort of, um, I like to say there's art and science. So the science part is that, you know, what the work we've been doing with investments that, that uh, the mayor and the council made in, in prior years. It's a deep analysis and understanding of the real causes behind those crashes. And once we understand the causes, we can go out and look for what the toolkit is to eliminate them. And these are not uh, philosophical or anecdotal. Each of the things that we identify has a crash reduction factor associated with it established in the highway safety manual put out by Federal Highways. So we know that when we put in curb extensions, we can expect a you know 20 percent reduction in crashes. So we pull together what we think is the appropriate palette for that street. It could include curb extensions, it could include new signals, um, it could include simpler treatments, uh, something we call a gateway treatment where we're um, going in and, and making uh, an upgrades to a crosswalk to make it higher visibility, which we know has a sustained uh, lowering on speeds, which is important around schools and other things like that. Um, then there are more ambitious uh, sort of plans where we look at a street and we feel confident that we could move the same number of vehicles with fewer lanes. And so we look at ways to introduce turn lanes, for example, so that uh, drivers who want to make a left turn have a place to safely get out of traffic and do that. We look at opportunities to put in median islands, which in some locations can bring down pedestrian crashes by up to 50 percent. Uh, we look at opportunities to widen the sidewalk uh, in future years. Um, and sometimes we look at opportunities to put in uh, different types of, of bike facilities and bike treatments, depending on what's called for in the mobility plan and also what we think might actually reduce the number of, of crashes on the street. Then we take those options out to the community. We work closely. We, we brief each of the council offices, uh, and we do outreach in the community. That's underway right now for all the high-priority corridors. Um, and in this round, we've actually taken a little bit different approach. We've invested in community-based organizations and arts organizations to partner with us on that outreach because we know that um, we are not always uh, the right messengers, uh, and we are not we are hardly ever uh, the experts uh, for the neighborhoods in which we work, and we want to invest and grow those organizations that are the experts. So, and then once you put that soup sandwich together, uh, we come up with a, a final proposal. And usually, it breaks down into you know short, medium, and long-term uh, investments based on cost uh, and feasibility. So. We want to get out there as quickly as possible with the stuff that we can do with the funding and the resources we have in hand, and then we come back over time and put in the more expensive capital um, countermeasures. And what's the distinction between the, the broader high injury network and the 40 top priority project corridors? So we knew that, you know, first we wanted to take the 7,500 miles of streets in Los Angeles and bring it down to something more manageable. So that's the high injury network. That's where we have two-thirds of the severe and fatal crashes for people biking and walking in the city. It represents somewhere around six or seven percent of the overall street network. But that's still a lot. You know, that's still 460, 500 miles of streets. So we needed to prioritize further because we don't have the resources to go out and fix 500 miles of streets in a single year. So we prioritized these streets based on, uh, we went out and did outreach. We got over 500 responses and people weighing in on how they thought we ought to prioritize these. So we did it based on three things. One, the highest, the streets with the highest concentration of crashes. So just raw numbers, 
where are the worst places in the city for this problem. The second was which streets have um, over-representation of older adults and children. So where do we have places where very vulnerable populations uh, are being affected? Uh, and the last one was that we looked at the overlay of the city's community health atlas, which tells us uh, what neighborhoods in the city um, are already communities of concern, have other negative public health outcomes, high numbers of kids with asthma and diabetes, uh, where we want to we want to focus investment. So those are the three factors that we use to create um, the corridors. And then we also added in uh, some that we knew we were going to build um, during this period of time because we wanted to make sure that those were captured for evaluation. And some of those th those areas have poor pavement condition, and some don't. Right. Correct. It's a mix. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what the the challenges would be to sort of tethering the reconstruction and the Vision Zero together? Well, I think that it's a no-brainer that there ought to be funding that goes along with true street reconstruction to accomplish a whole number of goals that we have in the city, including gray and green infrastructure uh, for stormwater capture, including uh, things that are maybe not purely safety related, but that relate to the overall uh, transit friendliness, walkability of a neighborhood main street, um, and things that relate directly to Vision Zero. Um, that's the kind of, those are the kind of improvements that I call sort of the follow the paving bucket. And I think that that is an extremely smart investment. And I think that there are huge opportunities for us to do integrated design from the beginning um, in a way that we haven't done unless, uh, with the exception of some very, very large capital projects where we have the luxury and the funding to do that. So I think that that is the, the opportunity here and one that I know that um, Bureau of Engineering, Bureau of Street Services, and Department of Transportation um, are all enthusiastic fans of this idea. I think that the challenge will be that there are um, streets that uh, we know we've prioritized that need investment that will not be resurfaced, that have good or fair pavement, that we won't touch in the next, you know, maybe even five to ten years. And it's those locations where, um, you know, we're going to be challenged to sort of put together funding to address those issues. So we've prioritized them through an action planning process. Um, but they don't necessarily perfectly align um, with the, the streets that are failing. So I think that's going to be a, a challenge, is that you're going to have a bucket of streets where this program may not, a, we may need to find other funding to address them. Yeah, I, I had actually been thinking about the challenges in coordinating, because we're still not there on the coordination for uh, uh, parking enforcement and street sweeping. But as, as you were talking, it occurred to me that um, the, the, by tethering, we're almost, we're, we're saying to a neighborhood that has a, 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 a block or a corridor with a lot of fatalities, we can't fix this problem until your streets get worse, which, the, the, I mean, we can't be making investments based on where we're failing uh, in other areas unrelated to the problem we're trying to fix. Um, um, just a, a couple last questions before I ask for some report backs and wrap up. Um, could you explain the difference between the, the levels of interventions on priority, priority corridor projects phase one and uh, phase two? Because they're different, right? Sure. And there's, a, there's even a phase three. So okay. think of phase one as the most cost effective uh, things that we could do using uh, the, the sort of um, least expensive tools in the toolbox. So paint, bollards, signs, um, the, the sort of um, the cheapest, fastest things that we could get out there and do now. That's phase one. Phase two introduces a little bit more capital intensive infrastructure, mainly signals. So that this is when you start getting into you know, the um, improvements like the ones we're making on Venice, where we're introducing new signalized pedestrian crossings um, to get people across some of our widest, busiest streets and knit neighborhoods back together and address the safety issues. Phase three is where we start pick up and picking up and moving concrete around. So this is you know, curb extension, sidewalk widening, um, <clears throat> much bigger time infrastructure 
uh, that the Department of Transportation doesn't typically deal with because anytime you touch drainage, uh, then we really rely on our civil engineering expertise at Bureau of Engineering and Street Services. So okay. it breaks down that way. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to ask for a, a, a few report backs. Um, the um, first one uh, is I'm going to ask DOT to report on what elements of the Vision Zero priority corridors could be funded with the resources provided in the budget as currently allocated. Um, uh, and also ask, I'll do this in the same report so we're not creating too much work, is for DOT uh, to report on the Vision Zero priority projects that do not have street segments in poor condition, including what additional resources would be needed to complete phase one, two, and three. Um, the second report back would be um, from DOT on uh, sort of a little bit more detail on what we were just discussing, the opportunities and challenges of delivering a combined program of street recon reconstruction and Vision Zero, uh, including but not limited to the challenges in addressing competing priorities competing goals and competing scopes of work and opportunities for public benefit. Um, next would be sort of the, the mirror of that, which is from DOT, BOE, and Street Services, a report on how a coordinated Vision Zero paving program could be successfully implemented through outreach planning, project delivery, using the Vision Zero action plan to drive project selection and prioritization. Um, uh, I'd also ask DOT to report on the annual resources needed to achieve the benchmark goals of the Vision Zero Action Plan uh, as approved uh, by this council a few months ago. And the final one is I'd ask uh, uh, CAO uh, and uh, CLA and uh, to report back on the um, potential for an additional $10 million in funding for Vision Zero corridor projects, not tied to reconstruction projects. And for that, I'll, I'll suggest a couple places to look. If you could um, uh, rerun the, the SB1 numbers, but also I note that uh, our budget for signal construction is counted twice. It's in the uh, 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 gas tax and in CIEP, uh, and so that gives us a potential source for, for that, if we could report back on that potential. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Bonin. And uh, Ms. Reynolds, let me just echo what Mr. Bonin said about the direction that the department is going in. I, um, I personally couldn't be more pleased with the way that you have led this department and built um, such a really responsive and visionary team. So um, bravo and kudos. And I, of course, also, I think everyone on the council agrees with Mr. Bonin's sense of urgency <clears throat> about reducing and eliminating the number of traffic deaths that we have, uh, which is outrageous in this city. And so I want to talk first a little bit uh, about that and drill down a little bit. Um, what percentage of traffic deaths that we have in a given year, last year, or whatever you can say, are due to speeding? So when we look at the, the crash data, um, what we see is that, for example, last year uh, traffic deaths were up somewhere around 35 or 40 percent, um, and this year we are already over last year's number for pedestrian deaths by another 35 percent. So there's no question that we're moving in the wrong direction. When you look at uh, the fatalities themselves, the number one cause or predictor of the, the sort of um, severity of a crash is speed. Uh, when you look at the cause of crashes that get reported, um, one of the things that the department has advocated for is to change the form itself to make it easier for the responding officer to note that because what they're required to do is focus on a specific CVC violation. Um, and so usually the, the, the top line cause will be um, pedestrian right-of-way violation and then the secondary cause will be speed. So well, I, that's I sort of I would very the, much join you in that and I'd like a special study uh, back so that we can introduce a motion to do exactly that, first okay. of all. Um, but wouldn't you agree that speed and or distracted drivers are the principal source of deaths on our roads every year. 
Absolutely. Okay. So um, in the high injury network, what percentage of our high injury network streets have current enforceable speed surveys to allow our traffic officers to be able to enforce uh, speed laws? So we've increased, uh, we started out the middle of 2016 with over uh, 1,300 miles citywide with expired speed surveys. So basically not enforceable by radar. Um, on the high injury network itself, uh, we have over the last year, uh, with some investment that the council made last year, um, increased the number of completed speed surveys on about 250 miles. So we're on track to finish the entire high injury network by the end of this year. So 50% of it is now enforceable. So 50% of the high injury network is currently enforceable with new speed limits posted pursuant to updated speed surveys? Correct. Okay, which means that 50% of the high injury it's network not. that we're working on design changes and engineering changes right now can have a driver driving 80 miles an hour down it and a traffic officer cannot use radar to cite that driver? Correct. Okay, I'd like a report back uh, and this can be a special study report back uh, indicating what it will take to get 100% of our high injury network currently posted with correct speed limits and updated uh, speed surveys so that our traffic officers can uh, write tickets to speeders and save lives. Um, on another um, issue, uh, some time ago, well, let me just describe a problem to you and then ask you what the department is doing to address that problem. Um, in a number of our districts, um, I know Mr. Kretz, Mr. Rue, myself, um, probably almost <coughs> the, major the majority, if not everybody in the council, uh, hear lots of complaints about residential neighborhoods with substandard streets often with no sidewalks, often with limited traffic uh, regulation, um, being inundated by hundreds and hundreds of cars passing through unregulated intersections in a residential neighborhood, 99% um, of which ignore stop signs, and many of which are speeding because they're late for work and they're looking at their Waze app on their phone as they're driving through our neighborhoods. Um, it's, uh, it's become a disaster in many places of our city, in many parts of our city. It has, it is an enormous threat to public safety. It's an enormous threat to the safety of children in particular. And um, it's, it's ruining uh, neighborhoods' abilities to use their own streets to get in and out of their own driveway even. Um, now I know there have been some steps taken in a few places, but this to me is part of a larger citywide systemic uh, problem that we have. That's why I introduced a motion to ask the department to just work with ways to, I mean, we provide them with lots of data. We're supposed to have a partnership and yet they routinely blow off any requests that we have to try to have any minor modification in what they, uh, where they route people through our residential neighborhoods. So what's the status of, of that effort? What can we do to try to advance the cause of saving some of our residential neighborhoods from the you know, twice a day um, impacts that they suffer? So the status of our work with Waze, as you mentioned, we have a data sharing agreement with them. We share a lot of information with them about um, in particular where there are street closures to um, eliminate the number of people using their algorithms. By some estimate, one in four drivers in LA County has ways um, and uses it. And they've been great partners on that particular part of the data sharing agreement. Um, the other part of the data sharing agreement, which we were really hopeful we could effect change around, was um, getting drivers, uh, moving drivers away from these routes through residential neighborhoods that then put them out in the middle of an unsignalized intersection and have them make a left turn, unprotected left turn across four, five, six lanes of traffic. 
And while they did agree to include that, it is a preference or a setting that a user has to opt into that's buried deep in the, the settings part of Waze, which I'm sure uh, you know, most of us never even sort of dig into. Um, and when we've pushed them on that, we've had a harder time getting them to really incorporate that as something you opt out of um, instead. So we've given them all of our data. These are the signals where you really should be pushing drivers to get them out of the neighborhoods, and that's been more difficult. We don't have um, a great deal of, of leverage in the relationship. Um, so what we have to do then is uh, you know, turn to some of the very traditional traffic calming and traffic management techniques um, that we've used for 30 or 40 years um, I'm sure that Waze is one of the reasons for the huge number of traffic calming requests that we had. And some of those council districts that you mentioned, particularly 4, 5, 11, 2, had some of the highest number of requests for speed humps in the city. And so, you know, the, the speed humps is one thing. Other cities have tried things like turn restrictions, so putting in no left, no right hand turn signs. The problem with those is that they are not self-enforcing and about 50% of drivers uh, don't obey them. And so then you've set up, you've, you've maybe exacerbated a safety issue because you've created a situation where you expect, if you live in that neighborhood, that people are not making a left and you behave accordingly and when that one out of you know, every other driver makes that left, um, you might end up with a, a safety problem, that an un unintended consequence. Mm -hmm. so, I think that we are going to have to, you know, invest in infrastructure that uh, deals with this problem um, rather than relying on the partnership with Waze alone. It's, you know, we went down that road um, and we were not as successful as we would have liked to have been. So that's sort of, you know, that's the way I think we're going to have to go. Right. Um, in your letter, uh, you indicated that um, with additional resources, um, one of the department's objectives would be to coordinate and implement projects that prioritize safety and account for human error. Um, what's encompassed in accounting for human error and how does that, how do you address the increasing problem of distracted driving? So, you know, when, when we talk about Vision Zero, what we talk about is that in the U.S. we've created a system that relies heavily on um, driver knowledge and adherence to a series of signals paint, signs that we put out on the road. And if everyone obeyed those perfectly, we would have Vision Zero tomorrow. Um, but the fact is that we are- If the city are, had a few extra billion dollars, we could do a lot of things too. No but, problem. You know, we know that human beings, especially it seems like in the city, simply don't do that. They don't have the first idea what a solid white line means or what they're supposed to do with it. So how do we, how do we address that? So the, the shift in thinking that really underpins all of Vision Zero is that rather than designing our streets for perfect behavior, we design them to be forgiving when people make mistakes. And so that includes things like um, bringing the, the speed down, particularly in off-peak times of day. You know, when the streets are congested, speed is not what we're worried about. We're worried about people becoming impatient and um, maybe disobeying a law or running a red light. Um, but during the off-peak times of the day, and especially in the, in the evening, in the middle of the day, it's really speed. So that when you make a mistake, when you are distracted, and you, know, you have a, 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 you know, something tragic happens, the result is not death. So that's really where Vision Zero comes from. It, it revises our approach to design. So we take into account the fact that we are vulnerable and we make mistakes. And so the system has to forgive. Um, also making uh, the other way we do that is by separation. So the reason Hollywood and Highland is so successful is that we completely separated people driving from people walking. Uh, when those lights are all on red, pedestrians can, can cross the street however they'd like. And then when those lights are green for drivers, pedestrians are held um, at the corners. It's not confusing, it's simple, and it works. So it's those kinds of, uh, that kind of dual approach to changing the way we think about design. You know, along those lines, we've talked for years, people have proposed for years, the idea of having four-way reds, 
just for a half a second or, or so, um, and we're always told, well, it's too complicated to work that through ADSAC and so on. I, I mean, wouldn't that in itself be a tremendous lifesaver of pedestrians and also drivers uh, who end up in you know, yellow light collisions? We absolutely do have a, a very small amount of all red time at signals, but to your point, um, the way we deal with signals, the way we time our signals, how much yellow time and red time you receive is something that um, I like to think of as invisible urbanism. It's something that we can do using ATSAC um, that is simple and that we can scale up and do citywide. And that is those kinds of ideas, um, in particular late at night, so that you don't get a green wave down a street that allows you to go 50 miles an hour at 11 o'clock, um, are fundamental parts of the Vision Zero capital plan that we've identified in the action plan. So right. um, that is the, that whole family of signal associated countermeasures is in there. Okay, thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, autonomous vehicle testing, um, which makes the hair on the back of my neck go up because we're talking about protecting pedestrians um, and protecting <coughs> bicyclists and I see you know, in, in fulfilling that objective, I'm not sure that we need to be on the cutting edge of being the testing grounds for unproven technology yet that, you know, doesn't necessarily keep pedestrians and bicyclists safe yet. Is there some reason we have to be the testing ground as opposed to Topeka and let them work out the bugs before we allow it uh, to come here? I, I, I just don't I see why that would be a priority. I will not comment on the appropriateness of, of Topeka for uh, you know untested technologies, but I'll say I'll say this: what I think LA does need to lead on is articulating exactly what you are getting at: the set of regulations, public policy, and infrastructure investments that we want to make to to be technology guiding. So instead of just you know allowing auto manufacturers and software companies to dictate the rules of engagement and what we think the future looks like. That's the reason why we put together the vision and the plan for transportation technology strategy. Uh, we were at the Department of Motor Vehicles last week. We were one of only three cities there um, to testify on their rulemaking, um, to put forward a very strong position that cities need to be uh, in the position of uh, granting or denying permission for that kind of testing that you're referring to. So it's not about putting LA on the cutting edge of, uh, of, of Elon Musk's uh, tunnels. It's more about making sure that we can drive the technology and direct the technology the way that we want for the outcomes we care about. Um, transportation should serve the city and not the other way around. And I'm concerned that if city, cities like Los Angeles don't show leadership, uh, what we'll get will be a very painful transition and, a, and an, excru an excruciating uh, kind of wild, wild west atmosphere. So that's really where the continued investment is needed so that we can attract the kinds of companies and upgrades um, that we think will, will really work. Great. Thank you. Um, the revenue book indicates continuing decline in uh, parking enforcement citation revenues. And um, so we've dropped, looks like 12% um, <coughs> or so from over the last three or so years in uh, parking enforcement revenues. Um, do you, are you comfortable with the revenue projections that we have uh, for this year for parking enforcement actually being met? And um, what are your thoughts about uh, increasing revenue there and enhancing our uh, traffic officer uh, positions to do so? So I think if I'm being realistic, I don't expect uh, the trends that have led to that revenue change um, to alter significantly. I don't think that you know in 2017 we're all of a sudden going to see a huge reduction in the number of calls for our service to go direct traffic. You know, with the build out of Metro's program, with the traffic officers and key intersections program, with a strong economy that leads to lots of events like the one that's going to happen 
uh, downtown here later today, and a, and a sharp increase in First Amendment events, um, as well as ongoing unplanned occurrences like water main breaks um, and other sort of emergency calls for our service. I think that that uh, shift in how we deploy and what we are being called upon to do is going to continue, if not increase. Another area um, that I expect will continue to increase is that we've had a 30% increase in calls for dispatch. So this is where the officer needs to come out and deal with an abandoned vehicle, uh, people who are, um, you know, the, the homelessness crisis that continues to expand and having people living in their vehicles um, that leads to a lot of, of friction in neighborhoods. We're the front line of going out and really addressing those things. Those things aren't going to change. So if I'm being very honest and realistic, I think the revenue you know, projections are going to continue um, on the trajectory that they've been on, which is one of the reasons why we had sort of gone through the exercise of thinking about this traffic officer one, two, three kind of program that would allow us to have officers, the bulk of the force, the vast bulk of the force dedicated um, to all of those kinds of services that I just articulated, um, but would have a group of officers that was really focused on I consider what I consider to be safety and economic development focused work, you know, making sure there's turnover, parking turnover in commercial districts, making sure that people are not blocking bus stops, that people are not blocking fire hydrants, that work, that day-to-day -day work, making sure that streets can be swept, all of those things, those are critical to the quality of life of this city. So that's really, you know, for my mind, it is not as much about revenue as it is about creating the force that's needed for what's being asked today. Um, and that's why we had sort of gone through that, that work to do that, because I'm, I'm mindful of the revenue piece, but I'm also mindful of wanting a, to have a 21st century department that runs a great operation. One area that I just want to continue to stress is the need uh, for enforcement of, you know, blue curb and other handicap placard abuses. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the more people we can cite for abusing uh, those spaces, uh, the better. And uh, it will pay for itself. More importantly, it will stop the what I consider just the outrageous, obnoxious practice of having an able-bodied person take up a space that a disabled person critically needs. So I just continue to urge you to, to move in that direction as well. Um, I have much more, but uh, Mr. Bonner took all of our time, so <laughs> uh, we, have, we, have to, we have to move. And, and, and was very <coughs> thorough and covered most of the things I wanted to ask about anyway, so thank you uh, for that. Uh, we'll go next to Ms. Martinez. I wanted to talk a little bit about traffic signals. Um, the allocation of, um, I believe it's 1.9 for traffic signal supplies, does that include new signals uh, that are currently pending funding? So what I believe was in the, the budget was, um, you know, there was a little bit of, of funding in, in MICLA and a little bit of funding in uh, gas tax for signals. And so what we had submitted as part of our budget uh, package was $6 million of um, signal improvements that included uh, new signals, but also things like adding a left turn arrow to an existing signal adding a rectangular rapid flashing beacon for pedestrian crosswalks, so it's a mix. So how many uh, traffic signals does the department think you'll be able to fund with this allocation? So what we have is, uh, what we've, we've looked at is, you know, if we got the $12 million, uh, the full $12 million allocation, um, it breaks down into about 40 signal improvements. Uh, City, many of Citywide? Citywide, yeah. Okay, now I want to get into uh, Vision Zero. So when we started the process of dedicating measure and re, uh, local return funding, we first started with just only counting on Measure M funds, correct? Um, since the state has passed the gas and the VLF fees, it seems to me like we have a lot more funding, and this should create an opportunity for us to be able to fund both. Um, how can we ensure that we reach our goal of eliminating traffic deaths uh, with the new resources and also addressing the other, other infrastructure needs that we need? So I think that first and foremost, 
the, the integrated approach is, has to be a critical part of any strategy. You know, that where we are, if we are touching a street to improve it, uh, to resurface it, to bring its pavement back up to a state of good repair, there should be a checklist of things that are just a given, that are part of that resurfacing work, so that every time we, we visit a street, we put it back better than we, we found it. Um, but as I mentioned during the questions from Councilman Bonin, there are going to be needs that we have from a safety perspective um, where we don't have necessarily a dedicated pot of funding to deal with. Uh, there's also obviously a tremendous pressing need uh, to uh, upgrade, you know, a lot more failing streets in the city. So um, I don't have a great answer, but I think those are some of the, the challenges. You're, well, you have this one year where mm -hmm. you don't actually have a full year's worth of That's funding. Funny. So, you know, in an initial investment, I think trying to do things in a coordinated way is really smart. Uh, but in future years and over time, um, there's going to be maybe a balancing act among all three of those buckets. Well, the, I struggle with the fact that what does the repaved street matter when in my district, uh, last year alone, we've had nine traffic-related deaths. And just yesterday on Sepulveda Boulevard, we had a pedest pedestrian um, fatality. It was metro versus a pedestrian, and that resulted in a, in a um, fatality. So I struggle with that. Um, and we've, we've talked about um, one of the most dangerous intersections in my district, which is Roscoe and Van Nuys. So we're currently working with a new um, owner of the Panorama Mall, and there's a lot of activity in that intersection regarding um, some economic development opportunities there. So it's already a given that the pedestrian activity in that intersection is going to uh, increase. So with that, and in light of perhaps getting light rail along Van Nuys Boulevard, we're now talking about maybe having to do with four or five modes of, um, you know, of transportation in that area, whether it be pedestrians, um, cars, buses, bikes, and now the light rail. So I think this really gives us an opportunity to figure out what we can do creatively uh, and use this pot of money to, to pr protect and save lives on that intersection because it's something that's been um, on my mind since I got elected. What's your sense of how, many, how much have, has actually changed um, ever since um, in reducing um, actual traffic deaths since the executive order was signed? Do we have any sense of what's actually changed and how many lives we've actually saved as a result of that? So I think where we've done, the other part of Vision Zero, which we haven't talked a lot about, is, is evaluation, right? So we're going to go in, we're going to make some investments on these first 40 corridors, and then we're going to come in afterwards and see, did what we, did the improvement that we made make a difference? Did it get us the outcome um, that we, we hoped it would? So, you know, the example of Hollywood and Highland that we use frequently is that, you know, we went from a severe fatal crash in that intersection m every month to zero injuries since that improvement has gone in. So there's literally, you know, more than a dozen people who are walking around right now today because of some paint and signal timing changes that we made in that intersection. Mm -hmm. Citywide, though, the picture is not good. You know, the, the number, as I mentioned before, um, has increased last year and, and is, is continuing to increase this year. So that's why we want to, you know, we wanted to put together a thoughtful plan uh, that we think will actually get us to some of those reductions. We picked um, the streets in this, uh, these corridors because they would represent about a 20% reduction if we were able to make all the upgrades that we want to um, on those corridors. So we've tried to be very thoughtful about that. Um, having said that, no big city has gotten to zero yet. And so we're all now, you know, working through these issues and struggling with these issues in real time. With the next year's allocation, do you have a sense of what percentage of the work program we can actually tackle? And at, what, at this rate, how long will it take us to actually get to zero fatality level? So we haven't done that analysis yet because we don't know exactly, you know, which of these streets might be resurfaced. Um, and which of them will be able to invest. Um, as I also mentioned before, you know, starting after we released the action plan, uh, we began to endeavor to do the design and outreach for each of the, the corridors. So we're also getting to a place where we have solid cost estimates and we have a good sense of what the actual improvements are going to be. So we haven't gotten to that level of detail yet. 
The other thing I wanted to talk about, um, and me and Mr. Bonin have been discussing this, is I have real serious concerns about how you're going to coordinate um, Vision Zero with street, service, street services, because I don't think as a city we do very well in, the, in terms of coordinating with other departments. Can you speak a little bit about that? Um, the last thing I want to see is for, street ser for you to have to chase street services to be able to coordinate the Vision Zero plan on how to save lives on that, on that particular corridor or intersection. So, you know, the, the challenges are uh, challenges that I've uh, encountered at almost every city where I've worked. You have two different goals, and when you try and bring them into alignment, and I'll use an example from San Francisco um, uh, so, that, um, so that we can just sort of take it out of LA for a minute. Um, Public Works there had a goal to do a certain number of curb ramps every year. D MTA had a goal to get to Vision Zero. So every time we put in an improvement that needed a curb ramp, we would slow Public Works down. Mm -hmm. So they wouldn't be able to get to their numeric goal of curb ramps if they followed us around. Um, so there's always those kinds of challenges that exist. The tension, the natural tension between delivering 2,400 lane miles of resurfacing every year, uh, which is an incredible goal and, and you know, bigger and better than any city in the U.S., versus a goal to increase the number of people biking, for example. Those two things may or may not align. And so you have this natural tension between a department that's trying to deliver you know, one metric and a department that's crying, trying to deliver another. Um, that's where we get into a situation where you know, each of us may be managing the other sideways, et cetera. My um, sort of optimism is that you know, by bringing all of this under one umbrella in a very intentional way under the Bureau of Engineering as a single project manager, you have an opportunity to uh, align all of those priorities. And if the, the sort of direction is clear that the, the streets that will be repaired with this bucket of money in the next year are going to be streets that include some portion of the high priority corridors, then what you have is Vision Zero leading the paving program and not the other way around. Mm -hmm. That is a policy choice. Um, but that's sort of, those are the things that are different about this budget. But the challenges that you've articulated, those will remain. Okay. Well, I'm going to ask for a report back on what that workflow and coordination might look like. Will it be DOT, um, you driving the program, or will it be Bureau of Street Services or Bureau of Engineering? But I think we need to deal with that. You're right at a policy level before we get started, because I'm not as optimistic. Okay. Sorry to say that. I'm just not. Councilwoman? Yes. If, if, I, if I just could add that, that point, it's an it's a important point. The, the intent. See, this year we don't have a street reconstruction program. The 35 million is a new program. We don't reconstruct failed streets. We haven't since the recession because right. it's just been too expensive. When we looked at how we wanted to allocate and dedicate um, funding for a street reconstruction program, we wanted Vision Zero to dictate where those streets would be fixed. Not and ex exactly as Ms. Reynolds said, if we're going to spend the money on, a, on fixing a street from the ground up, it better be where it's, uh, in the areas where it's most dangerous and where we could also at the same time implement safety improvements. So, it, so she's exactly right. The intent of the mayor was to have Vision Zero drive the reconstruction program, at least the location of where those streets would be fixed. Great. Okay. Um, let's move on to the $500,000 allocation for education and community outreach. Can you talk a little bit about what that plan looks like? Will it be a continuation of the current Vision Zero coordinator outreach effort? Or are you thinking more of a top level down education effort? What does that look like? So I think there's, um, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, there's a million that's for education and outreach that's in that 17 so million. So my notes are wrong. So it's a million dollars? Total. Okay. Okay. Uh, what we would like to use that for actually is more uh, traditional education that includes media buys. So billboards, radio ads, um, those kind, that kind of education. The way that we're rolling it out right now, because we have some funding from the Office of Traffic Safety, is that those, uh, that education is all targeted at the high priority corridors. So it's not a citywide program. It's really aimed at the corridors where we wanted to do that layering of education, enforcement, and outreach. Um, and then we did use about $250,000 this year um, to invest in community-based organizations to do more of the boots on the ground kind of outreach. 
Um, so that's underway right now, and we'll be sort of evaluating how much of that we want to continue as part of the 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 the, um, the seventeen eighteen program. Okay. Um, do you have a sense of what the local return allocations will be for 2018, 2019, um, and the gas tax allocation as well? And the reason I'm asking is maybe this will help us determine whether it makes more sense to put a percentage funding restriction right now, or if the, allocation are, if the allocations are growing, uh, why not dedicate a percentage to make sure that we reach our goal by 2025? So I don't have the revenue forecasts uh, for SB1 and, and Measure M local return. I've heard different numbers. Do you have a ballpark? Does anybody in the mayor's office? CAO. Um, if you follow Metro's forecasting, Measure M will generate about $58 million in local return for 1819. And if you look at the current estimates that are being provided by the state, it's around 78, 79 million for SB1. Those, that's a, those are incremental amounts above the existing level of gas tax. Okay, can I get a report back as well on this issue? I just want to make, I want to know what makes sense, whether we put a percentage funding restriction now or if the allocations are growing, uh, this ex significant growth between 58 and $79 million. Uh, why not dedicate a certain percentage of that to, uh, the 20, to meeting our 2025 goal as well? Um, and Mr. Bonin, thank you for bringing up the Lonnie allocation as well. I was going to bring that up. So we are going to put that back in. I think it's 550,000 $550, line item that was um, eliminated. You're looking at putting it back in? Able to put it back in Prop C, we'd have to look for an alternative funding source. But you're currently doing that. I can work with the CLA. Okay, great. To to look for. All right. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Blumenfield. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I want to start by echoing some of my colleagues in terms of the praising you for really moving this department forward. Uh, it's palpable and and uh, it's appreciated by the by the whole city. Thank you. Um, a lot of the areas we've already covered. One thing was a little shocking to me, I must have misunderstood it last year, was the street surveys. I was under the misimpression when we put that extra money in the budget last year that that was going to complete our street surveys. But clearly- For the high injury network. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that caveat, and that concerns me. So first on the high injury network, that means we're going to be done by the end of this fiscal year or the end of the calendar year? End of the calendar year. Okay. So so into the next, so it wasn't, so even my understanding of where it was, I thought it was the, the fiscal year budget, it would be over. So I've been telling people in three months. So that's not the case. So we'll, we, we will not have the high energy network completely surveyed until January. I think that our goal is to have as much of the high energy network enforceable by end of this calendar year. So the survey, not to get too into the weeds, the survey is the first step and then if the, if the actual speed limit is going to change, there's another set of steps that we undertake to get it approved all the way by up to city council. So the surveys, my understanding is that the surveys will be done by the end of the summer, but the, the rest of it to get them all enforceable takes a little bit of extra time. And so that, and that'll be moving in you know, real time. We've got half of it done now, so you'll see continued incremental improvement. And my, if sense is that with the funding that's in this budget, our goal is to finish the rest of the streets in the city by the end of next calendar year. So by the end of calendar 18. So by calendar 18, we will have all of the street surveys done for the entire city. That's our goal. Okay. And having the street surveys done does not mean that they will all be enforceable by, by 2018. Correct. Or, if they you're have not even to saying change. You're saying by the end of 2018. Correct. If the speed, if we go out and we find that the speed limit has to change, there's another set of steps that we have to take before they're enforceable. Which takes, I mean, which is posting and signage and that kind of thing, right? Well, they actually have to get, uh, if we're going to change the speed limit, there's a process we go through where we actually have to go to Transportation Commission, then Transportation Committee, and then full council um, for those to be approved. Right, but you can do those in bulk. You don't have to do one That's right. right. We're bringing, and we're going to bring a big package of them forward in the next month or two as our first step. Okay. Like, like all of my colleagues, that can't happen soon enough. Um, 
you know, the, the, the speed is a problem all across the city and, and constituents are very concerned about it. So I will, my own disappointment in the time is, is my misunderstanding of how that, how that was going, but thank you for explaining it to me. So now in terms of the, um, the traffic enforcement, another issue we've talked about, you made it clear that the, the decline in revenue and what that represents, which is more important than, than the money, which is we're not moving, has, is a result of all the new events and everything else, and that that's not going to change. So it stands to reason then that we need to, to fix that and make sure that we have enough people on the ground to do the basics, uh, because that is a revenue generating or at least revenue neutral, uh, should be revenue neutral function that there should be, it's, it's a no-brainer, we've got to get those folks up and hired. Um, so explain to me again the plan for making sure that, that, that we do, can, can we, I guess, can we charge a little bit more to the folks that are taking those resources away to account for the lost revenue? Or are there other creative ways we can help make this happen or help fund it? So uh, a couple of years ago, the controller did an audit of the Department of Transportation around special, uh, special events. And you know the the picture is that uh, there's a bucket of them where the department has a direct relationship, and we do negotiate um, with Staples, the Dodgers, a lot of those um, sort of civic institutions where we provide ongoing predictable um, services to to reimburse us directly for that work, um, and that also includes you know the Rams now, the Chargers, as well as the new soccer stadium that's opening up um, in the fall. Then there's a second bucket of special events where those event organizers go through the Bureau of Street Services. And we have a system that shows what our costs are. Street Services processes those reimbursements. We receive a payment from them one, sometimes two times a year. But then on the back end, um, you know, we have to front fund that time. And so it's a little bit of a blurrier picture. The last bucket of um, things that we can't account for and don't charge for or First Amendment events, uh, which are increasing at a great clip through the police commission, are things we cannot get reimbursed for. But obviously, you know, we do our level best to get the money back from Metro, uh, from, and, and th those partners are really good at reimbursing us. But it's, it's just a blurrier picture than, I, I, uh, I, I you know. I get all that, I, and, and that was just sort of putting out, maybe that was too much of a red herring, putting that out just to get more funding in, I want us to be creative yeah. about that, but that doesn't change the underlying fact, which is funding the, the resources that we need to do the base level work pays for itself, and that we all agree on that, and so we need to make sure that we have the right mix and the right people uh, fully funded in that. So whatever's being siphoned off can't uh, prevent us from our goal of making sure that the basics of uh, the basics are covered and finding the money and do we have do we have enough people to do that now uh, it, do we have the right mix of full-time and part-time can we increase that what's I mean did we formally ask for a, a report back already on getting the funding for this I don't know if we did so let me let me put that out there to ask for a report back on getting the funding necessary uh, for the for the basic stuff that we do that pays for itself. Um, uh, going on another, maybe some more narrow issues. Uh, the budget book indicates that we're spending 3.3 million for the bike share program. Program's new, I guess we're, we're, we're spending um, significantly, we're, we're getting significantly less than other cities. Has this been evaluated? What's the, how do you feel that it's working compared to other cities? And maybe we'll get a report back on, on how that compares or is it just the growing state, the growing pains. So we're, we look at those numbers on a, a daily, weekly, monthly basis with our partner at Metro. And what we think, um, we, you know, this program is a pilot. And in the first year, the, the things that we are anticipating that uh, we think we, we would want to adjust uh, would be potentially the fare structure. We've got a lot of feedback that it's either too expensive or too confusing. Uh, for people who just want to try it out, who just want to, uh, you know, do a, a one ride or a two ride 
um, kind of a kind of a thing, as well as um, the locations that we've actually served. So we picked a lot of locations for our first rollout. Some of them have been performing really well, outperforming systems um, in other cities. Some of them have been underperforming because they're either a little bit too far away from the core, maybe they're not near uh, a bike infrastructure, or maybe they're just not um, they're not in the right location. So we are planning to relocate a lot of the, the stations from the pilot to places that we think will be better served. Um, and then we are putting together a proposal uh, for expansion, both in downtown and in other parts of the city, um, that we think will improve the performance of the system. Okay. And so this be, so we can get a special report back on the comparisons with other cities and, and plans for improving, which is, makes sense. The, um, going back to parking citations, the city brought the function in-house as a result of the lawsuit. I uh, want to get a sense from you how that's working. Are there offsetting cost savings from the company that, uh, that processes the parking citations that we can take advantage of? So we did, um, as a result of a, a report that we did mid-year, uh, we were able to get the positions funded that we needed uh, to take that operation in-house. That operation has now transitioned um, to, to uh, almost completely um, the final decisions are all made by city employees. We have space in Fig Plaza. We've got everybody hired. Um, so we think we've been able to uh, sort of transition that, open that new business line effectively. Uh, when it comes to whether or not there's been any cost savings, um, the structure of our contract with Xerox Now Conduit um, actually anticipated that uh, they would be handing that off to the city because when we signed the contract, we, we were in the middle of the lawsuit and had indications that we were not going to be successful. So to date, <clears throat> we haven't realized any cost savings, a conduit hasn't, um, that we might be able to, to realize in uh, you know reduction in that contract. Another topic, broad issue of grants, and I've brought this up with a lot of departments in terms of, in my committee, we're trying to evaluate how to improve that process, and I'm, I'm worried across the board that we may be leaving money on the table. Um, and it becomes especially difficult as, as more money comes in for transportation, which is great, are we losing, losing out on potential grants that we might otherwise have gotten if we weren't as cash starved in some ways. Um, I know I'm especially <coughs> concerned about the ATP LA River Headwaters project, which I guess is um, behind schedule and potentially losing some funding. So I wanted to ask about that in particular, but, but also more generally, um, do we have the resources to capture all the money that's out on the table, um, and are we being smart about it and applying for, for what we need to apply for? So. I think that the Department of Transportation's track record in um, getting leveraging money for outside grants has been very strong. Um, anywhere from, you know, we bring in anywhere from six to nine dollars for every dollar of transportation match um, that we're allowed to use. I think that, you know, we've got some extraordinary grant writers, both in the transit division as well as the complete streets division of the department, and those folks are still in their positions. So we still have have dedicated folks who uh, work on, um, you know, pursuing and administering the grants. What I think that I, I see is that there is a growing opportunity for transportation in new grant sectors. So one example is California Air Resources Board cap and trade program. Um, the city was successful in bringing in funding to launch an electric vehicle car sharing program um, in a low income community. So you know we were able to do that. Um, sort of, you know, scrapping together some, some resources to put together that grant and now manage it. Um, but I anticipate that that's only going to grow. So as part of a uh, consultant scope of services that we have currently underway in support of the transportation tech strategy, um, we are investing in uh, some, some folks who have that expertise to make sure that we take advantage of those new funding sources. So I mentioned that we were able to attract funding from DOT for connected autonomous vehicles, um, and I think that that's only going to increase. So for the moment, we're doing okay. I think the grants administration um, and management system that we're going to acquire is going to help, um, but I think there's uh, always going to be a need for the city to invest in people to both scope out those opportunities bring them to us, and also help us put together really competitive grants. So it's not a direct answer. I think we have good resources now, 
Um, but I anticipate that we're going to need more of them and we're going to patch it together with consultants in the meantime. Uh, maybe we can get a special study back on, on transportation grants, including you know, when, when the grants are awarded, um, the budget, the timelines, uh, whether we need formal extensions or how that's been in the past. Um, whether we've had to return money, and then what, what you might need to help bolster that in the future. I mean, at the end of the day, we want to be supportive. You are doing a tremendous amount. We want to be supportive of you in, in capturing every dollar that's out there. And being creative, you know, the cap and trade stuff. I mean, there, there's, in the transportation world, that field has just gotten so big in terms of what you can go after. We want to make sure we're doing, doing it all. Um, another issue. Uh, the proposed budget includes increases in Prop A for DASH. Do we have, is this, do we have enough to sustain it in the long run? So as part of, um, Councilman Bonin mentioned that we've done this line by line needs assessment. And what we anticipate is that in um, next fiscal year, we would like to start rolling out some of the recommendations from that study. So that includes uh, late night service, it includes weekend service, and it also includes procurement to help us start to open five new dash routes that came out, citywide community dash routes that came out of um, the, the outreach and the analysis that we did. We have uh, beyond that another five routes uh, that we would like to open for a total of 10 new routes. So we anticipate that uh, the demand for the service and uh, the need for the service is going to continue to grow. Um, I think there are a lot of competing priorities for all of those funding sources, Prop A and, and Prop C. Um, you know, there's uh, the, the city needs to contribute its 3% um, to Metro for the stations that we have in the city of Los Angeles. Um, there are other transit projects that are pursuing sort of uh, line item funding in there as well. So I think that it's going to be a, a challenge for car. us to balance those, um, those competing priorities. And, uh, you know, we look to the council for leadership around, you know, the sort of policy direction um, and how we, how we can deliver all of these services. Because, you know, it, it, at the town hall I went to in your district, uh, it doesn't matter if I'm going to um, a meeting to turn on a signal or to, uh, to talk to a community about a stop sign. The first question I usually get is, how can we get more DASH service? People love that service. It is cost effective. We deliver it for 40% cheaper than Metro delivers theirs. Um, so we think it is a, a service that we're very proud of and we want to continue to grow. Well, and I'll put a pitch in, especially um, the West Valley and Warner Center, we don't have any DASH service <clears throat> yet. And you know, we look in other areas, we've got regional connectors and streetcars and other things that are spending a heck of a lot of money in, in, in one area and other areas that are growing quite fast. Uh, I don't know of an area that's growing faster, maybe outside of downtown. Um, don't have any circulators and, and, and it's desperately needed. So I'll just put that out there. Um, other issues in terms of uh, just, just to throw a point of contention, my colleague talking about the uh, not wanting to see the autonomous vehicles being tested here. I want to see them being tested here. I think that they, uh, and it's just a, it's a fun thing we talk about it, but I think they really have the incredible chance for saving lives. And obviously we don't want to be guinea pigs, but as I think you eloquently stated, we want to make sure that, that as they're, they're, this industry is growing, that it's, it's growing with LA in mind because it's going to be a game changer for, for LA and, and hopefully a life saver. Um, so put that out there and, um, oh, very minor thing or a very narrow thing. The, the orange line uh, by, in my district, as you know, has gotten certain complaints. The blue book states there's 617,000 in funding being provided for, uh, for the local transportation fund and there's 613,000 being deleted from the Prop C fund. But I don't see an, uh, a line item in the local transportation fund. So for my peace of mind, I just want to know for sure that I know there's add additions and subtractions, but I want to know that at the end of the day that the, the money is there. Can I get that assurance? Or, can, or uh, I can do it as a report back if you don't have it right now. Yeah, the 617000 that was taken out of Prop C was put into the local transportation fund. It's called um, Bike Path Maintenance and Refurbishment. And I'm sorry, what was the other? Um, 
So the, the 613 is being deleted from the Prop C fund. It, it seems like there's, there's money coming and going. So the, the 613 that was deleted from the Prop C is now put into the local transportation fund. Okay, so it is there. Yes. Okay. Was there a second item? No, no, it was okay. the same, same item, just confusing in the way that the... Uh, we, had a, we had a funding uh, swap change there, so... Okay. Okay, great. Then I don't need to ask for a report about that. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Blumenfield. And, and we actually agree on autonomous vehicles. I'm not a complete Luddite. I just, you know, I don't want them working out the bugs on Ventura Boulevard. That's all. <laughs> uh, I do have a couple more uh, report reports back at Mr. Englander's request. Um, uh, he'd like to report back on the department's requests to restore a million dollars to the general fund salary account to maintain parking enforcement and traffic control services. He'd like a report back on the department's request to restore $300,000 in the general fund overtime account and $700,000 in the expense account to maintain sufficient funding for special events and emergency or on-call field operations, including whether or not this funding is refundable from other sources. And he'd like a report back on the availability of Measure M funding in the current year for projects related to CSUN, including the operation of DASH service aligned with student schedules and the relocation of the Northridge Station to Reseda Boulevard. Um, anything else, members, uh, for the Department of Transportation? Ms. Reynolds, thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you. And thank you for your very thorough discussion on all these issues. We appreciate it very much. And thanks to your whole team as well. Um, so, members, that puts us now 25 minutes behind schedule, which is not too bad, but I would just suggest that if we're going to finish before the street closures and so on, we're not going to be able to take any breaks. We're just going to plow through. And we might have to defer a department or two. So Mr. Hale will be working that out as we go. But um, go ahead and uh, start making preparations for your lunch as well. OK, that brings up the city clerk. Ms. Walcott, welcome. Good morning. Happy May Day, everybody. My name is Holly Walcott, and I am the city clerk for the city of Los Angeles. With me today, I have my executive officer, Administrative Services Chief Petty Santos, Ruben Viramontes with our fiscal section, and also Ginny Pack with our election division. The first announcement I would like to make and remind everybody is that May 1st is the last day to register to vote for the May 16th runoff election. And that brings us to the core of what I want to talk to you today about. But I do first want to take this opportunity to thank the mayor and his staff, the CLA and his staff, you and all of your staffs, and of course, the CLA. I said CLA and CAO. I want to make sure I catch them both. I am very proud to be here today because I represent an excellent group of people. And I would love to take credit for all they do, but I think my claim to fame is removing obstacles and staying out of their way. In addition to providing administrative and HR support for 500 mayor's office and council employees, as well as the office of the CLA, Health Commission, and Dunn, we created over 1,100 council files and almost 200 ordinances and processed over 400 contracts this year alone. The mayor has signed 869 council actions using our new electronic signature program, saving approximately 434 staff hours to date. We implemented the electronic speaker card system for city council this year. The existing 43 business improvement districts have generated more than $65 million in assessments. We have created the online digital archive vault housing historic videos, photographs, and city council minutes dating back to 1850. Just this year, we have scanned and added another 12,000 council files to CFMS from 2000 to 2004. Our system staff has created the online funding portal for the neighborhood council system to easily track and manage their budget allocations. And our impressive election stats included the res registration of almost 6,000 new voters to date, of approximately 160 are from homeless communities, 1,300 are LA high school students, and over 1,200 came from the LA community college districts. I mean, LA Community Colleges. We are sub, um, supportive of the mayor's budget, and we understand that our one-time salary reduction is our part in um, the city's financial constraint. It will require us to leave four, four positions um, vacant, but we are happy to um, work with the mayor's office within these constraints. What I'd 
I'm talking very fast to try and save as much time as I can. Um, what I really wanted to talk today about is about election outreach. Um, we had gone out this year and we, have, we went to 18 LAUSD schools, four elementary, four middle and 10 high schools, and we conducted mock elections on subjects that were important to them, whether it be school uniforms, school lunches, things like that. We coordinated an annual national voter registration reaching over 6,000 individuals and registering 1,100 voters. We held community events and presentations in monolingual communities, increased in outreach presence in low voter propensity areas, conducted a survey to identify key language challenges to voting and key areas for concentrated voter approach. We secured partnerships with 19 media organizations, print, radio, television, and online to assist in promoting election day in almost 13 languages, and we expanded outreach to the LA Community College District. We see outreach as an ongoing um, endeavor. We are an important link in the transparency and outreach in all we do, whether it be council and public services or administrative services, but in our election, this has to be an ongoing approach. Um, this budget hearing and what you all do is a key example of what we need our citizens to participate in, to know that, um, that while it's sexier to vote in presidential elections, the decisions that you make on the local level is how the money is spent in your community, and that is the message that we are trying to get out. So by going to the middle schools and to the high schools and to the elementary schools, we provide a civic piece that's, that's been missing in our schools for, for quite a while. And, and going into our homeless communities and, and going in and just saying we're there. And so my vision for the future is we trans, as we move beyond administering elections, although we'll still have a certain part of the uh, municipal elections that we will um, conduct, is to provide a, an important link from the community to City Hall, making sure that our services and the information that we provide is an important gateway working alongside other departments and 311 to say, hey, we're here, we want to help you connect with City Hall. And that's why we have asked for the um, extra outreach money um, for this year and as an ongoing project and not just during election years. Um, I think that's all I have. We did also request if, if we're going to go for, forward with um, online voting for neighborhood council that we would need the 95000 for the pop-up polls that are an important part of that project. But that whether or not you opt to do the electronic um, voting for neighborhood councils is a policy decision. We're, we're supportive of the idea of it um, because it expands um, expounds the amount of time that people have to vote. But we understand that there were issues the last uh, go around. We are working very closely with the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment and the uh, vendor to um, close whatever gaps we have. But my personal vision for neighborhood council um, elections on election day is to have paper at the polls. To have paper ballots at the polls. Great. Uh, thank you very much. I just had one brief question. Uh, first of all, I applaud, obviously, your efforts to try to reach out and uh, engage people, especially young people, and get them more civically involved. One of the important steps that we've taken in the city over the last three or four years is to significantly expand uh, the uh, non-English language uh, voter materials and outreach, and we have more languages uh, materials in more languages available than is required by federal law, and, and I think that's something we should be proud of. Um, I just wonder, in addition to the materials, uh, is your office able to handle uh, special requests, um, phone calls, questions in, in those other languages as well, Has, or have you seen that to be a problem area? Currently, during an election year, we have voter outreach specialists in each one of the 12 languages. Okay. And then we recruit, and of course, we recruit poll workers in those languages. But in non-election years, we would not have the luxury to have all 12 sure. um, on staff. Obviously, we would have Spanish speakers on staff um, primarily. And we have, um, I think, some Tagalog, uh, Ginny or other others. 
So right now we have one Korean. And a Korean. Okay. Okay. It's, I think, election years when that demand is the, mo is the greatest. So, okay. Thank you. Ms. Martinez. Yeah. Do you have an estimation of how many people you will actually serve um, with your budget request under edu outreach and education? How many people do you estimate in serving or reaching out to? I think we'd have to report back, or unless Jenny knows off the top of her head. Approximately about 18,000 people. Okay. And do you have any idea what role your office uh, will take in the cannabis regulation? Do you know if you're going to get, if you're going to loan any a position to this new department? My understanding is that we will be doing the administrative work similar that we do for the Office of Public Accountability, also for the Health Commission, and for the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment, where we're just doing payroll and accounts payable. But any further questions, I'd have to bounce to the CAO. That's the same kind of service. Okay, so then the, that would be a permanent position Correct. or service that you're going to be providing for the new department? Okay. Correct. Correct. Thanks. That's all I have. Thank you. Mr. Blumenfield. Uh, first, appreciate all the great work that you do. And uh, neighborhood council question on the elections. Does the, now that the city is changing its elections, the uh, city council elections, did the neighborhood council elections change? Because they used to be on the opposite year. Out to the um, neighborhood council alliances meeting earlier this year, we t we took our show on the road, and and one of the th we covered several things. We covered um, the budget, you know, the city the city clerk taking over the neighborhood council budgets um, funding program, and also we talked to them about first of all, you know, the next round of elections and what they'd like to see, but we also made mention that in 2020, um, <coughs> our candidate filing for municipal elections will be in direct conflict with the neighborhood council elections and we don't think we can handle both workloads at the same time so that put an interesting question in front of the neighborhood councils that i believe um, gracie is currently polling them is that do you move it now do you extend the term to 2019 so we conduct those elections in 2019 or do you do it in 2021 Right. I mean, do you move it? Do you change? Right. Do you change? Do you change the, but yes, the answer to your question is yes. We should. We we eventually need to move it to the to the odd year. And is there is there a budget implication? For this year, my recommendation would be if you were to move it to twenty um, nineteen, the existing funds that are in our budget, my recommendation would be to use part of it to build out the the rest of the neighborhood councils for the everyone counts online because only 50 have been voted I mean we've only built out um, 50 of the 96 or 98 now I think or there will be 98 um, and we would use the other funds for the for the outreach um, but other than that there would there would be a, a fiscal impact next year because we would need the neighborhood council funds for next year right you need them for if we if we move the election next year, then that, that frees up this chunk of money, or how much, how much are we talking about? To, it frees up a chunk of money, whatever it is. Right, it's for, six, uh, in the neighborhood of 600,000. Right, and that's what I'm saying. We, I would request that part of it go toward the outreach that I am requesting, and then the other part go to build out the remaining everyone counts and then, then the following year, we'd have to have another 600000 for Correct. For the elections. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bond? Uh, all my questions have been asked and answered. Great. Thank you. Um, Mr. Englander wanted to re at, request a couple of reports. First, report, uh, report back on the department's requests, as we've mentioned, to increase uh, NC online early voting pop up poll sites by 95000 and for an additional 225000 for voter outreach. Um, and a report back on what support services the clerk's office will be providing with the budgeted management analyst for cannabis regulation um, and whether or not that's to support the commission. And I would just add on the um, report back regarding neighborhood council online early voting. 
uh, it could be a special study, uh, but I would also like to have um, the clerk and the CLA report back on what best practices there are uh, that we can learn from with regard to uh, online voting in other similar um, elections to our neighborhood councils, dealing with issues like registration, data security, um, the fact that eligible voters are not tied to particular res uh, residential addresses, um, all of those problems uh, or challenges that we have, if you can provide us with your expertise and insights about what best practices you've seen, um, that would be a great help. All right, anything else for the clerk? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate your patience. And that will bring up next convention and tourism. Mr. Liu, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for submitting your letter. Go ahead and open up and we'll get right into questions. Thank you, Councilman and Committee. I appreciate this opportunity to uh, present my very first budget. Um, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the CAO and CLA and the Mayor's Office for their help in preparing everything before I, I started my job. So um, I'm here uh, joined by uh, our very able uh, AGMs, Diana Mangioglu and Tom Fields. Um, and uh, don't have a whole lot of highlights for you. Um, we've uh, managed to keep our budget exactly as it was last year. Um, uh, we submitted a zero-sum operating budget. Um, some of the highlights, uh, uh, thanks to our partners at the uh, AEG Facilities Group, which manages uh, the Convention Center for us, and the uh, Los Angeles Tourism and Convention Bureau. Um, we were able to uh, add uh, $1 million in reimbursement uh, to the general fund for related costs uh, for the very first time. Uh, of that amount. Actually, this current fiscal year, we are also contributing $850,000 to the general fund for related costs. Um, we're also able to do about $1.6 million in uh, MICLA issued funds for six capital improvement projects for the year. Um, and that's in addition to about a million three in approved capital uh, improvement projects, uh, which are funded out of our operating revenues. Um, this is the department's fourth fiscal year, uh, which uh, first came effect in 2013-14. Um, and uh, I think we've done a pretty good job of uh, progressing as a P3. Um, this last year we were very successful uh, with over $28 million in revenue, um, which was, gave us the ability to do some of the capital improvement projects and um, also add to a reserve, which we feel is necessary for some potential upcoming uh, uh, revenue slowdowns, if you will, if uh, we're successful in, in moving forward with the uh, expansion of the convention center. It could mean a loss of business temporarily. Um, and also, if we win the Olympic Games for 2024, uh, could also have the same impact. Um, I'll leave my comments at that, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, very good. Ms. Martinez? Uh, thank you. Um, according to your budget letter, Anaheim, San Diego, and San Francisco are all working or completing their convention renovations. Do we have any idea um, when they'll be done with their um, Will you completion? have to get back to you on that? I know that San Diego is before the voters. Um, oh, so that hasn't begun yet? You know, the and the reason day. I ask so, is what kind of a, what kind of impact is this going to have on on um, attracting conventions to our city once these three major cities complete their renovations? 
So San Francisco, I believe, just completed their renovation recently. Um, San Diego is stalled in the sense that they, they're still trying to uh, get a, a measure passed um, that would help fund or finance the, the expansion itself. And I believe Anaheim expanded, will be expanding or uh, entering construction later this year. Um, in terms of how it's going to impact us, I mean, we're already uh, not number one on that list, uh, given that we lack hotel rooms within the surrounding area. Um, uh, so it will, and as, our, as these convention centers enter into construction, all the other convention centers like ourselves take the opportunity to take business away from them. But as soon as their new building opens up, obviously it creates opportunity for more space, um, space that's more um, liked by clients. Uh, so in terms of, it, it will have a, an impact. Okay. I, I can't tell you exactly financially how much, but. But I'm sure we're tracking that, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, I just noticed that Hotel Indigo just opened. I think it has 350 rooms. Uh, walking distance from the convention. Do we have other hotels that plan to open in the near future within walking distance from the convention? Uh, yes. Um, I'll be happy to distribute at a later point a map that we've recently put together. How many more rooms are expected to uh, We're currently open at about 3,000 rooms within three quarters of a mile. Uh, there's another thousand or so that are planned. Uh, uh, including the um, W and uh, Park Hyatt, um, both across the street from Staples Center on the Figueroa side. Um, and then there's another 3,000 that are in various stages of, of planning or what we call opportunity sites. Mm -hmm. So there is a bit, and the ability to get to the 8,000 hotel rooms that the mayor has set as a goal, um, there's actually the possibility of going as, as high as 10,000. Mm -hmm. So do you anticipate this driving convention planners back to Los Angeles or is this just a drop in the bucket in comparison, of what, um, in comparison to what we really need to attract major conventions to our city? 8,000 is, uh, is, is the goal. Um, it would do a lot to help our convention business, but uh, relatively speaking, uh, San Francisco has 21,000 hotel rooms within three quarters mile of its convention center. Um, so uh, doub doubling ours would certainly help a lot, but we're still always gonna be uh, uh, behind San Francisco and even Anaheim. Mr. Price submitted a motion back in November in council to approve that a motion that we discuss with AG a possible uh, proposal to expand in the convention center. Is that still in the process? Do you know if we're moving forward with those options? Uh, yes, under the leadership of our CLA, uh, we are actively negotiating uh, 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 an MOU uh, with AEG. Um, I've been told that uh, the progress has been uh, uh, encouraging, and we hope uh, to have some sort of resolution shortly. Okay, that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Bloomfield. Thank you, and you know, great work in your first couple of days on the job. <laughs> no, first couple of weeks. You've been, uh, and we all have great and high expectations for you. Uh, one thing I didn't understand in the proposal is the reserve fund. Um, help me understand what that's, how that works, um, where the money comes from for it, what it's, it, what it's used for. It's obviously unique. Most departments. So. Um, Thank you for the question. It is unique. Um, what you should know is that our department is, as small as it is, it is self-funding. So the revenues come from uh, mostly the uh, uh, revenues that the convention center gets. So we're projecting about 28, 29 million for this mm -hmm. current budget year. Um, the expenses run around 20, 20. One million. So that difference, um, which was eight million last year, um, uh, is money that comes that that goes to the the uh, fund, the mm -hmm. LA Convention mm -hmm. Center fund. And so out of that, I don't want to say profit, but the the difference between the revenue and expenses, we're able to uh, 
uh, make capital improvements. Um, that's, I think, our first goal is uh, some of the deferred maintenance projects. Um, for the first time, we were able to contribute to the um, general fund mm -hmm. in, in related costs. Um, it also gave us the ability to, to add some money to our reserve fund. Um, the contract with the AEG requires uh, them to maintain a 10% reserve fund, 10% of the operating expenses at all times. Um, we're able to get that all the way up to 40% now, uh, which, as I said, is important to us because of the potential loss of business that could occur if we expand the convention center uh, and or win the Olympic Games. Do you have anything to add, Deanna? Um, so it is fully funded with convention center operating revenues. And um, the, the point in even creating the reserve fund when we did the management agreement was some kind of assurance to give us that buffer so we'd not rely on general fund in case any year we had some kind of revenue shortfall. But as we've as it's the fourth year now, and as there's the reality that if we do, uh, if we are successful in winning the 2024 Olympics, for example, our building will be shut down for six months. On top of that, um, which will have not just impact one year, but it would impact potentially one or two additional fiscal years to follow. And if we have an, if we undergo expansion, just like other convention centers that are undergoing expansion, we try to steal clients away from them. They will take advantage of that same opportunity. Some of these clients are clients that we, they're repeat clients, so again, it, it wouldn't just impact one year, but possibly several years. And so, you know, even though we're at a point where we're now 40% of our operating budget, that money could go in one year very easily. Sure. And so it's just been something we've been building but up. But for example, like with the Olympics, if, if, if we're lucky enough to get the Olympics, which I hope we do, um, that downtime cost, my hope, would be borne by, by the uh, LA24, by the Olympic initiative overall. Wouldn't yes, Councilman, right. we should add, and I neglected to mention, that uh, LA24 is paying a very uh, high price and, and, and market rent for the time that they'll be using uh, the convention center. Um, the, the potential uh, that we're trying to protect against is the loss of business um, for multi-year shows, for instance. So uh, a lot of times um, our partners at LATCB will bid on uh, a multi-year uh, uh, convention. Um, we might lose some of that ability because they won't be, our center wouldn't be available for them in 2024, and so they may look to other cities for a multi-year contract. It's just a little bit of a buffer. Um, Please be. Please know that the LA twenty four. No, I, I, I is do. I just, it's just sort of the. the con, I'm trying to get the concept behind how the reserve fund. And it makes sense to me to have a reserve fund. Do we have a guiding policy in terms of, you know, how how that fund operates in terms of the percentage and and those kinds of things, or is it is it more of an art than a science? I think the guiding pi policy is in the con uh, operating agreement with AEG, and it requires a minimum of ten percent right. of the uh, operating expense. So it gives us a 10% window. Uh, that they put in, the 10%. It comes out of the operating revenues, yes. Okay. But we're moving it up to 40%. It's currently at 40%, so we've been very successful in, in keeping that. And we, we think that, uh, practically speaking, it's prudent for us to have it that high this time. And in the meantime, what we do do is, to the extent possible, we try and pay for as much capital improvement projects from the money that we the profit that we make. Um, we, also, um, we also have paid for settlement agreements um, mm -hmm. that, uh, have, impact, that um, have impacted our building. So instead of having general fund pay for it, we're paying for it from convention center revenue. So it's everything after all those expenses are said and done, it's whatever is remaining. I guess in the future, and it's not so much, but I'd love to see the policy because there is a there is a tension a little bit in terms of general fund versus the reserve fund and how that how that works and, and there's there's a decision that's made as you increase the percentage that that is beneficial for the convention effort but it all it it has a marginal detriment to the general fund effort if we could sure. have been putting that money in so yeah I guess I, maybe down the road we'll do a special study or I'll ask for a special study about about how that how that um, 
reserve fund is, the, you know, the policy behind the reserve fund and how that's, how that's maintained, but it's not a rush on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bonney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a couple questions, Don. The um, Blue Book indicates that the final debt service payment will be in 2223. Um, will that be the end of all outstanding uh, debt or obligations to the general fund? For yes, it, it will be. For um, the the large that debt is related to. Um, how the city financed the building itself. Mm -hmm. And so after that debt's paid off, there will be no other cost associated with debt service other than um, future projects. Um, the A and I or the um, commercial paper program that we have. Okay. Um, when we did budget deliberations a few years ago, I think it was three years ago, um, we were told that the convention center had deteriorated to such an extent that it was difficult to attract new conventions and that we were even at risk of uh, losing some of the most important why uh, important citywide clients such as e3 um, how have things improved and have we moved past that risk so um, as we were talking about the uh, uh, surplus that we've been able to manage um, uh, with that money we've been able to add I don't know if this is right, 30 million in CIP over the last? Uh, so overall, in the last couple of years since AEG has been managing the building, there's been 30 million that's, that has been invested. It's a mixture of both MICLA and cash finance projects back into the building. And this is after, since the 90s, the building hadn't received sure. any chunk of money really for any major repairs. So um, in the last, four years, there's been approximately 30 million that's gone back into the building. Okay. Uh, and so where does, I mean, we had this, this big scare a few years ago that it was so bad that we were risking losing clients. We feel like we've moved past that? I don't believe so. We've, uh, you know, be, due to the, our great relationship with LATCB, we had over 300 events last mm -hmm. year. Um, there was someone in our building over 350 days last year. Um, uh, we've, we've been very successful. I think uh, we've been prudent about how we spend this capital improvement money. We're, you know, doing the cosmetic work that's needed, bathrooms and, and carpeting and uh, things that haven't been touched since 1990. So um, we feel that our, our building is up to standard to attract uh, 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 the type of conventions that uh, TCB has been able to get for us. Great, and as we're doing improvements and capital work, uh, are we doing anything to um, uh, enhance sustainability or environmentally friendly features? And we're very proud to, to uh, have received LEED gold status, um, and it was renewed this past year. Um, mm -hmm. We were also host to the, uh, the building, Green Building uh, uh, Convention, and so that uh, uh, I think forced the department to really look at itself and make sure that if we were going to host the Green Building uh, National Convention that we were uh, up to standard, and uh, uh, I think some good ideas came out of uh, the preparation for the convention as well. But yes, we are uh, uh, one of the leaders in sustainability uh, among all convention centers. Excellent. Great to hear that. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Mangioglu, you've explained this to me multiple times and I still am unclear a little bit. Um, there have been restrictions on the ability to um, <coughs> maximize the income from things like naming rights and advertising and stuff like that because of the bonds. Is that, is that right? And so once, once that's paid off, we will have the opportunity to maximize those, those revenues? Well, in the last two years, and, and uh, Natalie could probably speak better to this, but in the last two years, the city refinanced its its bonds from tax exempt to taxable. Okay. So now we don't have those same private use restrictions we used to have. Okay. So even without, even prior to paying off uh, the debt, that would be an option that would be available to the right to the agency. Uh, okay. Correct. Natalie Real Sales Office. One of the things that we did in two thousand and. 15, 15. 15 yeah. was refunded all the tax exempt debt into taxable to give 
um, AG and the department the ability to look at those types of issues and be able to raise additional revenue okay. without the restriction. So that's why we did it. Terrific. And um, Mr. Liu, I think you've already clarified this, thank you, uh, but on the Olympics, um, I get why that would have an impact beyond the actual time frame of the Olympics itself, but um, is it the case that at least during the Olympics, when, the, when LA24 is utilizing the facility, that their reimbursement, their payment, rental, yes. however we're characterizing it, um, would be comparable to what the revenues for the convention center yes, would absolutely. be? Absolutely. If it were a convention. Yes. Okay. Yes. Very good. Yeah. Council Member, one just brief point on that as well. While it is true that the convention center at very significant market rate, because you've insisted on that, will be rented by LA24 for a period, and it could affect rentals before or after, it also could enhance if the convention center is on TV every day and becomes a sort of a glamour spot. Um, so it is actually, try to predict the long range impact sure. of the Olympics on a facility is hard to say. Sure. But the day to day rent, your council has demanded that it pay every dollar. Sure, and uh, by the way, I should note that you also mentioned on the reserve fund the need to anticipate potential impacts that would come from um, uh, construction projects uh, there. And thank you, because we've been having this discussion with the convention center for as long as I've been on this committee, um, and we've never quite gotten the convention center to acknowledge that, yeah, if you start building there, it's going to affect your ability to attract uh, conventions. And they've always kind of said, well, we'll manage it somehow. But so thank you, uh, because that is obviously a concern. Doesn't mean it's a, something we shouldn't do. We should go full speed ahead with having a modern convention center to attract uh, the citywide conventions. But eyes wide open, it will have an impact in the short term as well. So um, it's good to prepare for that. And I appreciate um, your report back in regard to Mr. Blumenfield's request about the reserve fund. But I, I think it is important to anticipate that as well. Um, okay, thank you very much. Anything else, members? Thank you very much. And thank you very much. Welcome to the, welcome to the budget process, Mr. Lewis. So All right, uh, that brings up next, uh, general services. Mr. Oyster, welcome, sorry. Thank you. Sorry, and thank okay. you, uh, thank you for your um, letter. We appreciate it. Um, feel free to go ahead and open up, and then we'll jump right into questions. Well, I can take this opportunity to thank the mayor, the council, the CAO, and the CLA for their assistance in developing this budget. I'd also like to thank the uh, employees of the Department of General Services for their many years of dedicated services. Also, a special thank you to my executive staff, to David, to Debbie, to uh, Angela, and also to Val, who's at the table with me. And also to thank all the division heads who are behind with us that help us get the work done on each day. And also I'd like to um, thank the, uh, the, the committee and also the, the, the mayor and the, and the CAO for funding the, the next year's programs as included in the budget. There are two minor adjustments that we've asked for in our letter that would not impact the general fund, and I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, before we begin, I just want to say um, that, you know, as we've gone through the cutbacks, um, it's fallen on your shoulders to keep things running uh, with significantly diminished resources, and, you know, this is one of those departments that never seems to get a room full of advocates to come and argue for, um, and uh, it, I 
think if people understood how much you touch in this city and how much is dependent upon uh, the work that you do, we probably would. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that it isn't always the people who can organize the troops to come out and, and advocate on behalf of a department that defines its importance. And so uh, I just want to say thank you uh, for the work that you've done during some very, very difficult years to keep things going smoothly. Um, so we will start with Mr. Blumenfield. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rester, for all the great work. Thank you. Um, always appreciate working with you on a variety of issues. A um, couple questions. Your letter mentions a continuation of the energy audit and retrofit program. And the program indicates an energy savings of 3.2 million kilowatt hours from 2016 to 2017, mm -hmm. plus 6.3 million annually from prior projects. So what does that yield us in actual cost savings? Because it sounds like something to be touted. In estimate, I think we'll be probably end up paying about 14 cents a kilowatt. So you're probably looking at about $480,000 a year that you're saving in that program for, for this particular year. Uh, another question, we, we talk a lot about for, with the other departments about that are special funded, um, making sure that we get full cost recovery. Um, we're spent, we, the budget indicates an increase in 382000 in custodial services for the library. Yes. Um, which will be reimbursed. Are we doing everything else in terms of all the other special funded departments to, to get that reimbursement for you? I know we get re reimbursements from like the Department of uh, Sanitation, any work that we do from them, any department I think is associated with special funds, we get as, as many reimbursements that we can. But especially we know with uh, the library department. We have a, in, in our previous conversations, we had a couple of uh, report backs on, on this issue of, of reimbursement overall. So I'm, I'm sure you'll be part sure. of that, that question. Uh, budget includes additional funding for payment services group uh, in part to ensure that city captures early payment discounts. How much are we saving by taking advantage of the early payment discounts? I think it's probably between like a million two, a million and a half a year that we get in uh, early discounts. And we want to make sure that we have enough staff to supervise our employees there to make sure that we're covering those uh, early discounts on an annual basis. Great. That's an important metric. Now. In that particular group, you know, I think our in, uh, we pay on the average to our vendors probably between 23 to 25 days to get them paid. And that's really important to make sure they get paid on time because the vendors play a very important part in making sure that the city get the services that, that they need. Uh, you notice also the budget has a petroleum account reduction of 1.5 million. Yes. Is that, is that based on the prediction of the, the price of oil or is it based on our conservation or what, what, how do we get to that, that Nice number. I'm not sure how they, they arrived at that number. It was a million and a half. And on, on the average, I think we are, when it comes to fuel, we're probably spending probably this fiscal year probably between 35, 36 million. And I think in, in anticipation of some of the lo low uh, petroleum prices, if we encountered this year, that they felt very, very comfortable in uh, taking the one and a half million. But however, as you know, as it relates to petroleum, it's very, very volatile commodities. So we report back every FSR to let you know if the prices have gone up and down or whatever. But this past year, uh, with the low uh, prices, uh, we've you know, done pretty well when it comes to fuel prices compared to five, six, seven years ago, where we were going between 46 to 50 million that we're spending. Because we consume about 16 million gallons of fuel a year and about probably five or six departments consume 96% of that fuel. Will we be impacted by SB1, the new state Yes, fuel tax? we anticipate that when it begins, probably the, the first eight months, it'll probably be about a, about a million in full implementation of the program, about a million and a half dollars will cost us in uh, additional, probably about additional 20 cent per gallon for diesel, another 12% for the uh, unleaded uh, fuel that we purchase. But that, that additional cost has already been baked into the $1.5 million savings. Well, based on our projection, we feel you know, somewhat comfortable right now that we can uh, um, live within our means. But with the prices, that they might go up, not based on what's happening in California. Sure. You just never know. No, we, 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 we don't have the luxury of setting uh, our, our gas prices here in California. No, we don't. <laughs> um, 
So appreciate it, and you always manage these things well, and, and you've got a lot of complicated variables, some of which you have no control over, right. uh, to manage as, as you put it all together. Um, one concern I have, that, uh, we're putting drought tolerant landscaping in a lot of places. Yes. Uh, and which is fabulous and I'm a big advocate of. And in fact, we did it in the West Valley Municipal Building and appreciate your, your help on that. But the, the problem I'm running into is that we don't, we don't really have, um, as I understand, we don't have the, the service for that. So for example, in my office, we don't have, normally GSD would pay for the, the trimming of the, of the lawns, but since we switched to drought tolerant, um, I've ended up having to, to pay for that directly out of my oh, yeah. office budget to pay for, for the LA, LA uh, Conservation Corps to come right. keep that neat and clean every once in a while, which is still probably cheaper than what it used to be. Correct. But um, what are we going to do about that in terms of building our capacity to maintain our drought tolerant landscapes and, and how does that impact your overall you know, workforce and budget? Because when it really comes to landscaping, that's really not our core. But what we need to do is probably set down the recreation and parks and put t together a plan to address this when it relates to municipal facilities. Because I, sometime our understanding is that you know, we assist with that, but the continuing maintenance of that is maybe a, uh, an option the recreation and parks can assist or we figure out a way to deal with it. Uh, because hopefully with you no know, drought tolerant uh, um, landscaping, there's less uh, exactly. staff needed and some, we need to sit down with them and come back with a, a plan to address that based when we make those, those changes, how it's going to be maintained. That sounds, I mean, it's a narrow issue in some respects, although I imagine a lot of other uh, potential buildings that are going to go yes. drought tolerant uh, are not going to be as, as excited about it as I am and, yeah. and, and go ahead and put money toward right. the landscaping when they right. didn't have to do that before. And if you wait too long with that, it's make, make it make it more complicated to deal with, with the different challenges you may have. Yeah. Then we'll get a, st uh, a report back, okay. a special study with, with you and Rec and Parks of how we're going to handle sure. uh, that situation going on in the future. Be glad to. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bonnet? Chairman, uh, good afternoon. Er, yes, good afternoon. <laughs> it's just you. past noon. Um, I'm going to make a request for a report back from sure. uh, Mr. Weezer, uh, who wanted a report back on, um, I guess this would include the CAO, on uh, the potential of identifying $528,000 for the uh, uh, police museum. Okay, be glad to. Then a uh, couple quick questions uh, from me. Uh, I see in here that GSD is requesting uh, regular position authority without funding for a helicopter mechanic to support LAPD helicopter operations. Yes. Uh, I was not in budget and finance when this particular helicopter was discussed, but I understand it's a bit of a controversial helicopter and folks were not particularly thrilled that LAPD got it instead of having it sold. So. Um, I'm curious why GSD has to take the hit for the cost of this as opposed to LAPD. Oh, we'll be very, very happy to take funding from any, no, any pot you might have. <laughs> <laughs> but my major concern was about uh, safety, make sure that this equipment is, is maintained and then we can figure out the, the funding wherever. But the number one thing is make sure we have staff there to maintain it. But like I said, we'll be more than happy to uh, accept funding from any source that you may have. Okay, so I'll report back on the uh, creating the position authority uh, and the potential for LAPD to help fund it. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then um, just a final question. How is the department currently engaged uh, in evaluating or uh, using uh, city-owned properties for uh, uh, projects, programs for, to address homelessness? We're working very, very closely with the CAO's office and um, to determine exactly what's the best location. And our major responsibility is really involved in having appraisals or whatever. For like last year, we were giving, I think, $100,000 for appraisals. I think we got completed 18. And we spent close to probably 124000 versus 100000 And I think 100000 is in this budget. So. We work very closely with them and take direction exactly what areas they've identified and, and move forward with them as a team. 
Do you have sufficient resources in this year's budget to get done what you need? As far as I know right now, we do. Okay. Okay. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, much. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. A um, couple of report mm -hmm. requests from Mr. Englander who is on the helicopter issue. He'd like a report back on um, adding a regular position authority for the helicopter mechanic without funding to support PD and fire department helicopter operations. Uh, he'd like a report on the deletion of one plumber and the addition of one plumber supervisor to oversee jet fuel site and alternative fuel site maintenance programs with no additional funding. He'd like a report on general funding for the pavement preservation program, uh, which has been reduced, and specifically whether there's an expected backfill from Measure M or SB1 or any additional sure. uh, new revenue source. And he'd like a report back on adding funding for the implementation of city council office security in both city hall and field offices. Sure. Um, and then the one general question I'd have for you is um, one of the one of the vulnerabilities that your de department has faced uh, with the decline in staffing is that you have a number of people in pretty critical positions who are quite senior and um, uh, approaching retirement or eligible for retirement and I'd like to I'd like your general comments on succession planning and and how you're doing in terms of ensuring that we don't have sure. a lapse in critical services because sure. of retirement as you know probably for GST probably 52 percent of the staff is eligible for retirement and what we've done is is that we have developed specialized training we have a program we call Lee program and we bring in new supervisors and employees. And what we do, we bring in some of our, our senior uh, um, supervisors, our senior managers, even I teach a class, to pass on that institutional knowledge along to those individuals so when we're not here, they understand what's happening. And also we have a special program we call, um, uh, it's a uh, um, MAP program that specializes in um, in metrics, whatever, it's a three-day intense program that we send the majority of our division heads and assistant division heads in, so everybody from the top down is thinking the same way. Another thing that we do, we ask our division heads to identify assistant division heads too deep to make sure if something happens or whatever, someone is there to, uh, to make sure the work is get done. And also we work with the personnel department and look at some of those very critical uh, positions or classifications that we have and we're looking, they have uh, made the effort to make a lot of those exams continuous so you don't have to wait a long time to, to get those names. And also what we're looking at, uh, some of the positions that are difficult to recruit is to go to open and promotional so we can, you know, bring in from the private sector for some of those particular classifications. And also we have, we bring some of the individuals who have been for a while for, for a short amount of time on 120 day authority so they can help train the new people that are here on staff. So that's what our plan to address that issue. Great, and um, I would just, if you haven't already uh, been, uh, well, let me take that back. Tell me a little bit about how your department has been uh, participating in the targeted local hiring program. Oh, I've been working with the personnel department to targeting certain classifications like in our custodial group and also with our uh, fleet group with like garage assistants to bring these individuals, individuals in in some of these entry level positions to prepare them for that particular um, classifications. And a lot of individuals we re recruit anyway fit into that category, especially in our custodial group. Um, the sooner we get that going, the better I'm going to like it, and I think my colleagues as well. So I just urge you to continue to be aggressive sure. in finding those, those positions uh, for, for which uh, that program is applicable. Um, thank you again very much. Thank you for your uh, service, and thank you for your time here today. Thank you, sir. And that brings up uh, next ITA. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Royster. No, no, I, m my oversight. I'm so sorry. Ms. Martinez, I got you out there too quick. That's okay. Uh, I had forgotten to call on Ms. Martinez. Thank you, sir. Um, 
I know there's a safety and security working group made up of various um, city departments um, looking at what types of improvements we need to make to keep our employees secure. Yes, ma'am. However, I don't see a line item for security enhancements um, at our city facilities. Mm -hmm. um, so can you tell me what the departments expect to spend on building security? I think as far as I know, I think it's probably nothing is there. It's probably in the budget at this time. What we can do is put a package together for you and report back. So you haven't identified any money to security enhancements at any of our city facilities? So I want to make sure I'm clear about this because I know uh, members of the council have made an issue about this. I know that you had an incident, Mr. Bonin, is that correct? As, as far ago. as I can remember, I know and this. There, I was under the impression we're working towards some sort of security enhancement package, yeah. not only at City Hall, but our city facilities and possibly some of our lease facilities where we okay. have staff. So I just want to know where we're going in that direction. Sure. And so I know some money had been identified for this past fiscal year, and we're working on that at, at right now. A number of the council offices, we've already um, implemented some of the different measures or whatever that have been recommended. Uh, um, for the particular offices, but I don't have any information right now exactly what is in the budget at this time for 17, 18, but I can report back and locate the information and get back yeah, to you. I think you got started on some offices, but I don't believe you've completely done No, we that. have not. But I'm, but I'm referring to just our city, what, what, is our, what is our security plan here to ensure that our employees are safe? When it comes to security plan, what usually we're working together, have a group, I think we're working with the... the, the um, Do you want to bring something back to me? Sure, I can bring something back Thank to you. you. That's all. Is that it? All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Anything else for general services? I apologize again. Thank you, Mr. Royster. Um, and that will now bring up ITA. And as ITA is working their way up, um, just to give members and the departments a little bit of a heads up, um, we're going to change up our order a little bit today. Uh, and after ITA, we're going to go to the presentation by the Neighborhood Council Budget Advocates, um, in part because there's going to be a crowd forming outside in a little while with amplified music, and it may get difficult for us to complete our work, um, so I'd rather be able to hear from them and then rearrange departments as necessary um, for uh, tomorrow. So, Mr. Ross, welcome. Excellent. And thank, thank you. you for your letter. Um, go right ahead and make some introductory comments before we get into questions. Absolutely. I'd like to introduce uh, who's here with me, Laura Ito, our Director of Finance and Administration, Joyce Edson, our Assistant General Manager over Applications, Gene Holm, our Assistant General Manager over Customer Engagement, and Greg Steinmel, our Acting Assistant General Manager over Infrastructure. Uh, in a city with 4 million residents across 469 square miles, technology has become the predominant tool for Los Angeles to maximize department resources, deliver effective city services, and create a positive constituent experience. We're sincerely thankful to Mayor Garcetti, the council members on this committee, and council at large for the digital leadership and the technology investments that have been made to move the city of LA from the Stone Age to the digital age. For example, about one third of all My LA, I say, of all 311 requests are coming through the MyLA mobile app or website. Our city network averages 99.8% reliability across 30,000 employees, which results in around 480,000 more productive employee hours than previous years. And the ITA cybersecurity team is working tirelessly to protect citizen data and critical city operations, blocking over 200 million cyber attack attempts every month. Over the last few years, I feel it's technology that has been the force multiplier, allowing the city to do more for more Angelinos. And as the city responds to another wave of budget challenges, we advocate for the continued focus on technology and technology infrastructure as a smart investment. As noted in our letter to this committee, there are two crucial items that we feel should be noted. Number one is the obsolete phone system replacement. As you know, the city uses traditional phone lines, known as POTS lines, for 30,000 staff across 500 facilities. 
Phone carriers have already announced that these will be eliminated in the year 2020. In addition, we're encountering increasing phone outages from our old equipment. We're now averaging around 922 phone issues per month. We had a 12% increase from this last year. The magnitude of the issues has also become much larger. For example, we just had major phone issues at six LAPD Valley stations. In short, our city phone systems are beyond end of life and they need replacement. Deployment of a modern voice over IP phones would be around $9 million across the city, but we certainly understand the financial challenges that are being faced. The ITA is proposing a blend of smartphones as well as voice over IP phones. We call it the mobile worker plan. By replacing most traditional desk phones with cellular smartphones, we feel that number one, it would improve staff mobility, it would greatly improve communications between city staff, and it would even benefit our disaster response during an emergency. Moreover, this plan is fiscally very responsible, 72% less expensive to implement than pure voice over IP. It would cost 13% less per month, and it reduces a reliance on our city network. We are respectfully requesting around $100,000 as an initial investment for the mobile worker plan and $640,000 for voice over IP phones at four of the six at-risk Valley LAPD stations for a total of $784,000. The second item that we feel must be noted are the proposed salary funding cuts for ITA. The proposed budget cuts $602,000 from ITA salaries and it defunds six filled positions the cost of which is another 750,000. Add these cuts to the already unbudgeted MOU provisions that are unique to ITA, sick leave payouts and retirements, ITA is required to hold 53 of our 421 authorized positions vacant to simply meet the proposed salary budget. In other words, the proposed budget requires us to maintain a 12.6% vacancy rate. We believe reduced staffing at this level would cripple our ability to implement funded projects or onboard new technologies. This would undermine the very technology investments that we work so hard to deliver for the city of LA. We are respectfully requesting $750,327 for the six unfunded but filled positions in the proposed budget and restoration of the position authorities. We sincerely appreciate your time and we're open for any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll start with our technology chair, Mr. Bloomfield. Thank you. Uh, and again, I appreciate the, the work you've been doing and you really have taken us from the Stone Age to the digital age and, and that has improved the city immensely. Uh, we talked about just like GSD, you guys are the, the capacity building arms of this city uh, and the, the way you do more with less is through technology and innovation and you've, you've been on the forefront. So for starters, I, I'm very worried about the, the cut that you, that you refer to, a 12.6 vacancy rate. Uh, I do think would be crippling, and so I'm going to ask for a report back on on uh, sources of funds for restoring that. But maybe you could talk to a couple other areas I want to talk about, but talk to us a little bit about if you had to prioritize that, um, how you would break that down in terms of um, if you were to get some of those positions back, but not all of them, is there, is, is there any sort of layering that you could illuminate us about? One of the difficulties of unfunded salaries is sometimes it becomes up to chance. If a position vacates, much like general services, around half of our staff are eligible to retire this year. And so we don't know exactly who or exactly when. Just this last week, we had four retirement announcements in one day. And so it could be in our network engineering area, it can be our 311 call center, it can be on our channel 35 TV station. And one of the difficulties we run into with a vacancy rate is we can't pick and choose where we vacate. When a position vacates, we have to hold it to be able to get salary savings and it becomes very difficult to fill. So one of the issues we run into is just our inability to fill critical positions. Uh, certainly as an organization, we're a broad one. We have 18 different divisions, but we'd certainly prioritize 311 call centers. We wanna make sure that when residents pick up and call, we don't have a situation in which we have uh, the, the almost seven minute hold times that we've been encountering lately because we haven't been able to fill vacancies. Uh, we wanna make sure that when people call, they get their answer when they need to get it. We would focus in on critical areas around public safety radio support. We'd focus in on critical areas in our data center and in some of our other areas. So we have to sit down as an organization and looking at where we're, we're marketed, we have to basically uh, tackle them one by one and try to prioritize. But it always becomes difficult 
because as an organization, sometimes I have to prioritize my payroll system versus my data center or public safety support against my 311 call center. We're such a broad organization with 18 divisions that sometimes it becomes very difficult. And the issue with the vacancy rate is, in effect, when a position vacates, we don't have the ability to fill it until we can show that we have the budget to do so. So it sometimes becomes a roll of the dice. Okay. Uh, on the phone system, I think uh, you, you know, you've asked for it a couple of years. Last year, certainly, I think it was the year before, about the VoIP. And we keep pushing that, that can down the road and, or kicking the can down the road. And um, what happened at the police departments this you know, last several months with phone calls getting sent to other departments and, and crazy things happening is just not, not acceptable. Uh, I really like what you're talking about in terms of the, the creativity of moving to, you know, kind of leapfrogging the traditional phone system and moving toward a cellular system. Um, that may be something, I hope we're going to be able to fund it here, and I, I would ask for a report on the funding for that. Um, but if for some reason we don't, you know, I would look at the Innovation Fund for something like that, too, to apply for, because it's, it is, it's a little wobbler. I always hate things that qualify for both, because I think there should be a, growth, a big distinction of what, what can qualify as a budget versus an Innovation Fund. But it is, it is innovative in terms of changing the way we think about our our landlines. I mean, most people have cut the lines, or a lot of people have cut the lines of their homes. Uh, so seeing it happen here uh, makes some sense. Now, what, what, one piece I didn't get on that, if, if ITA does the work to upgrade the phone system at the, the Valley Police Stations, uh, is there any way to get a reimbursement from LAPD for some of those costs? We've, as we've been encountering the issues, we're very close partners with the LA Police Department. And so we very quickly or early on not only tried to go ahead and provide a minimal number of lines to be able to ensure they had some bare communications while we were resolving the outage, which, by the way, was completely related to antiquated servers, just very old investments in hardware, and we were not able to replace without getting a refurbished one to do so. In our partnership with LAPD, we said, listen, here's the cost associated with making the replacement. And based on all of our discussions, they said they've been unable to fund it also. So it's one of those situations where we have an aging phone system. Uh, much like the position vacancies, you never quite know where it will show up. Uh, and this is not an area we ever want anything to show up impacting LAPD stations. And so unfortunately, this is just an area in which both LAP and IT are unable to find funds to be able to make the replacement. All right, well, I think we need to figure out funding for it, and uh, we may have to figure out what side of the ledger it goes on as well, but we can, sure. we can talk about that. But the, the need is certainly there. It's not just the LAPD stations. I mean, even my municipal building and the office where I am, our calls were being once a month or more, uh, something goes wrong with our phones, and you guys get called out, and it's very expensive, and we tend to get our phones end up being transferred magically to transportation. And they get frustrated because uh, they're getting all our calls, but it's not, it's not a way to run a, a city. We need to get our, our phones fixed. Um, you mentioned cybersecurity. And last year, the department made a request related to cybersecurity. Um, it's a very important issue. Do we have enough funds? Uh, do you have the capacity and, and the funding to do what, what's necessary to maintain our cybersecurity at this point? That's a very good question. We're very proud of the mayor's executive directive and leadership from council members around cybersecurity. The very same way the city has to deliver public safety in a very analog sense, in a human sense, we know that as a city we have to do so also in a virtual sense. Um, just looking at some of the numbers, the fact that we are at this point repelling over 200 million automated attacks against our city landscape, which are cyber attacks, it, it's a testimony to simply the volume that's out there in the world. And so we're very proud of the leadership that we've had through our Chief Information Security Officer, Timothy Lee, what city departments are doing, as well as the efforts we've made. But what we're finding is that we have to kind of pivot and keep making adjustments. So we've done a pretty good job of making some investments around the perimeter, and now we're moving into what we call critical asset protection. Um, we did submit some money for that, um, which we, we had both a continuation of what we're doing at present, which is extremely important, but we did make a, a request for some additional. 
we feel it's very important to not only protect on the perimeter, but that as if some, someone were to breach our, our perimeter and get in, that the internal critical assets, payroll systems, LAPD undercover officers, et cetera, that that's the kind of data that gets protected. We've started down this path of what we call the critical asset protection program. We want to continue to expand this to expand and protect some other, once again, essential systems and data inside of our network. Um, which is something that's been lauded by Department of Homeland Security and others as exactly the right approach. So we certainly would appreciate additional investment around cybersecurity because they're really critical systems that if someone were to breach our outside, you can think of it as a castle. If someone gets through the castle wall, it, it's one thing if they can get in there and deface a website, so to speak. That's bad. But if they're able to get in there and uncover information that's critical to public safety or critical to, let's say, operations such as sanitation and Hyperion Treatment Center, et cetera, those are the kinds of things that we want to have an additional layer of protection to ensure that those critical assets don't get breached. But there's no, re there's no funding request in your letter on this. So we're, we're, we're good on the moving forward with the funds that we have. Is that correct? We were trying to be very respectful of the budget climate that we're in. Um, our initial budget packages did submit a request around uh, critical asset protection and to the, for $500,000, that was not funded. Um, but we were thankful for the continuation of funding to support what we have today. And we wanted to be very, like I said, we have a very broad department and I don't want to write letters uh, that just come in and just have, here's the 15 things that we still think that we need. We tried to be very cognizant of the budget situation that where we are today. But cybersecurity is a very critical one and we did make an ask, additional ask. Okay. Uh, you also mentioned the uh, payroll system support. Um, there's a line item in, in your budget for it. Is ITA taking the lead for this and are we at a point where a transition timeline can be estimated? Yes. So um, there is a fairly recent council motion in, in regards to this very topic in which it's always a little difficult because payroll is comprised of certainly the leadership of our controller's office who manages the payroll business process. There's a human resource side to it, so personnel is very involved, and ITA runs the system from the technical perspective. And so during that discussion, we were identified as a lead both for the sustainability of the existing system as well as for the replacement of it. So on the sustainability side, we made an ask in regards to having some additional uh, staffing for uh, the development side. We have the retirement of the contractor this next year, and we know that we need to be able to provide some basic level support that the contractor is providing. We know there are some asks being made on the controller side to also uh, support the payroll system and the existing process. But we're also in the process of starting the replacement. So we have some amount of funding this year that we're using to start our systems requirements gathering, the systems design to get us to a full-fledged payroll system replacement. Um, as the council members know very well, it's a very important system that's paying 48,000 full-time employees, 11,000 part-time employees. It's been highly customized over the last 12 years, and there's become a huge over-reliance on the contractor himself to be able to deliver it. That's not a situation we want to be in. So we're working very hard to freeze the system, to have strong governance around the system, to build up city capacity to support the system, and invariably we have to replace the system. It is not a system that can last us the next five or six years. It must be replaced with a modern system. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Bonner? Thank you. Yes, I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Mr. Blumenfield asked pretty much everything I was going to with the exception of, I had a question on um, procurement reform. That's something both you and GSD are working on? Yes. Uh, we ha actually have a, a body a committee that includes general services as well as it's got contract administration and others. And ITA, part of ITA's role is to um, build out the first phase of the construction procurement automation process? Correct. It's a uh, very, very big project. And how well is it funded in this year's budget? So the initial, our initial request was $1.6 million out of a two-year request. And for us, it's very, very, very critical. We've identified through this working group that started this last summer, we've identified critical ways for us to greatly improve procurement. And it would impact three different groups. For businesses, it should simplify their process. For city management, it should metricize the process and give visibility. And for departments, it should automate the process. We were funded $1 million. Um, 
one of the issues we have is that while $1 million will help us start to automate a component of the process, we have seven milestones that we see in procurement, and it'll certainly help us automate one of them. The full funding that was requested, 1.6, will not only automate that, but allow us to do all seven and automate all seven across construction services or some other large area, which would greatly improve our ability and to deliver value now, this upcoming year, as opposed to seeing a, a significant deferral of when value starts to be seen. So business would be able to start to use electronic documents and digitized processes in year one as opposed to it being deferred to year two if it were invested at 1.6 million. My understanding is last time we did procurement reform was in the 90s, <clears throat> over 20 years ago, and we started saving tens of millions of dollars uh, a year on that. How soon, if we were able to, to give you the, the full funding this year, would we begin to start seeing savings? The way we've identified it, we would see procurement cycles reduced by greater than one half for services and around one third for commodities. On the commodity side, we're already in progress working to implement this. For the, let's say a major area like construction services, et cetera, we would start to see it in that first year. Um, Full services, general uh, across the city service contracts would have to be when we were able to complete the entirety of the project, so likely that would be in year two. So this funding and this investment will allow us to start to realize that value through some major channels. Um, if we were simply funded at the $1 million level, while a great investment and very significant, that wouldn't occur in year one, that'd have to occur in year two. Okay, well, let's get a report back on that and whether or not um, there, there could actually be money saved by investing uh, the full amount this year. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Martinez? Thank you. So back in March, the Van Nuys Police Station, and I'm sure you know about this, had a two-day outage yes. due to our failing um, equipment. And so I I'm just deeply concerned that, you know, just our neighbors can't even call in our neighborhood police station um, for a simple call. Instead, they're having to call 911 to get through the station. I mean, I recognize that the citywide, um, this effort to modernize our citywide communication is important, but I believe that we also need to start with public safety. Mm -hmm. So does your budget provide a public safety communication um, line item to address some of these issues? And what would it cost to actually fix them? So our initial budget really does focus on maintenance and support. Uh, so we made the request for the obsolete phone replacement. That would be the voice over IP project. We've been unable to receive funds for it, and, and to your point, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I don't want communications failing in any department or any location, let alone a police department, a police station. Um, as you described, we had two-day outage of calls going in or out at Van Nuys. We had another incident right around the same time in which we had 10-day outage of calls coming in for six stations. Um, it, it's, it's ridiculous. I'm, I'm embarrassed as an IT manager that we're even encountering those types of issues. And that's why in our budget letter, we're requesting $684,000 to replace for at least four of those six. Once again, being budget-minded, acknowledging the fact that we want to replace them all, um, and we want to prioritize public safety at the top of phone system replacement, but we have not been receiving funds related to it, and that's the difficulty that we're encountering. And which are the four of the six that you just mentioned? Uh, the four of the six that we mentioned are Van Nuys, mm -hmm. Foothill, Granada Hills, and Devonshire, which were four of the six that encountered issues. Do we know why they're, we're having such an issue in the valley? Uh, I, hate to, I hate to describe it such a way, it's luck of the draw. It's the equipment <laughs> the that draw. failed first. It's the equipment that failed mm -hmm. first. Um, we have equipment of about the same age across the city, and mm -hmm. that equipment had a failure and that's what caused that issue. And when we have any type of failure, especially in those types of uh, locations, we're very aggressive in regards to restoration. We literally went through four different vendors to try to get replacement equipment, and we ended up having to get a refurbished server brought down from San Francisco to be able to help get it up and running in time. Um, like I said, as an IT major, I'm embarrassed to even be admitting that these are issues that we're having, but unfortunately we just have a lack of funding to mm -hmm. be able to make this replacement. And, and that was the incident that occurred, unfortunately. And your, your budget also indicates that there's 22 stations that need to be replaced. Yes. Um, what, would, what would be the cost for all 22 stations? Um, yeah. I, I would love to provide a report back on that simply because okay. not all the stations are in the same level of infrastructure. So there's certainly some prioritizing that could happen. Um, 
So the six that you mentioned, those are the priority? Those are priorities, yes. Um, I also understand that AT&T and Verizon plan to discontinue their landline support um, by 2020. Yes. What are our plans towards um, updating and replacing our own phone system by that time? Uh, we, we, we've been pushing and urging for the city to fund a voice over IP replacement. As I said, it comes to about $9 million across the city. Um, acknowledging the fact that we're coming into another round of financial challenges and budget challenges, we think that this mobile worker plan, where we could actually, instead of just going for replacement of a traditional desk phone to a voice over IP desk phone, if we can switch to a smartphone, we could actually end up being 70 something percent cheaper for implementation. So we think that maybe this gives us a golden opportunity to not just go through a traditional replacement of our, our older desk phones, but we can actually leap ahead and with less investment, very quickly get out there and start to make replacements. So, so do you have a transition plan and can it be done in two years? Yes, if funded. Okay. Absolutely. So the only report back, well, we asked for a previous report back on what it would cost to um, replace our outdated phone service for the 22 stations. I want to add to that too. Can I also add a report back on the transition plan, including identifying sources of funding to begin this transition? Absolutely. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I have a few requests from Mr. Englander. I think they've all pretty much been covered, but just to make sure that we have um, all of the right language in these reports back to cover everybody's concerns. Um, he would like a report back on the department's request for the 784000 to replace the obsolete phone systems which would include an analysis of potential savings that would be realized from that replacement. A report back, as Ms. Martinez just indicated, on finding the $684,000 of the need to replace the failing phone systems in the four Valley LAPD stations, including the use of VoIP and a timeline for completion in the upcoming fiscal year. And um, he'd also like a report on how the effective 12.6 vacancy rate due to salary savings and the unfunded positions uh, would affect cybersecurity, emergency phone systems like 911, SMS replacement, FMS maintenance, and the maintenance of other vital systems. Again, I think we covered most of that, but just so we have it in, in report form, uh, those are Mr. English's requests as well. Anything else, members, for ITA? Great. Mr. Ross, thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right, so um, members, we're next going to take up the presentation by the Neighborhood Council Budget Advocates. And as they are working their way up, you can probably hear in the distance uh, that there are marchers uh, approaching. And it could be that a little later in the afternoon, it might get a little loud in here with the amplified music concert that's going to be going on in Grand Park. So departments. We're going to try to get through everybody, um, but if it gets hard to manage in here, we might have to defer a department or two until um, till our next uh, session. So I apologize in advance if we have to do that, but we're going to do our best. We're going to do our best to get through everybody. So Neighborhood Council Budget Advocates, please come on forward. All right, uh, good afternoon um, and welcome. Thank you in advance. Uh, I shouldn't say in advance. Thank you for all the work that you do throughout the year and all, that all you've done uh, leading up to this point. And I also want to thank uh, Mr. Llewellyn, bless you, Mr. Bloomfield. I also want to thank Mr. Llewellyn because for I think the first time that we've been hearing from the, the Neighborhood Council Budget Advocates, and this is something that we started a few years ago to invite the budget advocates to the table to 
to do a formal presentation. I think for the first time since we've been doing that, we actually have a CAO memo uh, analyzing uh, the white paper already. And we usually have to wait quite a while for that, but we have it in hand already. So that's, uh, we're a step in the right direction. But um, welcome, and who would like to begin? Mr. Humphreyville. Thank you. Um, first of all, let me introduce our various neighborhood council budget advocates, starting with Brian, and what neighborhood council you're with. I'm Brian Allen with the Granada Hills Neighborhood Council. Uh, Michael Menavar in uh, North Hollywood Northeast, which is in the CD2 and CD6. Barbara Ringette, Silver Lake. Jacqueline Kennedy with Bell Air Beverly Crest. And I'm Jack Humphreyville. I'm with the Greater Wilshire Neighborhood Council. Danielle Sandoval with Central San Pedro Neighborhood Council and newly elected board member of Harbor City Neighborhood Council. Bridget Kidd, Zapata King, Neighborhood Council, Region 9. Um, I'll start off and then we're going to uh, go to, to, to various people. We're a little, we're not quite at full staff because we thought we'd be after lunch, but uh, we, we can't wait to participate in the May Day present, you know, presentations. <laughs> a lot better listening to out there than in here. Um, we presented our white paper to, Eric, to, to Mayor Eric Garcetti on May, March 8th, and since that time there's obviously been some significant changes just given that you've introduced the budget. Um, so uh, this is going to be a little bit of an update. Um, on last Tuesday, the L.A. Times uh, nailed it when the editorial board said L.A. needs to get real on the city's finances if it wants to be a world-class city. Um, one of the mayor's basic, uh, back to basic priority outcomes is to have the city live within its financial means, but that certainly is not the case. Revenues are up by $1.2 billion, but we still have a structural deficit and a, ri and a river of red ink. This year's budget, 16-17, is not balanced because of revenue shortfalls and higher than expected expenditures. This includes legal settlements of about two, of over $200 million. Despite an increase in revenues of 200 mil, over $200 million, the city struggled uh, to balance the budget by using, all, uh, by using, as the LA Times called it, all, all kinds of budget gymnastics, including leaving vacancies unfilled, postponing repairs, and shortchanging the budget stabilization fund by $75 million. The reserve fund is under pressure to maintain its minimum levels, even if the proceeds from the offering of the $60 million judgment obligation bonds um, are, are added to the reserve fund. The budget gap next year is, is over $100 million. bucks. Over the next four years, the cumulative budget deficit is over $300 million. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. The $300 million budget gap does not reflect the impact of any new labor contracts with the police, the fire, and the civilian unions. The budget, op, uh, budget outlook does not include enough money to properly maintain and repair our streets, a $4 billion ticket. And this $4 billion ticket does not include Mr. Bonin's pet, pet project, Division Zero. <laughs> Just had to throw that in, Mike. <laughs> Nor does the budget outlook provide adequate funding to maintain the rest of the city's infrastructure buildings or provide sufficient funds to update uh, the city's ancient computer systems. The budget outlook underfunds the city's two pension plans because the annual required contribution rate relies on an overly optimistic investment rate assumption of 7.5%. And the unfunded liability, according to Moody's, is north of $20 billion. Overall, the real obligations of the city are being understated by at least $500 million a year, or $2 billion over the next four years. We once, rent, once again recommend that the city adopt the budget recommendations of the LA 2020 Commission. The establishment of an Office of Transparency and Accountability to oversee the city's finances, the formation of a Commission on Retirement Security to review the city's pensions, and the development of three-year budgets. As the Los Angeles Times said, it is time for the mayor and the city council to get real in the city's finances. We are also proposing a back-to-basics plan, which includes long-range planning, no budget busting contracts or initiatives, a plan to repair our streets and the rest of our infrastructure, benchmark the efficiency of city services, outsource selected pro projects, develop business-friendly policies, and hire a C COO, city manager, to oversee the city's operations. Um, I think our next person uh, is going to be Jacqueline, Jacqueline Kennedy. And I'm sorry, before you begin, just so I can understand the internal process that you all go to, go through. Uh, Jack, you just listed 
15 or so uh, specific recommendations. Um, are those recommendations that the budget advocates as a whole vote on? Yes. Okay. And these were so, present, those recommendations were presented to, May, to, to Eric Garcetti on, May, on March 8th. Okay. So, it was, so everything you're going to be reporting are things that the collective body has already weighed in on? Yes. And, and, okay. Very good. Thank you. Sorry. I think you uh, – hold. No, I, I beg your pardon. I think – Barbara, I think you're next with the liabilities in LAPD. Actually, it's Jack. Jack. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, when we speak of liabilities, uh, you know, there will always be liabilities, assets, liabilities. That's always going to be around. Um, however, I want to specifically zoom in only on litigation and lawsuits um, because it seems like uh, that those numbers have grown a lot over the years. Um, so I'm just going to briefly uh, read my recommendation from the report. Um, so, any litigation, especially high-stakes civil or class action litigation, can be costly and inherently comes with various elements of risk. The non-prevailing party has a lot to lose. Furthermore, the non-prevailing party oftentimes, if possible, if they can, will appeal any appealable judgment, which will create more risk and the need for additional litigation funding for all parties involved. There is no doubt that these types of endeavors can become very costly and risky for the city. Therefore, it would be prudent for the city to consider the following. You should utilize your in-house departmental funding only for fully vetted lower risk cases. Now, when you are utilizing your affirmative litigation program or even countersuing, you should, you should research various financial institutions or creditors to obtain non-recourse loans for litigation funding. And lastly, you should inquire with insurance carriers regarding litigation outcome insurance and other special risk products and options. And though the city attorney's office, uh, the risk management system, is currently coordinated with the CAO's office, the city attorney's office needs to independently take on responsibility for litigation risk management. I'm not sure if they started doing that. Uh, litigation valuation and litigation risk management specialists should also be retained to conduct analysis for each case and for each stage of every case as risks and costs may rise and fall with the introduction of new evidence, new case laws, um, new circumstances, new parties. Pleadings, settlements, and case strategies should carefully be analyzed with cost-benefit, statistical, and expert witness analysis. All of these measures would be prudent so that the city does not make any bet-the-house gambles. Those are our recommendations. Thank you. I'm sorry, Barbara. On, on what? Aren't you doing revenue enhancements? Oh, revenue enhancements, yes. I expected that to come at the end, but I'm happy to uh, speak right now. No, we'd rather have revenue enhancements right up front. So, <laughs> so bring them on. <laughs> ah, uh, thank you. And uh, we've created a list. Uh, our uh, original list on the eighth page in from the front of the white paper uh, didn't break things down into categories. So uh, I broke things down into categories so that they might be better understood. I have this list. How should we pass this out? Well, we have it. We have it in the white paper. It's, it's new. No, it's oh, th that's the organized one? Um, can, Erica, maybe could you just grab this? Are there enough? Thank you. She's going to distribute them. Okay. Okay. We've revised the list, placing ideas under five categories. First, other cities, states, nations. Second, fees for services provided and how they might be adjusted. 
Third, uh, development planning related ideas. Fourth, account related ideas. And fifth, additional. Most of these are duplicates of that eighth page in uh, on the white paper, but there are several additional ones. And uh, I've elaborated on several of them as well. Uh, it's interesting that uh, many of the uh, ones that we're talking about from other jurisdictions have actually been implemented from some with some success. And uh, our hope is in presenting this list uh, that uh, indeed new revenue sources can be considered and implemented, uh, thus making more money available for those valuable services that our neighborhoods, we are neighborhood council people, uh, need. Uh, so I, I hope you'll consider these and uh, look into them uh, further. Uh, if there are questions, we can attempt to answer them. Thank you. I, I think in, in terms of when we, we put these together, they're just sort of ideas. They haven't been flushed out, um, you know, because we just don't have the, the technical capability or just the general knowledge. You know, so for example, we talk about a congestion fee. I know it's, been, it's worked in London fantastically, uh, raising the city a lot of money, and it, while it's still crowded and stuffed with cars, it's a lot less stuffed than it used to be. Uh, so there's a bunch of ideas here that you know, need to be flushed, you know, flushed out. We will do that. And in fact, in, <laughs> in, in past years, uh, we haven't done it in a while, as I recall, but in past years, the council has actually scheduled what we call Revenue Day, where we discuss all revenue enhancement ideas as a council. Um, I'll discuss that with the council president again, but um, certainly in our committee, we will, we will be fleshing these out uh, to be sure. We'd be happy to meet with you, or the people who have developed these at, at your convenience. Thank and, you. And as uh, you'll see from the list, several of these are already in the process of uh, hopeful, hopefully implementation, uh, passing through the city council steps, uh, and uh, others of them are totally new. We think others have been considered, and we think they need to be reconsidered. Thank you, uh, Brian. Okay, I uh, I have a vision that I came up with a while back, and the the budget advocates are going to eventually uh, discuss it further. It is a change in the way we pursue the job of interviewing departments and identifying. Uh, uh, issues within the budget. Uh, currently, the budget advocates spend about an hour or two uh, with each department going over questions like, how did you do compared to last year? What are you, what are you changing? What improvements do you have? Uh, and how can we help you? Unfortunately, in an hour or two, it's very difficult to get enough detail. The budget advocates as a whole, as a group, have a great deal of expertise and experience among, among them, most of us being retired or close to it. And that provides us the ability to look deeper into these issues if we so choose, or if we may. So the proposal that I have is that we change the way we begin the process, and instead of looking at the budgets and asking questions once they've been developed, that we spend more time, day, two, three days, working with the, different, the various departments and the mayor's teams, to look at it at the beginning where it's being developed so that we can have a proactive activity to, pr to provide input and feedback and address issues before the budgets are completed rather than afterwards. Uh, we believe that that would allow us to prepare a much better, much more informed white paper and would allow us to be a part of the process before and after the fact allowing us to participate with them whenever they have a question or an issue because we would have more information to work with. On top of that, we are very close, as, as we all know, to the constituents. And those stakeholders are talking with us on a regular basis. So we have a little bit more feedback that we can give the departments from the standpoint of the stakeholders as well. So that is the uh, vision and we hope to be able to, to uh, capitalize on it. Great, well that's a suggestion probably best directed at the mayor's bud budget team uh, to try to integrate your engagement earlier on in the process. Um, I will say that I think one of the 
great advantages, uh, one of the great um, benefits of the Neighborhood Council Budget Advocates that we don't talk about very much is not just you communicating to the departments, it's also the expertise that you develop about budgetary, about departmental budgets, which can then be used to help educate and inform people in the community about where their money is actually going, what the departments are actually doing and, and or not doing. Um, it's a two-way communication street, which is, I think, you know, important as well, so. And we agree with that. Great. Great, uh, thank you very much, council members. I spoke, uh, I'm gonna be, speak be speaking about the Ethics Commission and LADLT very briefly. Um, I spoke at the Ethics Commission presentation a couple, uh, a couple days ago. Um, so just very briefly, it sounded like you will be uh, approving a sm small increase in funding so that they can have an additional staff person, so we thank you for that. Uh, I would strongly also encourage you to consider increasing their funding in future years. Uh, as we um, left our meetings with the Ethics Commission, it sounds like 40 fully, uh, fully full-time staff members is what uh, is, is the number of bodies that they're going to need to take a more proactive approach to ensuring a healthy democracy for our city. So uh, thank you again for the increase in funding for this next fiscal year, and uh, just again, an encouragement to consider uh, a greater increase in future years. Um, secondly, for the Department of Transportation, uh, we heard from the General Manager, Salita Reynolds, earlier this morning. Um, we uh, strongly are thankful for Vision Zero. It's a very laudable uh, go, um, as uh, has been reported in the news recently. Uh, fatality pedestrian deaths have been increasing uh, currently this year from what they were at previ in previous years. So um, we do support, uh, and I, I know Mike Bonin is a big fan of uh, possibly directing a majority of Measure M funds to uh, go to Vision Zero. So we do support that as well. Um, we also, um, from our meeting with them, from our meeting with them, we got the understanding that their biggest issue happens to also be number of bodies that they have. Um, there have been a lot of, uh, w well, there's going to be an increase in special events throughout the city, so we're gonna, the city's gonna be requiring a lot more traffic officers, mm -hmm. uh, people directing traffic, and parking enforcement as well. Um, there have been a lot of parking issues just in my own neighborhood in CD2. Um, I think there were about five requests and within a matter of a week a few months ago. Um, one story in particular was this uh, young lady named Rosa who had to park to, she was living with her grand, she lives with her grandmother, um, but she, uh, her grandmother's disabled, but she had to park two blocks away from their apartments and her grandmother who has to use a walker has to walk two blocks away just to get back to her apartment. Uh, so we, we were very thankful to work with uh, uh, Mr. Krikorian's office. Um, Patrick Justice in particular was terrific in ensuring that parking enforcement uh, were doing their due diligence in the neighborhood. So those issues have been resolved, but um, uh, we learned from our meeting with Salita Reynolds that the biggest driver that encourages people to not use their car happens to be parking. So nobody likes getting a parking ticket, but uh, we, we, we definitely support that, uh, the idea of hiring more parking enforcement officers so that uh, we can uh, better enforce our parking laws. Okay, um, we have one more item, and I'm, I'm sub because we're a little earlier than we expected, we, we were sort of thinking after lunch, I'm gonna substitute for Jay Handel and talk about um, uh, our idea of about a city manager or a chief operating officer. The, cit the city has 33,000 employees. It has a $9 billion budget. That's one huge enterprise. And one of the things that we've sort of come away from, come away with, is that there's really not any real decent controls over the whole city operation. Yes, the mayor is the chief executive officer, but there's no chief operating officer. There's no city manager. And in that regard, we'd like to, th we, we believe that the city could benefit by having either a city manager or a chief operating officer, somebody or a group of people that have 
you know, strong administrative capabilities, they have been involved in large organizations, know how to analyze the numbers, actually somebody that would know how to build the systems, management information systems, which I think we're sorely lacking, uh, you know, in, in the city. Um, so the concept of trying to bring in professional expertise that, you know, would obviously would have to understand, you know, the city's culture, but try to make it a much more efficient operation so we get more bang for the buck. And I think it would make your life one hell of a lot easier, uh, you know, just, just given that you, wouldn't, you, you, you would have somebody that you could actually go to to have a lot of those questions answered. City managers in a number of different cities, uh, you know, have, have proved to be very valuable. And all you need to do is maybe go talk to Rick Cole about the value of a city manager. So that's, thank you very much. Any questions? Questions, members? Mr. Bonner? Uh, thanks. I uh, just have a, a couple. Uh, first of all, Jack, um, thank you for referring to Vision Zero as my pet project. No problem. Uh, it certainly isn't mine, but um, if, uh, if my epitaph could read his pet project was trying to prevent kids from getting killed on their way to school, I'll rest happy. Um, uh, I love a lot of the, the suggestions uh, that you made. I'm really very intrigued by a number of these. Although, I, I will note, Jack, your call for um, city manager and stuff like that. If I were writing an article for City Watch, my lead would be neighborhood council budget advocates call for massive expansion of city bureaucracy. <laughs> um, but it's an interesting I, I idea. I might call it efficiency, but we, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I do want to uh, thank you for bringing up the, the non-resident tax for secondary residences and the unoccupied units. It's something I'm very interested in. It's been an issue, uh, particularly on the, the west side, where we have a lot of um, uh, foreign investors coming in and buying up properties and not living in them. It's contributed to the glut of luxury housing. It's something that, that I'm looking into. Um, uh, I was also really intrigued by the, the, the congestion fee. I was very surprised to, to see that in here because if there is a silver bullet to traffic congestion, it's congestion pricing. If there is a single proposal to deal with traffic that is more controversial <laughs> than anything, it's congestion pricing. Um, it, it's a very interesting idea. SCAG is very interested in doing it um, and they'd like to see it done in Los Angeles. but. Uh, I, I don't ask this facetiously. I, I ask this genuinely because you've, you've said congestion pricing is something you're in favor of. Would you have been okay with paying a toll to get here to City Hall today? Or would you be okay with paying a toll to go back home this afternoon? Would I be comfortable paying a toll to be in the expressway? You know, the answer to that is yes, if I'm going to be able to move, you know, a little bit better than I, than I, than I, you know, well, today's not the right day. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, would I be, would, I, would be a cheapskate be okay with that? You bet your life you would, I would be, absolutely. Uh, and uh, it, j just teasing this out a little bit, because it is an important policy question, and, and in, in a city like Los Angeles, there's, there's real significant repercussions if it's something we were going to do. Um, you know, say we were going to do it on the west side, which is a heavily congested area. Uh, there are some who live in the area who might like it, might not like it. Then there's a lot of folks who live halfway across the county who come in to work on the west side who don't make a ton of money. And are we okay with imposing a toll there? I mean, any, I know you've only given the first initial thoughts, but I'm just curious. Have you thought about you know, how we might structure it in Los Angeles to deal with income disparity? You know, the, uh, I haven't thought about the income disparity. Uh, London doesn't do it that way. They have APRs, automatic plate readers, to enforce yeah. it. Uh, you know, actually they're talking about, I think they were talking about automatic plate readers over in the uh, Martin Cadillac uh, development, you know, for example. Um, you know, it, it is what it's gonna be. Uh, you know, and I, I think if you try and get into too many variations on it, um, you know, well, this guy makes a million dollars, this guy makes, you know, $10,000. I mean, you start getting, it gets awfully complicated. Uh, but, you know, you know, maybe it's a vehicle license fee like the governor has, the governor has in uh, SB1, where if you have a, a $100,000 car, you're going to get paid 200 bucks. And if you have a, a, a $5,000 car, you're paying 65 bucks. 
I mean, I, I, I don't have the answers to that, but you know, those are, those are, you know, I think you have to get the concept and then there's a lot of details and it ain't, people ain't gonna like it. Uh, but that's, you know, I think that's the price you're gonna pay. It, it, it's an interesting idea. I was really intrigued to, to see you mention it. Um, SCAG is very interested in seeing it happen here in, in Southern California. Uh, and uh, it's an idea I'd be interested in talking to, to, to you all about more. One of the things that, you know, when we went through Measure S, one of the things was transit-oriented density. And one of the comments was is that, you know, they're going to build all these high-rises in Hollywood, uh, but they're going to cost four or $5,000 a month. And the people that live there are going to be basically tooling the work. They ain't taking the subway and they're not taking the bus. They're going to be tooling the work in their BMWs. Well, if they're going to be tooling the work in their BMWs, well, maybe they can pay for that privilege. Great. I also want to thank you for some of the suggestions uh, in favor of the linkage fee, uh, the suggestions on tiny homes, the thoughts on uh, short-term rentals. Uh, I, I think just just looking through this just now, I think there's some really uh, thoughtful and interesting stuff in here, and I appreciate it, and I'm looking forward to engaging more. Thank you. Members? Should we let it go? Thank you. Can I, <clears throat> first, I want to thank you all for taking time uh, to work on this. I, I recognize this is, this is your volunteer time that you're giving back to the city and you're giving your expertise. Uh, and I think we ought to stop for a moment and appreciate that because you have um, spent a lot of time and energy on trying to improve this city and I'm, I for one am grateful. And I'm very pleasantly surprised by the list uh, I see here of revenues. Because in, in past years, one of my criticisms of, of when you've come up is a lot of we should do this, that, and the other, but never a, a thought about how we would pay for it. Um, so a lot of these things are, are things, I've been thinking about some of these things, some of these are new, some of these are things that we're, we're already working on, as, as you mentioned, which is, which is great. So I think we're all of a, a very similar mind, and, and I look forward to either a, a revenue day or, or something like that where we focus on how we get the new revenues that we need because we do have liabilities. I don't know if they're as, as big as you're saying in terms of 500 million. Um, you know, even if they are, as you say, in, with respect to our overall budget, that's still not, uh, you know, that's bad. But it's not. It doesn't. It, it's not. We're not closing down the city, even if it were that that large of a liability. It's it is manageable. And I say that having been the budget chair of the state, where we had to. We were almost on the brink of insolvency, and we had to cut $52 billion over the course of four years. <clears throat> so I don't, don't say it lightly. Um, and I recognize, and, and the things, it, they're real liabilities, whether or not on the pensions, what the assumptions will be. You know, most people think they probably will uh, change the assumptions, and that will cause us uh, a little bit more in terms of what we, what we have to start contributing on an annual basis. Um, we're going to have to deal with that. Uh, so. I guess long way of saying I, I very much appreciate what you're what you're putting forward here today, especially like the um, the revenue producing ideas. I think that's where we need to go. In terms of the liabilities, um, it is a constant struggle, and, and and we have made great strides. And this city attorney has made great great strides, along with Mr. Kokorian, on trying to reduce our risk because all of us recognize that that is a huge problem. Uh, and it's one where we have to be proactive about. Um, and the city attorney, I, I think, has really taken great strides in terms of doing that risk assessment earlier. The earlier we do it and we decide whether or not to settle and then on, on case management and then on the flip side, getting the training out there so that we have less of these cases. The problem, of course, is that a lot of our liabilities are things that happened 20 years ago. You know, we weren't, we weren't socked with this, this year's you know, whopper of a liability because of anything that happened while anyone who's in office was any a part of. Uh, it, were, it was cases, you know, that go way back of wrongful imprisonment and those kinds of things. But we have to deal with it and we need to put something in place so that we think about the future. So not a question, just a, just a series of comments and, and uh, an appreciation for the work that you've done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bloomfield. I echo all of those comments, and I uh, just want to thank you again. Um, the reason that I decided when I became budget chair to invite the Neighborhood Council Budget Advocates to participate in this hearing for the first time ever um, is precisely because we sometimes can get tunnel vision 
anybody in any institution can kind of get tunnel vision. And, and the answer becomes, um, you know, to the, the answer to the question, why are we doing it that way, is often because that's the way we've always done it. And uh, you can tend to get stuck in that cycle. So having you develop policy expertise and substantive expertise in particular areas, and then come to us with suggestions from a different perspective than what maybe we would normally be thinking about in, in City Hall, I think is, is very helpful. And especially, as Mr. Blumenfield said, on the revenue side. Because, you know, to be honest, some of the challenges that we have in generating new revenue are just a question of political will. And a lot of no one who's in public office likes to go and ask for more money from the people who elect us under any circumstance, whether it's a tax, a, a fine, a permit fee, a penalty, a parking ticket, nothing. We don't like to do that. And so to the point that I made earlier about the two-way communication, having your support of some of these revenue ideas I think is important for all of us to understand that, yeah, the public is willing to go out and invest in our city if they're getting a return on investment, if they're getting results that, you know, are worth the investment. And so this is an important dialogue for us to have, a bilateral dialogue for us to have for the future as these difficult, as Mr. Bonin was pointing out, some of these are in intensely controversial and there will be war within this uh, chamber over some of these things and out there in your neighborhood councils as well. So if we're going to ever bridge that gap, we kind of need you guys to be there with us in, in that. So that being said, I just want, I want to, I'm curious um, because a lot of good recommend, revenue recommendations. There's some efficiency recommendations that I've, and I've, I've just now had a chance to kind of quickly go through this. Um, but in the overall uh, findings, um, the, the findings include elimination of or reduction of the gross receipts tax. Of course, you all know the gross receipts tax produces enough revenue to pay for our fire department every year. It's 10% of the general fund. Um, Recommendations include substantially increasing investments in infrastructure, deferred maintenance, reducing the um, supposedly overly optimistic investment rate, uh, investment return rate, which I think you all know I fundamentally disagree with, and it's been proven historically that it's not overly optimistic. But let's assume for a moment that it is. Um, that's going to produce hundreds of millions or billions of dollars of real impact today in our current budgets. You want to increase funding on streets and sidewalks and so on. So all of that being said, all of those are important goals, worthy goals that I think we share. But I think it's also fair to say that revenue enhancement alone is not going to pay for all of those things. So I guess I would, I would ask, which departments would have you discussed cutting? How many police officers should we reduce the size of the police department by in order to do that? Has any of that been discussed? Or has it always been on the revenue side? Which departments should we make dramatic cuts to? I, I don't think anybody thought about cutting, cutting with regards to fire, you know, the sworn officers, whether it's the police department or the, or, or the um, uh, fire department. I think we're, one of the reasons we came up with the chief operating officers, we think that the you know, Department of Public Works, for example, is terribly mismanaged. All you need to do is look at Ron Galpern's report of August of 14, where he had a 50% utilization rate of labor, when most of my construction friends who run construction companies or are involved in the business say it should be about 80, 85%. So I think Public Works, which has a budget of what, $1.2 billion? Uh, 5,500 employees, I think there could be a lot of efficiencies there. Um, I think there's a lot of other things that we could do to make, make the city much more efficient, including, you know, outsourcing various uh, tasks, one-offs. Uh, you know, city lab the city labor force does not appear to be that, that, uh, that efficient. It doesn't appear to be that well managed. The management information systems stink. Uh, so those are some of the areas that we've talked about, but we haven't put pen to paper. Uh, but I think, you know, a lot of it depends on 
Um, how, do, how do you go about, uh, 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 you know, structuring things? One of the examples for exa for, that we talked about was, for, uh, was the uh, uh, HHH, and each unit costs four hundred thousand dollars. Well, what, maybe why can't we do some modular housing on that? Why do we have to use the prevailing wage? Why can't we use private contractors? And you know, from my understanding, is prevailing wage is basically uh, a number of those things is one hundred percent more than market rate. Uh, when you put all the all the costs in there, so there's probably a lot of areas that you can focus in on that could save a lot more, a lot of money, and make make it much more efficient. Okay, so yeah, sure. The information technology uh, interview, and some of the things that we found is if you um, we support enhancing the technology throughout the departments because there's so much inefficiency. There's one department who's using an application. There's another department that's not. So some of those positions that people are just pushing paper probably could go ahead and be removed because some of the automation would make it more simpler and it would cut down the communication time between the city services to the public. So there were some things that we do support and also at the same time realize that there are some positions that can be cut because of technology. You have to have the advances in technology along with the procurement site, sure. uh, you know, services, I mean, along with actually hiring quicker like the private sector does. That whole process of hiring, taking a long time for exam, you're going to miss the most prime and prospects for the position. So some right. of those things we looked at balancing cuts and enhancements. It's, and sometimes investing more to realize ongoing cost efficiencies, which those are the sorts of things that we talk about on a weekly basis here and in, in every budget. Uh, I don't think you'll get any disagreement. But I guess my point is there's been no discussion of wholesale elimination of departments or dr dramatic cuts in departments, mm -hmm. we're going to realize savings through operating efficiencies. That's one way. Okay. Let me add one, one additional point, uh, because I have been talking with them about uh, the issue of uh, efficiency. And efficiency can eliminate a number of heads. Nobody wants to hear that either. But in listening to these meetings, uh, when Ron Galpern was in, as an example, uh, he wants to go through and hire outside consultants to evaluate the, the need to change and how to change the payroll systems. But we have payroll systems in multiple departments, and we are going to spend a lot of money to try to evaluate that. Now, I'm coming from a history of 40 years of accounting and finance, and I was a CFO for most of those. I'm one of the few here that actually has that kind of background. And I can tell you that from my experience, there is a great deal of efficiency that can be developed by consolidating entities, uh, activities within entities that are better suited in other entities. And if that was looked at clearly, we would find a lot of efficiency that we could, we could uh, save a lot of money. Uh, the other point I was going to make was that the budget advocates have a great deal of expertise among themselves. And if the departments want to look at things like that, they could come to the budget advocates and, and a group of budget advocates could get involved in that as, a, as an initial review before spending the money for a KPMG. And that could save a lot of money right there. So uh, it's just, you know, in looking at this from that standpoint, your question, what can we eliminate? We could find things to eliminate, but we, I go back to my original premise of we need to get more involved in the beginning to know what we're talking about in detail rather than an overview, which is what we do today. Great. Okay, anything else, members? Very good. Thank you all very much. Appreciate Thank you. your... Uh, Good work over the course of the year and uh, your patience today as well. Thanks very much. Um, so we will take up next uh, animal services.
Ms. Barnett, well, welcome, and uh, thank you for submitting your letter. Um, we're ready to jump right in before the music starts, That's so okay. go right ahead. Thank you. Um, we're glad to be here today, and uh, glad the music hasn't started yet. Uh, <laughs> Any minute. Um, we, we're going to save that for Ms. Brazil. Okay. The cultural affairs. You know, cultural <laughs> affairs likes having the musical background. She'll so like it. She'll love go it. Go right <laughs> I have here with me today uh, my assistant general manager, Dana Brown, and our budget director, John Forlan. Uh, we actually um, are uh, committed to being a member of the city family and a team player. We understand the uh, budget constraints, and it sort of reminds me of the first two years I was here. Um, and, and I think we don't even know how, um, how much the impact is going to have. But I, I would like to share just a couple of thoughts. I'm not going to go over the letter, but just a few details about the letter. Uh, we did a strategic plan this year. We visited with um, community members in every council district. Uh, we had meetings in all of our shelters for volunteers and staff. And we did a lot of work to find out what the community what the constituency really wants from our department, uh, because it is a department like all city departments owned by the community. Um, and what we found three main things that the community said they wanted from us. They do want no kill. And I, I'm happy to say to you that we're at over 86% now and expect to reach 90% by the end of this 2017, a calendar year, but we plan to do more than just reach the magic target of a 90% life save rate. We also plan to, to be in a position to sustain it as well as to just reach the goal. The community also said they're very interested in humane education or education on almost any topic. And uh, we've started to do some things like the, on that. We have been having at least two meetings a month in different uh, neighborhoods, uh, at our shelters, actually, uh, about wildlife and how to coexist with wildlife. That's an issue for many people in Los Angeles. And the third thing they said, and not necessarily in this order, uh, was public safety. And the reason I think public safety um, is so important um, is because of the number of dog bites, children on playgrounds where there are loose dogs, um, and we have a problem with this. And um, unfortunately, the budget this year uh, will not allow us to hire the uh, vacant positions. I think we have about 24, John, correct me if I'm wrong, 24 open animal control officer positions that will not be funded uh, this year. We didn't lose the position authorities, but we did lose the funding for it. Um, there was another, um, we've, we actually realized after the Blue Book came out that there was another uh, over $300,000 um, that we were bringing us to about a $1.9 million reduction in our budget for this year, which is a 9 to 10 percent reduction, which is fairly significant for a small department. I think we represent about 1.1 percent of the city's uh, overall budget, and um, we actually think that with 1.3 percent we could do everything you want us to do. Um, one of the things that we've done that we're most proud of this year is we opened our first homeless um, project for people with pets in Skid Row. We partnered with Inner City Law Center, with Downtown Dog Rescue, and, and our department, of course. And we um, go down there once a week. We give people uh, free spay-neuter vouchers to make sure they can have their pets altered. We know that altered pets are typically considered less aggressive. We also help the homeless people who have pets get their animals rabies vaccines. That's a state law. It's a very uh, important issue. Although we don't have a lot of rabies in Los Angeles, we do know that there is some in the bat population. So preventing it from getting into the pet population is, is critically important. Um, so, And we look forward to um, working on some other uh, similar projects. We're very, very close in CD11 in Councilmember Bonin's district. We've been working with some people, doing a lot of networking down there. Uh, we're also um, hopeful that we're going to have similar things in um, uh, Councilmember O'Farrell's office and, and in Councilmember Krikorian in your, in your um, section, in your district. Um, we, we are also looking at ways that we can raise money. 
Uh, we're in the process of working on an RFP to put out for uh, direct marketing and fundraising, uh, which we believe um, my, my background uh, is in fundraising before I came to the city. So uh, I know what those kind of programs can do. We believe if we get the word out about the things that we're doing well, people will step up and they will support us and we'll be able to generate some more income to help with some projects. Um, that's really um, one of our important things that we're doing. We're also working with the city attorney's office and the CLA's office to uh, work with a group of people who want to set up a foundation to help support uh, the work of our department, uh, sort of like the fire department or the police department foundations. We're hopeful that that will also happen this year. Um, you know, I think the only other thing that I want to mention is it would be, um, it would be an oversight on my part if I didn't mention that um, we don't have any reserves. We're not going to have any reserves. So if there is an emergency or something that needs that we need to give attention to, our ability to absorb that cost is probably non-existent at this point. Um, and with that, we're happy to answer any questions we can. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bonin. Would you like to start? You're good, Mr. Bonin. <laughs> reserve been in, in past years? You mentioned you don't have a reserve this year. Typically we start out the year with a million dollars or so that we have discretion for staffing or to cover shortages in our expense accounts. John Forland with the Department of Animal Services. Yeah, so sometimes these, these monies are in uh, our salary accounts, but because of vacancies we'll have some extra money. Uh, that's unlikely. We've always been able to absorb unbudgeted or unplanned cuts that come along. And this year, uh, we recognize from the start we don't have the ability. We don't have the ability to do that. In fact, uh, there are about $365,000 of cuts that we were not aware of when we wrote the letter, that are going to now mean we're, we think we're already at a, at a pretty uh, low uh, position level when Proposition uh, F was funded. Uh, they estimated we would need about uh, 428 positions to cover the shelters. The Prop F doubled the amounts of kennels and cages uh, we would have. We're now at 315, and this new budget is going to take us down to about 306 or 7 filled positions. And we just know that's right at the edge of the, the cliff. Yeah, what, is, what does that mean? I mean, that's... that's uh, gravely concerning. What it would help, help us understand what that's going to mean to be down those positions in terms of um, you know, animals killed and, and other issues. I, I think that the primary thing is public safety. Uh, honestly, these would be the animal control positions that are unfilled. And while we realize that cutting the funding for unfilled positions keeps the city from having to do layoffs, and we definitely support that, we also just want to recognize the fact that in terms of customer service, public safety, and, and actually doing what the, the community has asked us to do, we just won't be able to do that. Yeah. Maybe we can get a special study back on, on what it would cost to get those things done. You know, how much, you know, from where we are to, to actually meeting our goals of being a no-kill and uh, uh, to understand what, what are the parameters so we know what we're, what we're shooting for. Sure. Um, also, I mean, it's important, I mean, the cost of the city to euthanize an, an animal not only have gone down. I mean, it was in '71. I think we were spending 16 million. We've come a long way. Uh, want you to talk a little bit about that uh, in terms of what it's costing us now financially, but also the other aspects of of this policy in terms of costs, the human costs. And I know that 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 can be uh, damaging to the to the workers that are that are doing it. You know, they talk about sort of their own PTSD type of thing when, mm -hmm. when they go through it, but right. tell us a little bit about it. Well, we're, we're really fortunate at this point, with the support of the city and the support of the community. Uh, we are at an 86% life save rate and soon, uh, before the end of 2017, expect to be at 90% and to be able to maintain it. So you're right, the number of animals in that 10%, you end up uh, euthanizing animals who are gravely ill, irreparable suffering, are not going to be um, saved no matter what you 
invest in them financially. So these are animals that are euthanized for humane reasons. We still have to euthanize a few for space, uh, and we're working with our community partners and all on that. But as what I can tell you that in the six to seven years that I've been here now, staff morale has changed totally. I mean, we have people who are excited about coming to, coming to us with ideas for new things to do in their shelters. They're not just the people who have to go behind the closed door and kill animals anymore. Uh, the, 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 you know, the, the enthusiasm, we, we meet with our staff once a month with our supervisors and managers and, and we get their feedback. And you know, these are meetings that are fun now. They're not, they're not gloom and doom. And, and I think for our staff, it has made a huge difference. And you know, it's taking a little longer to get the word out and to have them not remember what they remembered 10 or 15 years ago. But we're starting to get the word out that we are a great place to go and we really have the best companion animals anywhere. Great. Well, appreciate the, the great work you're doing. Talk about um, new ideas. I've talked with a number of folks about new ways to promote adoption, and and um, you know one of the things I've talked with some of you about is trying to trying to um, harness the technology a little bit more, uh, like doing a you know Tinder for animal adoptions. You know where you can swipe left if you want them or right if you don't or something. And uh, so we, maybe yeah. get a, a report back on, on, on some of that in terms of the... I'd, I'd love to. We have someone developing something for us. We'd love to talk, tell you about that. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Necessarily the metaphor. <laughs> maybe it's not the right metaphor. But yeah. <laughs> um, have a couple of requests for reports. Uh, actually, one for Mr. Englander, uh, who asked for a report back on the, the impediments that the department has had in hiring ACOs. Uh, including any uh, any resulting from issues with personnel, including background checks, testing opportunities, lack of a certified current list, and, and so on. Um, and um, since this is an employee safety issue and one that potentially increases city liability, uh, we would also like a report on the amount necessary to hire additional ACOs in this fiscal year including any funds necessary for additional uh, departments or contract services. Um, and um, the department also was one of the first, if not the first, to participate in the ACE program. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that has worked out since we've initiated it in, in terms of retaining revenues in particular? Well, in terms of retaining revenues, I'd like to do a report back with the city attorney's office because they actually do the collection on the ACE citations. What we've found is it's a very effective tool on a couple of things, on licensing and on spay neuter because it, we use it like a fix-it ticket for those two items which ends up long-term being a revenue generator. Once we get a dog licensed in the system, they usually stay in the system five to eight years and continue to renew annually or every three years. Uh, so on those, we use it like a fix-it ticket. Uh, but for the others, I'd like to do a report back with the city attorney's office since they do that collection aspect. Great. That, I would appreciate that. Um, I think that can be a special study report back. We don't need it for this budget. but. Um, since you mentioned the point about dog licensing, the, um, there was a member of the public who commented earlier about dog licensing and the percentage of dogs that are licensed, and also whether when a renewal, a license renewal card goes out, if that's ignored, what happens in subsequent years. Can you speak to that? Yes. speak right into the mic. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. There we go. <laughs> so when we send it, we send out a renewal uh, notice about two to three months before the actual renewal is due, and then we send it out again closer to the time that the renewal is, is due. So maybe a little bit after, so they're a little late the, the second time. Um, if they don't respond to that, they, they are no longer in the renewal system, but they continue to be in the vaccine system. So if, in fact, they're, when their rabies expires, then we will send them a, re, a, a notice about rabies. When they give us the rabies cert, then we will capture the renewal at that time. So um, I, I guess there is some truth to the idea that they're only um, 
notified twice by us about about the renewal, but there's another piece of it that has to do with vaccine that with, that has to do with vaccines that keep us in contact with the with the pet owner. Is the vaccine uh, vaccination requirement annual as well? Well, if it's an adult no. uh, for a young dog, it's a one-year vaccine for the first vaccine. After that, it's a three-year vaccine. Okay. So once somebody doesn't pay their license fee, why don't they just go into an enforcement list and we start enforcing against them? Well, we could discuss that with the city attorney. We actually wanted just to send out a citations instead of license renewals, but we have been encouraged not to do that. So maybe that can be part of our report back. Yeah, that would be, I think, important for us to understand. Mm -hmm. I, I yes. would also uh, like to add in the, in the field, it's our officers. Uh, this is John Forland. I would also like to add that, that in the field, it's our officers that do the enforcement. So having an adequate uh, st uh, staff of officers and a canvassing team also, they follow up on people that don't renew, and they do it at the front door. And, so. and one would expect that a significant part of that staffing would be paid for with enhanced licensing enforcement as well. So. Okay, so maybe that can be part of the report back again. Again, sure. I think this is a special study. We're not going to be able to do this for revision of this budget, but um, we do seem to keep having this discussion year after year, so I'd like to you know, hone in a little bit more on it. Ms. Martinez, anything for animal services? Okay, anything else, members? Great. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Ms. Barnett, and thank you to your team. Um, let's see. Next, I think we will go to, um, let's go to El Pueblo next. Sorry, cultural affairs, but if El Pueblo is available, let's go ahead and finish them up quickly because they have essentially no general fund impact. So we should, hopefully can finish that one fairly quickly. Are they not here? Okay. Um, Okay. Well, then let's go ahead. <laughs> let's go ahead and bring up cultural affairs then. Did the music just stop? That's so weird. As if, as if on cue. Although he did just announce as you were walking up that this is the most beautiful city in the world. So uh, uh, and cultural affairs to helps to make it so. So go right ahead. We love that. Well, good afternoon, Council Member Krikorian and members of the Budget and Finance Committee. I am um, at the height, uh, or I'll just say I'm no longer contagious, but I do have a pretty horrible chest cold. So if I have to cover the mic and excuse myself while I clear my chest, bear with me. Um, thank you for the opportunity to provide a response to the mayor's proposed fiscal year 2017-18 budget. I have a few opening remarks. Is that okay? Please. Thank you. Um, b before I begin, I would like to thank the entire staff of the Department of Cultural Affairs for their hard work in advancing arts, culture, and creativity in our city. And I'd like to introduce the department's division director standing behind me as Will Caperton E. Montoya, Marketing and Development, Felicia Filer, our Director of Public Art, Ben Johnson, Performing Arts Director, Joe Smoke, our Grants Administration, and Leslie Thomas, Community Arts. Um, these dedicated public servants oversee our department's delivery system. And sitting at the table with me is uh, Mr. Daniel Tarika, our Assistant General Manager, and Ms. Alma Gibson, our Director of Administrative Services. I'd also like to give a thanks to the Mayor's Budget Team, Matt Zabo, John Chavez, as well as a CAO, Rich Llewellyn, and Elaine Sanchez, Owen for, excuse me, I do that. It's a, I need to switch that. It's Owen Sanchez. Um, Elaine works really closely with our team and her commitment to the mission of the agency is, is, is very clear and we thank you for your service. Here's the good news. 
Creativity is thriving in our city. We can't help it. It oozes at every single march in our city. We love it. In fact, Los Angeles has this insatiable desire for creativity in every single corner of our city. Of our city. And one of our biggest challenges as a department is keeping up with demand. Um, maintaining services, especially as related costs continue to increase. And at this current budget year, we're close to about 56% 50 increase of our related costs. And over the past three years, the Department of Cultural Affairs has done an extraordinary job in stabilizing operations, restoring baseline capacity, and we're preparing the readiness to serve, provide services at scale with the population. And with your help, DCA has restored critical staff positions at our community art centers. We've invested marketing and in data-driven strategies to ensure we are serving the people of our great city with efficiency, equity, and excellence. And taken together, this equitable delivery system results in over 18,000 free and low-cost events each and every year, serving well over 3.5 million people. And to mitigate where we do not have a community art center or a public art uh, related uh, uh, development fee or nonprofit arts organizations to partner with, the department has implemented several new exciting initiatives, um, such as the Arts Activation Fund, which is now in its second year. This fund generates hyper local, place based events in local communities. Um, last year, we reached over 56,000 people with just over 19 events. And these are, you know, for example, events like the Mar Vista Art Walk or the Lit Crawl activating uh, People Street with the, in partnership with the NoHo Bid, or what we're going to see in Council District 3 coming up in the summer is activating a parking lot and making it into a uh, new filmmakers festival. Um, we've also started an initiative called the Promise Zone Arts, which is going to help bolster economic opportunity for over 100 traditional artists in the Promise Zone areas. Um, we're also working on a Promise Zone, uh, excuse me, a, a arts incubator in Pacoima, and this is in partnership with Pacoima Beautiful. It's a social enterprise initiative that will allow local artists to build the capacity that they need to take their career to the next level. Think about all of the municipal contracts or public art commissions that many local artists simply don't have the capacity or skill set to be able to compete competitively on. And, and one final thing I want to highlight is our Higher LA Youth Initiative, which to date, um, this year, we will imply, uh, employ over 42 young people to work in arts-related careers, either with our department or with our partner nonprofit arts organizations. And for the size of our agency, we think that that's a pretty impressive number. Finally, in addition to the $1 million grant awarded from the Bloomberg Philanthropies, it enabled the Department of Cultural Affairs to produce the first ever public art biennial last summer with current LA Water. There were installations in every single council district across the city, and the program alone attracted over 33,000 people in attendance through 15 temporary public art projects and well over 150 related ancillary events. The exhibition attracted about 80 me media articles in local, national, and international media, which resulted in about $156 million digital impressions, not just for the Department of Cultural Affairs, but for the city of Los Angeles. And and this is one of the great results in which we can see how local initiatives spark regional tourism. We're very, very proud of that. Um, we've also worked this particular year in reinstating our performing arts division, which is a really critical um, spoke in our service delivery wheel. The de division is charged with overseeing operations in four city-owned theaters community cultural festivals and place-based events, as well as providing opportunities for local performing artists to serve as ambassadors of Los Angeles by touring nationally and internationally. Phase one seeks to maximize usage through the theater rentals as both revenue generating as well as community revitalization efforts. The Madrid and Canoga Park is the test case for this. Uh, we've received a SPARK grant from the Mayor's Fund to develop the consortium model However, sufficient staffing for this division is needed to realize the 1718 timeline. In closing, I want to say thank you for your generosity and time.
for your commitment to ensuring the department has the, the resources that it needs to serve the people of our great city. And my staff and I look forward to working closely with you and our other elected officials in making sure that we serve the communities we serve with the values that we put forth before and in, in um, holding our mission at the, as the goal. So um, with that, I'm happy to close and uh, answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. And we will start with Ms. Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Regarding your developments, uh, your department's 1% of our program, what is the department doing to ensure that the monies coming into the program are spent within the appropriate time frame so that we're not refunding the monies back to the developers? Absolutely. We absolutely don't want to leave any money on mm -hmm. the table. One thing that our public art team has done this year, which I applaud them for, is they've done a series of calls to ensure that we have pre-approved lists for um, providers to provide services, everything from uh, murals, to um, utility box, to festival producers. So having these pre-approved lists ensure that we're complying with the city's procurement system, but we're also making sure that we can uh, move those dollars uh, uh, swiftly, but with quality of service. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure that the department is uh, working proactively with the council offices, or if not, if the council offices are just simply not, um, if they're just taking too much time, to decide on the project. I just want to make sure that the fee that we're um, incurring that make sure that it's actually being put to good use and that yes. it's just not sitting there. But I want actually a report back um, on how much the ADF money, how much ADF money has been refunded to the uh, developers in the past three years since the adoption of the new regulations. Yes. And my next question is regarding the, um, the additional TOT revenue that the department received um, from the recent Airbnb agreement to have them start paying into TLT? Do you know how much that is? Um, I would like to ask uh, Alma Gibson and Daniel Tarika to take that. I think they have the numbers handy. I believe those, those fees are coming into the department. Right, I just want to know how much. We received it. Go ahead. We received a total of 345000 this year. Um, and uh, I believe it's included for next within next year's TOT, which is estimated at $21.7 million, um, of which I'm not sure specifically how much of that is comprised of the Airbnb money, but um, it includes the Airbnb money, as I understand it. And that's the projected amount, correct? Correct. That's the estimated amount for 1718 TOT. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to ask for a report back on the possibility of earmarking these additional funds to be used specifically for cultural services in underserved communities. And also want to include the policy, the different policy options on how to define underserved communities as well. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank Chuck. you. Thank you. Um, first of all, thanks for all the uh, work and support on the Marvista Great Street and the uh, art walk, which has really taken off. Next one is June 1st. Uh, looking forward to it. Uh, just a quick question. It's a, a bit of a follow-up on Ms. Martinez's question about the uh, TOT. Um, I, I heard you use the term projected yes. revenue. So my understanding is you, you get an amount of money based on the projected TOT revenue. Yes. Is that later reconciled with what the actual TOT revenue was? To my knowledge, that is not the case. Alma, would you like to respond no, to that? it's not reconciled. Uh, would you like me to ask for a report back on that? That would be good. Because okay. it may come back and you may lose money out of a deal, but... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We're happy to provide a report back on that. Okay, yeah, be interested Actually, for uh, DCA and say to report back yeah. on... Um, one, the first question is why projected as opposed to actual, and two, if there's a difference between the projected and the actual... Um, why the department doesn't get the, the difference. Thank you. Thank you. No, that's, there we go. Um, of course, we have to compete with the, uh, the music. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for all the great work you do. Um, we do appreciate it. Certainly in, in my district, it's a, all, all of the city is very artistic. Mm -hmm. I say mine's an artistic district, but I think really they all are in, in different ways. Um, 
I'm glad to see additional funding to provide grants to community-based providers. I wanted to ask you about what type of outreach the department does to ensure um, that the, the service providers are aware of these opportunities. We do a pretty rigorous outreach effort each and every year for our open calls. In fact, we actually want to help demonstrate the need for uh, support from our department. So we have uh, uh, revamped our communication strategies tenfold. We've built out our social and civic media uh, channels, the, so they are now quite robust. And we do both in-person outreach, um, primarily in libraries throughout the city, as well as online tutorials um, so that folks can uh, um, sit in their pajamas and do a webinar on how to apply for a DCA grant. It's a, it's a good goal to have. We like that. <laughs> um, talked a little bit about the Madrid Theater. Yes. And we've, you know, DCA is in the process of trying to reanimate it. Uh, I'm excited about that. Uh, but we also, we have a lot of theaters throughout the city. What, what are the, the plans to bring these theaters yep. back online and to really infuse uh, the attention that they deserve? Well, thank you for the question. I will say that we have four theaters that are under the Department of Cultural Affairs um, direct oversight. Um, uh, last year, we were able to bring Ben Johnson uh, and, and have a restored uh, uh, performing arts director position. Ben Johnson comes from UCLA um, um, Center for the Arts of Performance, a renowned nationally recognized presenter to our team. Um, what I love about what Ben is bringing to um, these sites is not... Um, not just to get them up and running and filled, but to truly make them um, uh, centers, performing arts centers for our city. So instead of going smaller, let's go bigger and let's actually have these, these theaters truly become hubs for economic activity um, and social um, celebration in, in each of our, um, our city-owned theaters. Um, each theater is unique. And each theater holds uh, different types of opportunities associated with them. So we are starting with the lowest hanging fruit, which is the Madrid Theater. We're working on a consortium model for that theater. Um, as, we, as I indicated in my opening remarks, we've got uh, a small grant from the Mayor Spark Fund to see if we might be able to work with local community members um, to, to develop a plan to share the programming of that space. Um, we will be going out to bid for Vision Theater um, uh, later this, uh, I, I believe early this month. I need to check in with BOE about this. Um, but we're looking on re uh, doing a pretty major uh, 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 restoration effort um, on the Vision Theater, which will take about 18 months. That site has tremendous potential to become the new center of, of uh, National Center for Black Culture in Los Angeles. Um, and then we also have the Warner Grant, a historic movie theater in San Pedro. That has really some, some really large challenges because of the historic nature associated with it. But with it, there's also tremendous opportunities. Um, and so we're working very closely with Council District 15 on um, expanding the vision for the Warner Grant Theater. And then finally, um, we've got uh, the the... Barnesdale Gallery Theater, which in many ways is, is, is quite used, and the activity on that campus is, is almost at an all-time high. Um, so what we need to do is find out where the, the, best, the, the best niche is for that particular um, theater. I guess related to that, you're uh, requesting resolution authority for two positions that don't have funding, and I say related because one of those positions would be directly with the Madrid Theater. Right. Um, is there a grant coming online or another revenue source expected for that? Right. Um, as of right now, we um, we've done a bit of an analysis, and even if we move forward aggressively over six months, we feel very confident that we would be able to generate the revenue needed to cover the cost of those two positions. Um, we would need to have a, a legislative help in. Um, changing the fee structure ordinance to make sure that the fees developed um, and generated from the Madrid Theater go back to offset those costs. Maybe we'll get a special study uh, about that, what it would take to do that, because um, we want to make sure that we're giving you the legislative help that you need. And that may already be in the works, probably, but... Absolutely. We can work it through this Absolutely. process. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Uh, and I, I mean, critical staffing is important in order for us to realize the goals that we set forward. Great. And I don't know if we need a special uh, a study on it, but just that I want to make the request that we do honor those uh, resolution authority positions okay. uh, as part of our process here. So whether we note it is or it, our team notes it. but Can I get clarification? Is that a report back or a special study? Which? The, Your request. The, re the request for the resolution authority is okay, simply a notation for the, okay. the committee. I'll be quiet. Uh, but <laughs> thank you. As far as the, um, the other issue in terms of the, the legislative help, that can be a special study. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, since we were just talking about theaters, I, hadn't occurred to me, but what has DCA's role been in working with Rec and Parks now that Rec and Parks has taken over management of the Greek theater? Well, um, they're on speed dial. <laughs> and we, um, we have a great working relationship with Rec and Parks. We're learning from them. We're taking site visits. Um, you know, the Greek theater is a different venue, um, and you can maximize your revenue because of the type of venue that it is. Um, so in some ways, uh, their counsel is really applicable. In other ways, it's, uh, it's a different animal altogether. Um, there, was a, there was a line item for Embrace LA uh, yes. that had been included and I think was not included in the proposed budget. Um, can you talk about what that is, first of all, and then I would like to get a report back um, on that Thank you. line item. Um, as you may or may not know, uh, Council President Wesson and uh, Council uh, Member O'Farrell authored the Embrace motion instructing the Department of Cultural Affairs to work with HRC through HCID to develop a, a series of conversations about race, sexual orientation, gender, and cultural identity, identity in the city of Los Angeles. Um, the Department of Cultural Affairs believes deeply in this work. We believe that this is germane to the work that we do each and every day. It is part of our mission. Um, and we put forward a pretty robust program um, that, uh, that we presented both to the council office and inclu included into our budget request, which did not receive funding. Um, we would very much like to um, have this program receive support because we believe that through arts and culture we gain a better understanding of ourselves and it's the way in which we can talk about race, culture, sexual orientation and all of these really challenging issues in a way that is safe um, and productive. Very good. Well, um, I think we would all agree that's pretty important too, so I'd like to yes. get a report back on uh, what the cost would be and uh, potential sources Thank you. of funding for that. And then Mr. Englander asked for a report back um, on the funding necessary to institute a central ticketing system uh, in this year's budget. Uh, and the anticipated impact that a central ticketing system might have on equity and uh, a reconstituted performing arts division for the Thank department. Thank you. We will do that. Okay. Anything else? Members, Mr. Blumenfield. Yeah, just, um, regarding the per performing arts division, uh, I wanted to request a special report on the timeline for the reinstatement of the performing arts division. I'm sorry, on the? Uh, the timeline for the reinstatement of the performing arts division. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate your work and your time and your patience today. Um, next up will be, is El Pueblo here? Okay. Next up will be El Pueblo. Come on up. Good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Espinosa. Thank you for being with us. Um, and uh, I know that 
this is, uh, I think you have no impact on the general fund, if I'm not mistaken, right? So uh, I think this will be a quick discussion, but go ahead and uh, give a brief introduction. We'll get right into it. Thank you, Councilman. Good afternoon, uh, Council Members. Chris Espinosa, General Manager of El Pueblo Historical Monument. We run a very, very tight uh, ship in terms of our budget. Uh, we generate all our own revenue, and that revenue is um, generally um, brought in by the parking lots. We have five parking lots, about 80 merchants sites, so we get all that uh, lease revenue, and then we do filming and special events. So overall, that's about a $5 million uh, revenue goal that we have every year. Um, and then um, we have some assistance from the Arts and Cultural Facilities Trust Fund. Uh, that's $285,000. And um, we have continued part-time funding to support filming and special events, which we do often. And then we also have a reclassification of a vacant museum director position, and we're turning that position into a management uh, assistant so that we will comply with the mayor's executive director uh, directive on succession planning. Um, and so essentially that's uh, our budget. We're looking forward to construction of Channel 35. We think that's going to be a great uh, benefit to the, to the Pueblo. And um, so I'm ready to answer any questions that you may have. What is the, what is the status on that, actually? Where, when are we anticipating that job will be completed? Yes, the Bureau of Engineering has gone out to bid an award. And um, we expect those bids to be returned at the end of May. And then um, we hope to have a construction company come on site by December, taking over those uh, properties, the Merced, Masonic and Pico House, that whole, that whole area will be blocked off for construction. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bloomfield? Yeah, when the Pico House is under construction, are you going to be able to generate enough uh, revenue and maintenance operations during that? I mean, it's clearly going to affect it. Yeah, events and, and uh, filming bring in at least 300000 annually. Some years we get as high as 500000 um, what we've been trying to do is shift our filming production over to the front of um, Los Angeles Street, so using different venues for, our, for uh, some of our commercial filming. Um, but we do expect um, a potential impact there. Uh, what we're also looking at is the parking uh, rates and potentially increasing some of the parking rates to help make up for that revenue shortfall. Great. And then I know you guys have been socked with the DWP increase. Uh, like everybody, but but that's affected your your rev your expenses quite a bit. Have, have you guys thought about capital uh, investments to lower the water usage and energy usage? Yes, um, one of our big projects is this Channel Thirty Five effort. Um, as a historical site, we have these underground heating and cooling systems that run continuously because. Uh, the system is so large that it needs enough pressure to, con you know, to work uh, properly. The Channel 35 project is going to be really important because um, not only are they going to make capital investments on the building itself, but they're going to make improvements to that underground HVAC system. Um, they will also, I believe, ITA will end up picking operating costs. Um, so we're going to sub-meter that um, air conditioning usage and gas usage. And so the probably the um, ITA's uh, information technology agency's budget will probably pick up those costs, so pro rata share of all that. So we, we expect some technical improvements, but also some budgetary um, imp um, impacts, but to the good for El Pueblo um, in about two years. Right. And then those costs would be... Would be end up being borne by the PEG funds, which is a special fund. Yeah, right. So that those PEG funds are, um, you know, the, they would go to general operating costs. So I think they're going to help the Pueblo by, um, you know, getting security guards for their area, of course, but it will um, allow our security guards to do more patrol on the street and other parts of El Pueblo. Um, of course, the electricity costs are going to be huge for us because we cover all those, those costs. Okay. Great. Thank you. Mr. Bonin, Ms. Martinez, all right. Ow. Okay. Thank you. I was good until I banged my knee. Thank you very much. And we are almost done. Yes, very good, Mr. Bloomfield. So the last remaining department for today is the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment, and then we will be done.
Good afternoon, Ms. Liu. Thank you for your patience. Good afternoon. Uh, we have your letter. Thank you. Um, go ahead and uh, introduce uh, or give an introduction. We'll start right in. Sure. Uh, Grace Liu, General Manager for the Department of Neighbor Empowerment. Uh, thank you so much, honorable members, for your time and to your staff, too, for reviewing our budget. Uh, thank to also thank the mayor's office and CEO's office, CLA. Um, and uh, my, obviously my staff, they're amazing and they're wonderful. We do a, a, a huge amount of work um, for our neighbor councils. And of course I have to thank our neighbor councils for the amazing work that they do. Um, you just see some of it with the neighbor council budget advocates, but citywide they are always um, doing so much work for the communities. I'm joined here today by one of my um, admin team, Corey Paraga, and um, I just want to be brief with, with my statements for the letter. We try to focus on um, issues that we feel that may create liability for the city um, for uh, neighbor council operations. Uh, there's also a request for additional funding for our Congress of Neighborhoods, budget advocates work as they expand and they're doing more things. Um, there's the election ask. Uh, for if elections are going to happen in 2018. And lastly, if there's any funding left over in our neighbor council uh, funds, that there should be some, 25% uh, of it be allocated towards an equity fund that would apply for neighbor councils that need additional funds for translation or capacity building, outreach. Um, this applies because neighbor councils um, are so different in size and needs. So our newest neighbor council, uh, the 97th neighbor council, it was student be certified. They're at th about 3,800 uh, stakeholders, and then the ones that are bigger have over 100,000 stakeholders. And uh, this this fund would be used to address that. Um, and our hope is that there would be money left over in the neighbor council funding uh, that would hopefully cover these asks. Um, there, as of last week, was $2.4 million unspent uh, for neighbor councils. It's a little high at this time of year as opposed to previous years. So we anticipate that there may be a higher amount that is left in the neighbor council fund. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Um, what work has, uh, since you mentioned that the equity issue, this is a lingering uh, challenge because of the inherent inequity in having uh, such vastly different sized neighborhood councils. And it's an offshoot of the fact that they're not supposed to be population based. They're based on, you know, a variety of stakeholders. But still, when you have some communities that are you know, significantly larger than other communities in population, and they get the exact same allocation in the funding program. There is an inequity built into that. So, what what steps do you anticipate? Uh, I mean, these are really, I guess, policy choices more than departmental choices. But um, what thought have you given to that, and what might we be able to do to address that? So, uh, several years ago, the neighborhood councils did take take a look at this issue when they did a plan, uh, a review of the plan of the neighborhood, uh, citywide system of neighborhood councils. And then nobody at that time, just, they, they basically voted not to do anything about it. The Valley, I will say, did vote to do a, a different type of allocation that would provide more funding for bigger neighborhood councils. I think um, uh, we need to do, definitely look at possibly establishing a baseline of operational expenses that every neighbor council gets. Uh, and then above and beyond that would be based on the stakeholder population of that area. Um, and also, you know, we do still, I think, have to set aside some funding for translation interpretation because there's just some neighborhood councils that spend almost, you know, 80% of their funding just on that and then not have anything left over for that other neighborhood councils have um, for their communities. Uh, the Valley Alliance of Neighborhood Councils last month did... Uh, uh, take action to create a commission to look at this again, uh, particularly given the the newest neighbor council being so small, Oath Herman neighbor council, and um, and 
the issues that they find in just equity and funding in general. Yeah, it, it, and there seems to be some inconsistency in application even of um, deciding which uh, community gets to declare itself to be a neighborhood, entitled to a neighborhood council a, as well. And, you know, Herman being an example, there are arguments as to why they should be, I get it, um, but there are arguments that could be made by other communities as well that don't get that uh, treatment as well. So anyway, it's, a, it's, a, it's not even necessary as a report back. It's just an area of concern uh, of mine. It always has been. Um, training is another issue of significant concern. I know you have a request in here for additional training for board members, and I think that is just from a uh, risk management and liability avoidance uh, perspective. That's all I'm going to say about the subject, but I think there's um, there's a lot of return on investment uh, in terms of avoiding potential claims that we may get down the road if we don't have a greater investment in in training. So I'd like to get a report back on that request uh, for the $385,000 for training. Um, and uh, Mr. Englander had the same request, so uh, we'll indicate that as a budget report back uh, from both of us. Mr. Englander also asked for a report back on the department's request for an additional 125,000 to incorporate the NCs into a uh, citywide neighborhood council emergency preparedness system, um, and whether that amount is necessary to address liability issues related to neighborhood council emergency bins in particular. He'd also like a report back on the department's request for 319,000 for election outreach and 196,000 for online voting voter registration, including whether or not this effort is duplicative with the city clerk's effort. Uh, and uh, I would just add, you know what, I'm fine. That's fine. Um, okay, anything else, members? Mr. Bonnet? Uh, just a couple things. Uh, you mentioned uh, you wanted to um, uh, get a portion of the money, the unspent money from the neighborhood councils. I'm sorry, can I, could you, you repeat You that? mentioned uh, requesting some of the unspent money that the neighborhood councils have for the, for the equity project. Yes, uh, that could potentially be a source. It, they, may, they may use it all. I'm, I'm just saying at this point, the $2.4 million is pretty high for where they are. Have uh, we canvassed the neighborhood councils about that proposal? We haven't. Uh, it's it's, it's a, uh, a request that we do every year for any unspent funds and neighborhood councils be reinvested back in the system. So this is just an uh, identifying a source, a potential source of funding. How do the neighborhood councils generally react when that happens? Um, well, they, they at this point, they want the rollover um, of, of funds. And absent a rollover policy, I think that they are more upset over the past few years if the unspent funds just kind of go back to general funds and not necessarily reinvested back into the system. Um, ideally, you know, they would have the opportunity to spend all their funds and we've tried in the last few years to do strategic budgeting with them so that we don't end up with a massive frantic spend of, you know, a million dollars a month um, for the last two months. So we don't have a rollover policy? Currently, it is um, being considered, I believe, um, with CAO's office. Terry Sauer, CAO's office. Council member, the rollover policy was suspended um, a number of years ago. Um, so typically what happens with the funds left over in the neighborhood empowerment fund, those were rolled over to the next year and used to re reduce the general fund allocation. With the transfer of the administration of the um, funding program to the city clerk's office, there's now a new neighborhood council fund. Um, we don't know yet how much money is going to be in that fund, and that prob we probably won't know until the reconciliation is done in August after the books close. Yeah, I'm concerned about s sweeping their, their, their money or not having a, a, a solid policy in the books. I just know... Sometimes they may want to spend money on a project, and one year's allocation isn't enough for that project. And then if we don't let them keep it, then they never get the project done. 
Council Member, that has uh, sort of troubled us over a number of years because, <clears throat> because the rollover and we ended up with a lot of unspent money. Um, I think neighborhood councils do have the process where they can wor work with the department to encumber funds if they had a specific project that was going to be achieved, say, before the end of the fiscal year or after the end of the fiscal year but wasn't going to trail for two or three years. That's where the problem has been is the original rollover policy was actually allowed the councils to roll the money over for three years and what resulted is no money got spent and so it, was, it, it has been adjusted over a number of years. And we're happy to work with whomever on revisiting the issue again. Okay. I'm just wary of us saying we're going to take their money without having done outreach to them and getting feedback. I'm certainly going to want to hear from my neighborhood councils before a, a vote on that. Um, second is I understand, and I know it's been a case with one of my neighborhood councils, that there is a problem with uh, uh, ADA liability. That's correct. In, in most cases, the neighborhood councils meet in city facilities, right? Not, not um, most of them. Actually. No? Yeah, because they're, they're not either available. Um, a lot of them meet at uh, LAUSD sc schools um, with like little third grader toilets and um, s situations that's not ideally for uh, ID ADA compliance. Okay. Is uh, Department of Disability helping to identify venues? Yes, that's part of the request is for them to um, to assist us in evaluating their meeting locations as well as websites and other um, uh, forms of communication that would be subject to ADA compliance. Okay. And my last thing, this is, I don't even need to make this as a report back because it's really just to, to my office. It's the West LA Sawtell Neighborhood Council has been in exhaustive efforts for a very, very long time. I, and it is causing the neighborhood council to implode. People are resigning. Uh, they're having difficulty reaching a quorum. Uh, I don't quite understand why this is continuing. I would like from the department a step-by-step -step list of what needs to be done for the neighborhood council to get out of exhaustive efforts and what an estimated timeline is for that. I can do that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My pleasure. And uh, Mr. Bond, just a couple of follow-ups on, on your question. With regard to um, the rollover policy, um, four or five years ago, um, we decided to go with the idea that if there were some encumbrance, and it was very liberally applied, um, a neighborhood council says, well, we were really planning to spend that money as long as it appeared someplace in the minutes that was considered an encumbrance. And the idea was, Otherwise, you would just continue to get this rollover by some of the neighborhood councils, which were largely defunct, weren't even meeting, and this money continued to accrue. So if, as long as they had a plan, and I think that's still pretty much how it's applied, isn't it? So that as long as there's a plan and Dunn is aware of the plan and it's something that's more than just a concept, it's something that's actually in a, a format that, that'll, that'll be respected. Is that, am yes, I right about that? That's that's correct, and, and we are very like outside the box in terms of if if they don't even have that we can sometimes work with the council members office to to have them hold funds when they know that there's a project that is coming up so um we we try we definitely try to find a way for the neighbor councils to spend down those funds and in terms of facilities and ada liability i just want to throw out that i i've i've never thought that we had to be slavishly committed to having a venue for meeting within the boundaries of each neighborhood council. We don't need to have 97 different meeting places. If, for example, there are three neighborhood councils in North Hollywood, so long as that venue is someplace in North Hollywood, it seems to me that, I mean, they're fine. I just use that as an example. But consolidating meeting places in city facilities in particular where they won't have to pay rent, number one, and where we know that there's ADA compliance seems to me like a pretty good idea. Um, so, Mr. Blumenfield. Thanks. Um, most of the questions have been asked, uh, answered. Uh, thank you for all the great work you do. Thank you. Um, I was asking Holly this earlier about the... Um, election schedule and get your take on it as well as is, is if we move the neighborhood council elections what does that mean for 
for you, for your budget, the advantages and disadvantages. I'm going to speak to it briefly, but I think we're doing a report back anyway. Sure. Uh, so um, we, in March, as Holly mentioned earlier, uh, actually in February we did the Alliance tour, and we talked about this issue in March. Uh, the beginning of March we gave out a survey to neighbor councils and asked them to respond by today. Um, if they could, you know, tell us how, what, what they would want to do with elections. Um, thus far, we've only uh, received 12 um, um, actions taken from neighborhood councils, and of the 12, nine would uh, be in favor of pushing the elections to 2019, um, and the remaining are no's. Uh, so, and I, I have heard from a neighbor council that did say that they voted no, but they felt that they had a conflict of extending their own terms. I mean, they would have liked to have just pushed it, but they felt like they had a conflict because they're just basically giving themselves another year in their position. Um, for us, I do think that um, given the, the budget that we were allocated, um, we wouldn't be able to do the ex expanded outreach that neighbor councils asked us to do in the next election cycle because they didn't want to do outreach to find, you know, their competitors or other candidates because they felt like you're just asking us to find our own um, competitors for the seats. And so um, we would not be able to um, do that expanded outreach, as I mentioned. And um, if elections were pushed to 2019, um, Holly and I would work together on doing voter registration um, and also building out online voting and voter registration if that was um, the... the uh, will of the city council, and uh, and I, and we could use the funding that we're allocated by the mayor's uh, budget to do that. Um, I don't know if Holly, if you want to add anything else to that. I guess that's always going to be a conflict, though, when it comes to the outreach portion of things. Yes, I think that it's it's always uh, going to be challenging to to allocate enough funds to do a citywide. Um, outreach for neighbor councils, but I think you know Holly and I were, were talking about you know doing a, a combined get out the vote that not only talked about registering for municipal elections but also neighbor council elections and and so that we can work collaboratively in that regard um, uh, on during non election years and obviously during election years too. But I am in agreement with Holly that this must be done. You know, regardless of whether or not there's an election that year, you have to keep doing it year-round, every year. And you may have answered this already, but the equity fund, uh, how much is that? How much do you think that would cost? Well, you know, I was just saying any any extra money that might be in the um, the neighbor council f uh, funds be set aside, like 25% of it. I've asked this every year. I think you need to start with at least 100000 that would be great because but, I think but that. But how much? How much do we spend? Because it's it's supposed to be, or at least part of it is to spend on the translation services, right? Right, but but the thing is, there's neighbor councils that choose not to spend any money on translation or interpretation. So, because they they feel like they can't afford it, or they they're constantly arguing over it. Um, one neighbor council out of like thirty-seven thousand could easily spend thirty thousand just on on translation and because you're thinking of minutes and agendas. I guess uh, I, I'd feel more comfortable going the other direction. Instead of setting aside money and then spending whatever you got, uh, I'd rather come up with a what is the appropriate amount we should be spending on translation services and then try to budget for it. Uh, and that may mean budgeting for it up front before all the, the rest of the allocations or taking it off the top of, of everything so that it is equitably distributed. Uh, so maybe we get a special study on on how much you th think it would cost to appropriately provide translation services for neighborhood councils that that need them and require or, or require them. Okay. Okay, we'll do. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Anything else, members? For done. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate your patience and waiting till the end and uh, with that members we have let's see we were scheduled to complete today by 220 it's now 225 not too bad so uh, thank you for your efficiency um, tomorrow we will be we will begin at 1 p.m. 
and of course we'll be taking up our uh, memo review. We'll be hearing from the Office of Public Accountability, uh, the CAO, uh, including discussion of the Cannabis Regulation Department. Uh, we'll be taking up lasers and police and fire pensions, and then we will have a presentation from uh, our civilian labor partners. And um, with that, if there's nothing further, until tomorrow at 1 p.m., this committee is in recess. Thank you.